Portimao in Portugal, round two of seven of the 2023 FIA World Endurance Championship. Hello, everybody. Bom dia. Welcome to Portugal and welcome to the great and the good on the grid. Ugly Shonak of Orica and Roger Penske, the 86-year-old pocket dynamo that is in charge of the Penske Porsche team. Laura wontrop Clauser there on the grid with Pierre Fion in the center, the boss of the ACO, and Frédéric Lecar, who is the head of Le Mans Endurance Management that runs this program. All the teams conferring, all the drivers, joshing with each other and winding each other up before the start. Graham Goodwin, Martin Haven in the booth, Louise Beckett down in the pit lane as ever, and on the grid will be Anthony Davidson joining us as well. There in the centre of your shot is the brand new FIA CEO, Natalie Robin. delighted to have her here this weekend as well. And Graham, as we move in our westerly direction from Sebring a month ago, a very different challenge to this six hours of Portimao. It is indeed. Uh, welcome everybody to Portimao. Uh, second round, of course, of the seven round FLI World Endurance Championship this year, part of the European Tour. We now embark upon with Spa, Le Mans and Monza before uh, we get airborne again uh, for the championship. <laughs> Very different feel, of course, for all, uh, every reason, uh, from Sebring. Uh, traditional, if rather different European track. It is blisteringly warm here, by the way. High 20s at the moment, as you see Kaz Nakajima uh, coming to the grid. David Heimer, handsome there. Um, we've had st a stiff breeze and wind through the uh, days leading up to the race. But, uh, Martin, take us through this fabulous Portimao circuit. Well, it is a track that drivers love. It really uses the hilly landscape here to great effect. You are never going in one direction. You're either going up and down, left or right. It's never still. Turn one, really good overtaking opportunity. If you're brave, like Lewis Hamilton, you can go around the outside like everybody else around the inside. Turn five, the hairpin again. Great opportunity to try and get by slower traffic for the fast hypercars and the LMP2 machinery, but traction limited and the tyres are going to have a tough time here, particularly in the opening laps before they really get up to temperature. And again, turn 10, 11, a really important section because you can make passes over the brow there or set up a pass into turn 13, which is a tight left-hand hairpin. It's a convoluted track. It's very, very tight and twisty, and it will be warm. Last year, the winners were the number eight Toyota. Anthony Davidson for Jota in Mighty 38. That will return as a Jota number when they get their Porsche next time out. And Chetila won in GTE Am. Race record, fastest lap ever here in a hypercar set by Nico Lapierre. We were here in 2021, and Graham, that was in a lockdown period. We were racing behind closed doors then. Great to see a lot of fans piling into the circuit here as well. Well, among them will be lots of Portuguese fans, and they will undoubtedly be cheering on one of their big heroes, Antonio Felix da Costa. Antonio Felix da Costa is just getting interrupted by Guido van der Gaard and all the other drivers. But uh, you've got to be happy. It's a busy weekend for you. You've got fans here. You've got family and friends here. It's a good one for you. It's awesome. I mean, so, so much going on this weekend. Like, obviously, racing at home is amazing for me. So many fans that I have the opportunity now to give back and see them. Obviously, a lot of family and friends. But I think the, the biggest thing for us is just, or for me, is just saying goodbye to this car. A car that's really solidified my name in the endurance world. We won the championship in Le Mans last year. And at the same time, an emotional adventure starting, you know. Uh, a lot of hard work coming up for us. Uh, we're going to land in a parachute in Spa with a brand new car in the hypercar class with the Porsche. But for now, just enjoy today. Uh, we've got a great car. Try and win the race today would be amazing. Absolutely. Enjoy it. Thank you. Well, he's certainly got 
all the armaments and all the opportunity. Jota run a really good LMP2 car. There's Sarah Bovey, uh, the Iron Dames, <laughs> hugging Ben <laughs> Keating. The, the man with whom she seems to have, I mean, it's nearly a season long, a two-way two battle for pole position in GTEM. Younger viewers will be able to tell me, what is that What is that in terms of, I know what a bromance is, but that clearly isn't <laughs> that, but it's, it's brother and sister but, romance there, but it's real respect between those two racing drivers. It's fabulous to see, absolutely. and it is one of those storylines that's just developing through this season. We're going to see for more and more of it. Lots of people looking for a bit of shelter from the sunshine. Yeah. As these 36 cars at the moment on the grid of our 37. We'll come to the 37th uh, car that is not on the grid at the moment uh, in just a wee while. Uh, GTE Am, this is the fourth place car on the grid, the 54 AF Corsa car, the Vista Jet sponsored uh, 54 Ferrari 488. And. Uh, the grid formed up, of course, in echelon formation. Parker Pitzer and uh, Ben Viscal, I think that is. Prima team. Yeah, we've got some, we've got some really, I mean, we've got a lot of really talented drivers. We've got some big ex Grand Prix driver Open names here, haven't we? You know, you've got Kubica who raced for BMW. Could have been a world champion for BMW, you know, if they'd sort of thought right. Jacques Villeneuve, who was an Indy 500 winner and Formula One world champion. You know, there's a, there's a lot of big names and an awful lot of drivers who, like Antonio Felix da Costa, got right up to that sort of Formula One perimeter and just didn't have the backing, the money to get in. This is second place on the GTM grid, the uh, unmissable bright pink number 85 Porsche 911 RSR from the Iron Dames. Uh, were right up there and looked set to take the fight to the very end until just a minor off, what looked like a minor off for Michel Getty, uh, ripped the rear out of that car and it was effectively game over. It's been a great 24 hours, by the way, for Roger Penske, the Porsche yes. 963 taking its first global win uh, yesterday uh, night, our time here in Europe, uh, around the streets of Long Beach after a dramatic finish there. So Roger will be very much delighted with that. Ben Keating getting some last uh, hints and tips. Uh, that was the team management, by the way, from Peugeot. We're talking to Roger. Yeah, Carlos uh, Tavares in the cap. He's the CEO of Stellantis, which is the the, the body that that runs Peugeot and many other things. But but he's also a keen racer himself. He he's is. Yeah. Raced at Le Mans. He's raced at Nurburgring 24 hours. He's he's no mean peddler. I suspect what uh, they were being, what's being talked about there is why we've got 36 and not 37 cars out on the grid because the 93 Peugeot is in the garage at the yep. moment. I believe may make the start of this race the lap down, but that appears to be with either a power steering or steering rack problem mm -hmm. and did not make pit out. So the 93 Peugeot, not on the grid, but we think will start this race. We'll catch up with that in a moment or two. Everybody else, I mean, this is the, the real calm before the storm. Everybody's relatively relaxed and relatively smiley, but as soon as the starting drivers slip into their seats and start to buckle themselves in, then it all gets very real. Well, hot off Penske Porsche's first win in nearly two decades. Let's catch up with the captain. Well, we are always honoured to have, have Roger Penske joining us here in WEC and what has started to be a fantastic weekend for Porsche Penske. Well, I'll tell you, I couldn't believe it last night as I watched on my iPad lap after lap and to see uh, Porsche Penske get the 963 in the winter circle at Long Beach uh, is a dream come true. So early in the season, all the hard work with Porsche and our teams together, it's been a really a team effort. but. Uh, Winning that first race to kind of get that monkey off our back, but uh, this is another day here, obviously, uh, you know, with the hyper cars, and we'll see. But uh, very good way to start the season and a great way to start certainly this weekend. Yeah, so we've ticked off the American part. Now we've got to go for the WEC part. Well, I think that uh, the competition is terrific, and I've said to many people here that this sport and what Pierre and the whole Frederick has done with WEC is amazing because we're getting all these manufacturers and we're in the car business and people love to see their marks racing on the highways or in the on the tracks and I think this is really an evolution of what we're going to see in major sports car racing around the world so we just are so happy to be part of it. And we're happy to have you. It's a fantastic combination. Thank you. Well, thanks. Appreciate it. 
Amazing man, uh, yeah. Roger Penske. And uh, we're trying to work out, was it 2008 at Miller Motorsport Park was the last time a Porsche uh, under the Penske organisation took yeah. an overall race win of the American Le Mans Series back then, the same year where the one of the, the, the in fact the same car took the win at the 12 hours of Sebring against LMP1 opposition a P2 car beat Audi with a P2 car <laughs> yeah Absolutely. I mean that that's a heck of a, an achievement and Penske Porsche there it's not just the name that is the link because the basic architecture of the engine in Absolutely. that LMP2 Spider formed the basic architecture of the engine that is now in the 963 and 963 of course well the last Group C Porsche was the 962 I love the fact they've just gone yeah okay it's the next yeah yep. okay this is group c2 2.0 here we go 963 3.4 liter normally aspirated engine to 4.5 liter turbocharged engine but the same base car architecture you're right dick gitter vandergaard there by the way we just saw he's just standing to our left uh, of the United car as we work our way up through the LMP2 grid. I think we just get into the stage where. Well, you're going to mention that he's an addition to this team. Is. Starting the other car, 22, is Ben Hanley, who's the addition to that team. And Gators are here because Philip Albuquerque was in Long Beach and put his he Acura on pole yesterday, and they damn near won the race as well in a in a last gasp, last lap pass for the glory. But Porsche hung on to claim that first victory. Of course, the difference in the US is there are no extant hypercars no. in IMSA. They are all brand new machinery. So there is no Toyota there that's already got a two year head start in terms of knowledge and ability. Watch for the racing bakers. Uh, they had a fabulous time out in uh, Sebring, fourth place there, mm. and they seem to be in a rich vein of form. It's a topsy turvy form book in LMP2. So, so just a quick look at the 48 car that took the win last time we should see this car here two one-off races before the 963 Porsche arrives now they did nice win in Sebring but they are not the points leaders the points leaders are the 22 United Auto Sports car because this car is not a full season entry so it's invisible for points so uh, the 48 car will be here for the final time as an LMP2 entry. They start in third place, second, Vector Sport, and missed pole position by the one, yawning margin of... One thousandth of a second. It'd be yeah. Ryan Cullen starting. Fabulous stuff all weekend from Gabby Aubrey. Uh, was a big part of the development team for the Goodyear Rubber here. And boy, has he converted that. Controversially second after a penalty came the way of the number 63 Prima uh, team car, Amerka Bortolotti, and that was because of some shenanigans at the end of pit lane. And on the right of the lineup there, as who looked at them, Dorian Pan, she becomes the first female driver to start from pole position in LMP2. So I she gets the nod to start the car that is on pole. As you can see, 134.303 plays 134.304. Is it tight in LMP2? Yes, sir, it is as tight as ever it was. Well, there are the cars and the teams ranged up on our grid. We will take a look at our hypercar front runners in a moment or two. But the crowd are on their feet as we are waiting for the Portuguese national anthem, which will set proceedings underway. Marchar, marchar. 
Beautifully done. I give that one a 10 out of 10. Absolutely. That's, I think the crowd give that an 11. That's uh, the Portuguese national anthem as we are here in the Algarve, the holiday region on the Atlantic coast of southern Portugal, close to the uh, town of Faro. As always, and closer made, to the town of Portimao, actually, indeed. of course. Uh, but uh, has always been made to feel very welcome wherever we've gone, whether it's around this circuit or the surrounding area. Great place to come at this or any other time of year, uh, actually. See grid being cleared. It will be Natalie Robin who will see the grid off on the green flag lap. And what are we going to see here, Martin? It was uh, quite an odd chemistry in the hypercar class, comfortably on pole for the Toyotas, but that didn't seem to concern the Ferrari guys, and that, I think, has caused a little bit of debate. Are they looking after tyres? Were they just basically biding their time uh, for this race? What are we going to see in terms of race pace from the Formula 9 pits? As uh, drivers either make their way back to the pit carriages or to their cars. There's the Peugeot guys, Luke Duval and Gustavo Menezes. 93 in the garage, and uh, confirmation from Peugeot, it was a power steering issue, so the power steering has been changed. Now, whether that's pump, supply, hoses, uh, or the entire rack, not entirely sure, but power steering was the issue. The car felt strange on the outlap. Let's hear what they had to say about it. See what, Paul, we need to change the steering rack and we will not have time to do it uh, before it closing. We cannot do it on the grid, so we will, and we will lose one lap. Okay, am I getting out of the car? Yes, Paul. Yeah, that was uh, what uh, we heard from the Peugeot uh, in car some little time ago. That repair has been made. The car will be ready at pit exit, but the way the regulations work here, Martin, is it will start a full lap down on the field. Yeah, I, I kind of wonder about that. I, I, I can see how potentially as a safety issue, you don't want a hypercar coming in behind the last of the GTs, you know, as the field rolls away. I, I do, I, I do think it's quite a severe penalty, though. Yeah, you know, you you, you it, start ever, any lap, ever has any race a lap down. Yeah. Uh, by the way, one, I think one of the true heroes of the FIWC, Philippe Signor, you see there from Signatech walking down the grid, the effort that he and his cohorts have made in keeping or well, bringing Alpine uh, to this grid, they'll be mm. back with the hypercars. We look at the number five uh, Porsche 963, 4.6 litre V8 twin turbo. It is, as all the cars here, around 700 horsepower, and you will see no more than 700 horsepower whether or not it's deploying its petrol power and or uh, its hybrid system. And, of course, when we talk about petrol here, what we mean is not Ethanol, hydrocarbons yes. dug up from the ground, right. but Total supplying a fully sustainable fuel here. It is gasoline, if you like. It is hydrocarbon fuel, petrol quote rather than diesel quote but it is made from byproducts that would otherwise be going into or well, making compost actually from the wine industry so the message there potentially for the future is the more wine we drink the more sustainable fuel can be made i i think that's a, a great payoff this is the one uh, the other of the nine x8 uh, peugeot's on the grid if you want one of these cars you can't buy this peugeot uh, showroom although it is on the car configurator on the peugeot website <laughs> but you can really? now that's though cool. you can you can now buy a one tenth replica of that car in lego well that that i was just saying was was that the one one-to-one -one scale Lego <laughs> Technics car that they were rebuilding yeah, in the garage. Stand next to it, that's <laughs> what you need to do. This is the number six uh, uh, Porsche, Grand Venture. will start the uh, race aboard the number six car. Belgian star looking to convert his epic form in GT racing, as many of the drivers are here into the new hypercar era. That is the Steering wheel for the Ferrari. The 51 car here will be started by James Gallardo. His very distinctive gold and white helmet. 
super excited for the guys that have well, he and Alessandro Pierguidi three times world champions in GTE yeah. Pro over the years, but but both of their GTE Pro lineups, in fact, all six drivers they've used, like at Le Mans, have been part of the group that has developed these cars, which is uh, a fantastic testament to their abilities. Nick Nielsen with Miguel Molina and Antonio Fuoco. Now, if they in their... Uh, GT Pro iteration, they were car number 52, they are car number 50 here, uh, because it's 50 years since Ferrari was last in the top class at Le Mans, I th I'm guessing that's why it's 50 and 51 rather than 51 and 52, but uh, James Collado and Alessandro Pierre Guidi remain with car number 50. They lock out row two of the grid, but in qualifying here, Brendan Hartley admitted, stung by being beaten to pole in Sebring, Toyota yep. actually focused more on qualifying than they might normally have done and that they did in Sebring, whereas on the other side of it, Ferrari spent less time worrying about qualifying and more focusing on the car, but as a result, it was still tight in qualifying, but Toyota locking out the front row of the grid. Car number seven, who were the winners in Sebring, are second on the grid, and car number eight, who are the winners here in 2021, are on pole position. Yeah, so Mike Conway aboard the number seven car. Three minute board is being shown before we see our pole position car. It's time to say they're doing a good job there in the breeze. The wind here tends to come from the tail end of the field down the front stretch, and that's yep. pretty much how it is today. Now, it's going to be Seb Wamey that takes this car away. It's going to be an interesting stint from Seb, in still in some discomfort after suffering a hand injury uh, in a Formula E uh, incident. So his stamina is going to be quite an interesting one here. It's a mm. long race in pretty extreme heat uh, out there aboard these cars. Well, now, the other factor there is the number eight team historically do single stints, yeah. whereas the number seven team historically double stint their drivers. So it may be that that is even more of a sort of saving grace for Seb. He'll get in fresh and then he'll have another couple of hours before he needs to go again. So yeah. if that is the way it works, then that will certainly help him out. He was in good form this morning, spoke to him briefly this morning, uh, hands still pretty heavily strapped. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that one. Grid getting ready to go the uh, one minute board due in just under 60 seconds before we get this underway been joined now in the booth from the grid by 2014 fi world endurance champion anthony davidson and what's it been like out there how's the atmosphere it's very hot down there that's for sure so um yeah not you as well <laughs> yeah so oh. I i'm on your side for now at least louise but <laughs> it's uh, it's definitely warmer than it's been all week so i don't know how that's going to play out uh in today's race, you know, different uh, tyre compounds we hear might have been used. Spoke to Brendan Hartley on the grid. He was saying uh, he didn't give away which tyres they were using, but he's pretty adamant that Ferrari and the, maybe the rest of the competition were on a different tyre compound to Toyota. So that'll be interesting to see how that one plays out. And uh, you don't necessarily have to start the race on the tyre that you qualified on, but you will see it at some point with one minute to go. It's going to be more exciting, I feel now, because of that nugget of information more exciting than uh, it appeared to be after that over one second deficit that ferrari were behind toyota uh, here from uh, corvette racing that ben keating who starts on pole in gte am is planning to start on a soft tire so it'll be a, a sort of tire conservation mode but he'll be at the front of the queue he's hoping at least he'll be at the front of the queue as they go green and therefore it is a tough track to pass on. He's hoping that he will bottle up those guys behind him while also giving himself a relatively gentle first stint. He's likely to double stint. There is the FIA CEO, Natalie Robin, alongside her, Cedric Viat, who is our operations director here uh, for Le Mans Endurance Management and for the World Endurance Championship. I'm delighted to have Natalie uh, in the booth with us yesterday, seeing the glamour that is TV, some tables and a bit of cloth and uh, some crisp packets predominantly, being the features of our exciting commentary booth. I learned something new down in the pit lane, watching the cars go out to grid, and you might have just seen a bit of rear wheel spin there from the Ferrari as it pulled away. The Toyotas and a few other cars as well that run the, the hybrid system were spinning all four wheels in the pit Ooh, lane. nice. And that got me confused, because I thought you could only deploy the hybrid energy and therefore four-wheel drive 
over a certain speed. It's 190 kph for the Toyota. Is it 190 or 50? 50 for the and Toyota. 120 yeah. for the 120 Peugeot. The Peugeot. Um, but they were doing it in the pit lane. So I spoke to uh, Pascal Vassal and he said, no, no, in the pit lane, you can. Ooh. You can deploy the energy. So all four wheels, wheels were set. Yeah, so I learned something new there. Every day is a school day. Absolutely. Also, I don't know if you touched on this uh, earlier on before I joined you, a new rule, new regulation for this weekend's race. Didn't have it in Sebring. It was less of an issue in Sebring. Track limits. You've got four jokers. I don't know if you've already mentioned this or it's, not. Yeah, it's, it used to be three per driver per stint. It's now five over your driving period. Well, the fifth one is you've got a penalty. Yeah. So four jokers, you can go on track limits four times. So yeah, it's for the entirety of the race yeah. for that individual driver. It yeah. doesn't get wiped out after each pit stop or after each time you've jumped out the car and then get back in. So track limits could be a bit of a deciding factor as well today. We, we, ex we expected it to be in qualifying and it was not, but that is when there are very many fewer cars on track and you've got brand new tyres and very little fuel in the heat of, of battle. In fact, most of the starting drivers Com uh, conversation with Eduardo Freitas, the race director, re was regarding if we get forced out or if we have to go off track or if we get pushed by a faster car, you know, all of these, if we are unintentionally off track, are we still going to get penalised? And it will be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. That is the 93 car, wait to get pits out, it will lose uh, a lap here with this. Six-hour race here at Portimao, the standard World Endurance Championship distance, and a second formation lap. Sebring was not exceptional. The drivers all asked if we could now move from one formation lap before we go green to two. Why, sir? The reason is we no longer use tyre ovens to preheat tyres. We no longer use tyre blankets to keep tyres warm. Tyres go on not in a nice sunny 25, 26 degrees outside temperature, but they are kept in the shade. And so tires go on stone cold. And to avoid utter carnage at the start, the drivers requested a second formation lap. And that now would seem to be standard for the rest of the season. And that will allow them to put some heat into the tires and brakes. But when they're charting down to turn one at the end of this lap, they're still not gonna have maximum grip. Yeah, I mean, I get the fact that now they're not running tyre blankets or ovens that you have to do more than one slow formation lap. It's no different, therefore, to a normal safety car period. So they're going to be getting brake temperatures up. And they can change the brake bias, of course, from, from within the car, send it a bit more forward because you can easily spin up the rear wheels and get some energy through them under traction. But you can't really do that with front wheels apart from wiggling around a little bit. If you see the virtual energy level, that is hybrid fuel, everything else, monkeys on bicycles, whatever you use to power your car, you have a certain allocation per stint. You can see 93 Peugeot still on 100% energy. That's because they haven't fired the engine up yet. They're sitting at the end of pit lane. Everybody else is gradually using that. So when we see the cars on track, when that graphic comes up, if somebody's on 30% and somebody's on 80%, you can tell how much longer they've been Absolutely. on the track. You know, and so it, it's going to be another little facet of information that, that the fans can use when you're watching at home or online or on the app. You can use to... Uh, to see exactly what relative length of time the cars are spent on track. Now, the race is underway. The six hours has started at the end of the first formation lap. But the clock's not started. Uh, the, uh, no, it hasn't. You know, you're right. And they haven't registered any laps yet either. No, because it's, so. it's formation lap. So unlike Sebring, where the race started at the end of the first formation lap, this is two formation laps, safety car, uh, driven by uh, Pedro Cochero. Race is out of the way. And now pacing the field on the right-hand side as the drivers look at the straight is our pole sitter. Toyota 1 2 in qualifying. Sebastian Buemi will lead the charge. There is an odd number of hypercars here, so the pole sitter in LMP2 should be on his own and is. Red lights are on. And we go green in Portimao. Sebastian Buemi immediately has a contact or comfort. <laughs> 
protesters from behind the Ferraris. There is contact. Trouble from the Porsche. The number five Porsche getting all mixed up under the braking, the rear getting all out of the place. And, and the, and LMP2, the, the LMP2 leader is trying to dive in through there as well. The Pramacar Dorian Pan has lost the lead. There's contact with the 94 Peugeot, but yeah. the no, number five Porsche. And the van wall got knocked out wide as well. A couple of the LMP2 cars right in there. And down here at the hairpin, Anthony, see the Porsches side by side. Porsche side by side with the second Toyota. The six cars had a great start here. And overtaken the Ferrari as well in the process. So, yeah, brilliant. So that's what we saw in Sebring as well, yeah. wasn't it? The Porsches seem to be able to light up the tyres faster than the others around them. WRT's Sean Galeo takes the lead in LMP2 from Dorian Pan. In GTE, it's Diego Alessi. He's got the jump on Ben Keating in the 21, the red, a, of course, a Ferrari. So Ben Keating, again, was on his own on the front row because of the uneven number of cars ahead of him. But uh, a good run down the inside from Diego Alessi. He's taken the lead, Sarabovi, in third place for the Iron Dames. The Glickenhaus has been overtaken by two of the LMP2 cars there. That's going to be held up around this uh, final sector. And the Floyd Van Wall car well, is a that. long way back. You can see the bright green nose of it. It's another four or five cars further back down in 17th, 17th yeah. place at the moment. And that's because they just got nudged off wide. The two United Autosports cars nearly contact. Who was that on the inside on the curbs? 22. Oh, Ben Hanley. He's always been a bit of a feisty racer as Ben Hanley. And look at that. Giving his teammates some uh, some grief down towards turn one. That's Porsche. the number five Porsche yeah, and the Porsche Cadillac. Cadillac. That's a battle for seventh place. But at the end of this this uh, racing lap, once the final cars passed, we will see the uh, the arrival of the 93 into this race. Mm -hmm. We've lost this first lap, and Mike Conway now. 1.4 seconds in the lead. He's he's seen the action behind him and thinking, I want to have no part of that. I'm, I'm out of here. Right, 93 now released from the pit lane. The 60 Iron Lynx Ferrari of Claudio Schiavone was a long way behind the pack, so that adds to the deficit of the 93 Peugeot. Let's hope that all is okay with that car. I'm sure Paul de Resta will be. Yeah, he's on stone cold tyres. Everybody else is now two laps in and two formation laps in. They're on hot tyres. He's going to be really tippy toeing his way round like he's uh, in a road car. This pair pulling away from Lawrence Fantor is holding up. Uh, no doubt about it. Nicholas Nielsen behind. But, uh, let's have a listen to what's going on with the number eight Toyota with Sebastian Buemi. Good front to the left. Mike was there on the left. I would have touched him otherwise. Copy. OK, yeah. so he's so is he saying that he went off track on the left or he or he would have touched somebody else? The, the, the teams are all, I think, and the drivers especially, all being very careful to make publicly aware everybody that they went off as a result of accident avoidance or something else. Very evenly matched down the main straight there. James Collado in the Ferrari number 51 and Sebastian Buemi that we ride on board with now. So Boemi is going to have to, to find uh, some magic here to find his way past the Ferrari because he's not going to do it in a straight line. Well, Ant, you, you raced here the last time we were here. You won the race, but you know, it, unless you are a second a lap quicker than your rival, you really have to wait for them to make a mistake. It's, it is going to be tough to overtake here for Sebastian. It really is. And uh, the longer that the race goes on as well, don't forget that you'll see a lot of marbles. This is the highest corner energy circuit on the calendar. We've come from the least cornering energy circuit on the calendar, uh, Sebring. And Buemi was close here last time around. He had a bit of a look last time as well in turn 10. Does he send it? No. Thinks better of it by the time they get to 11. It's blind going into that corner. He, he knows this is a long race there. You don't want to be making any uh, silly mistakes now. It looks again down into turn 13. Ooh. And there was some contact. Yeah. I definitely saw a bit of carbon flick up there from the right front of that Toyota. And to underline how hard it is to overtake here, the Glickenhaus is still stuck behind Dorian Pan's Prema LMP2 car, and the Floyd Van Wall car in two laps has made up one place. Not quite right. Uh, Dorian Pan uh, was passed by Olivier Plan, has repassed the, uh, uh, the okay. Glickenhaus, so that is a real feisty little battle. Here He's we go. Right in the slipstream. Flashing the headlights. Turn one can be an overtaking part of the track, but it's not easy. Just wonder if Collado went wide there. He did on the exit. Buemi's through. 
pressured him into a bit of a mistake there. Yeah. And a round of applause from the team. Calado die just breaking a little too late and a little too tight, ran out wide, and is now back to Toyota 1 2. But the number seven car has got away already. Yeah, 4.9 seconds to the good with the fastest lap of the race last time round at 132 135 for Mike Conway. Lance Van Tur still in contact here, still ahead of the second Ferrari, and is now beginning to drop the Peugeot, which it's uh, the 94 Peugeot, the undelayed 9X8, which had stuck right in there for those first couple of laps, but is now beginning to drop back. Yeah, Nico Muller in the 94 Peugeot just losing a bit of ground there. And uh, Porsche, we spoke to him on the grid, they were saying, yeah, the car's definitely performing better here than it was in Sebring, but he's under attack from Nick Nielsen in the number 50 Ferrari, who it looks like has a bit more pace, actually, than, than the 51 of Collado. Yeah. Now, if, if you take the two Toyotas out of the equation, the new cars, Ferrari, Porsche, Cadillac, arguably Peugeot as well, because they really haven't had a full season yet with the car, they are a very similar performance level, aren't they? But Toyota, you know, everybody said, oh, it's, it's easy for them to win, you know, there's nobody else to race for the last three or four seasons, but it does show that you know, three years in now, in the third year of their hypercar programme, they are really on top of their car, whereas everybody else is sort of still learning with a, a set-up set sheet for the track of basically a clear piece, piece of paper with not much written on it. I could look at that Ferrari all day long. Cracking, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful <laughs> car. I wonder what it's like to drive. I bet uh, both drivers wishing they had a little bit more horsepower under them, though, right now, they could, especially Nick Nielsen, so he can get past the, uh, the number six Porsche as... The captain watches on. Yeah. He should be encouraged by this. A good start to the race for Laurence Frontier. He's the chairman of Ferrari sandwich at the moment in the number six Penske Porsche 963. Listen in and see what's going on with the number 50 car of Nick Nielsen. Show the automatic lift and coast. We will overshoot the energy a bit for one lap and try to switch on automatic lift and coast. Ah, that's an interesting one. So, yeah, you could lift and coast to save the fuel, of course, when the car's at its VMAX, the highest speed it will go on the straight. You lift off. can be anywhere from 20 metres to even 100 metres before the corner sometimes, depending on how much fuel you need to save. So it seems like Ferrari can switch between a mechanical, so an analogue version of it, or going fully automatic, which is the more common system uh, in the hypercars. So, um, yeah, interestingly, at the start of the race, They've kind of bypassed that by the driver being able to do it themselves. Sean Galeel, our LMP2 leader, ahead of the almost identical red and white car of Dorian Power for Prema. So Dorian just had a little chink out there to show herself in the mirrors and also to try and make sure that the Glickenhaus didn't consider coming up the inside. So Olivier Pla in that bright blue hypercar Glickenhaus still not able to match WRT's Sean Galeel or Dorian Pan for pace. Yeah, both these teams as well in LMP2, WRT and uh, the Prema team, lots of data here for uh, the run P2 efforts, not just with previous racing here in uh, WC, but also with the European Le Mans series, yep. albeit with the cars in a slightly different spec. But a uh, great shot there from the rear uh, facing camera of the Porsche. Nick Nielsen trying to get onto terms here with the Porsche 963. Well, he was just showing his nose again, and moving around behind the car. Part of that gives you a little bit more cooling airflow, gives you a little bit more aerodynamic grip. The other part of it is just to try and distract the driver in front to sort of keep flicking in his mirrors and, uh, and make him not look at what he should be looking at, which is the road ahead. Well, I mean, it worked beautifully for Buemi, didn't it, in turn one? Just that distraction. Yes, he was closer, but just that darting out, giving the driver in front the impression that you're going to make a move is sometimes enough Yeah, to make them just topple, going a bit too quick, just like Collado did, run out a bit wide, track limits is an issue as well, and uh, the drivers are aware of that. It's a very fine balance, so now Nielsen gets a good run out of the penultimate corner, and this is where it looks like he's suffering a little bit in that turbulent air of the car in front. He's having to back out of it a bit more, focus on getting a good run onto the main straight, but he's not quite close enough. Well, the last lap, James Collado crept a little bit away in the first of the two Ferraris, but actually that allowed cl clear airflow for the Porsche, and Porsche's just done its best lap of the race so far, and that has helped him to just creep away from Nick Nielsen in the second Ferrari. So. 
you know, you lose ground to the car you're trying to chase, and he has lost quite a lot of ground, but now if that helped him just pace himself a Here little bit. Here we go. Bit. This is the closest he's been down towards turn five. Surely he's going to have a little bit of a duck out. It might not go for the move, but yes, Ooh, he, he just sends it. Beautifully done there. And it all happened on the exit of turn one. He carried momentum, got closer on the brakes into turn two, well, the kicker turn two, turn three, hooked the car up nicely on the exit of three, gave himself a brilliant run round four, and, uh, yeah, I wonder if he was going to not quite have the momentum he wanted. It was just enough. We've been looking forward to this, haven't we? We've had year after year after year of Porsche versus Ferrari in the fabulous GTE Pro class. And now we get them to do it all over again in hypercar. And it's funny because we were talking to the Ferrari drivers about that and to the Porsche drivers about that over the last couple of days. And they said, yeah, it's great. <laughs> we're still battling the same guys. And, and you know, there's... There was a degree of animosity a couple of times in the GTE Pro just class, but, but I think that I think all of that has just settled down because all of these drivers <laughs> are so excited to be in hypercar. Well, at the moment, Don't I take, it, yeah, I take it back from uh, WRT and Prema at least, who are ahead of the Glickenhaus and staying ahead of the Glickenhaus. I said at the beginning, oh, the Glickenhaus get held up around the final sector. They're actually dropping. Uh, who is it at the, at the it's moment? Olivier Plan. Olivier, Olivier, Olivier but Plan. also, the 22 United car, Ben Hanley, is now almost tucked up under the gearbox of the Glickenhaus. And the, and the hypercars are slower through turn five, and particularly out of turn five, than the LMP2 car. So Hanley could well make a pass. Here's our second place battle in GTEM. And that's the pole sitting Corvette of Ben Keating and the pink Porsche of the Iron Dames driver, Sarah Bovey. And again, you know, Ben was convinced that the Ferrari had the package to take pole here. He was thinking that, that there would be a Ferrari 1-2-3, and he, he wasn't, you know, fluffing. He genuinely believed that they didn't have the pace. In the end, again, it came down to Ben and Sarah going head-to-head, toe-to-toe. Worth saying, by the way, the last time the Iron Dames were here, all people with a slightly different lineup, they won yes. in the European Le Mans series uh, at the end of last season. The day after that race, they tried this Porsche for the very first time here. Yeah. And in fact, they would have won the previous year's race in ELMS, except after Sarah Bovia had been knocked off track twice in the final 30, 40 minutes, the car set light to itself. So, they, I mean, they were absolutely shoe in for victory despite the travails in the race. So coming back 12 months later and taking that win was absolutely uh, a fitting reward for all their efforts. So now we're into the traffic. This is where things get spicy here in Portimao. Mike Conway goes around, braves around the outside of the car guy Ferrari through turn two and into turn three. You've got to have a sixth sense about you. And eyes everywhere in the mirrors as well before you commit to turning in. Yeah, it's tough here, isn't it? You were telling us uh, in the earlier sessions and uh, just where the sighting points are difficult from these cars as well. Not a lot of visibility. More rise and fall than this season has strictly come dancing here at Portimao. <laughs> and it is tough to spot the apexes, tougher still when there's cars in your rear view mirror and in front and to the side, on either side, all at the same time. Again, look at the slow stuff there, how close Ben Hanley was coming up the hill out of turn three, right behind the bright blue Glickenhaus. Now, that stretches his legs, it's got more power and it just pulls away down the straight, but again, when they get into the tight and twisty corners, the Glickenhaus will be uh, outmaneuvered by the LMP2 car. Dane Cameron in the number five Porsche with Richard Westbrook behind him in the Cadillac. Sole Cadillac here this weekend, and we will have a second caddy joining us in two weeks' time at Spa-Francorchamps. Buy your tickets now, make sure you get there if you're anywhere in close proximity in Northern Europe. And then, of course, there will be a three Cadillac entry at Le Mans. There will, and uh, Cadillac will be back here at Portimao the week after uh, uh, Spa for their first European test. Let's have a listen in to what's going on with the number five Porsche of Dane Cameron. Dane. Track limits warning, turn one, previous lap. Yeah, I've written down, a, oh, I'm starting to write down track limit count here on my notepad in front of me, and I did write down car number five, DC, one strike. Can I just say that there's not even remotely enough room on that piece <laughs> yeah. of paper for six hours? <laughs> I might uh, start again. Well, and the deal is that actually that is a reinforcing of the track limits because in Dane's car in the safety idea ID screen 
it will also so also show him track limits T1. So he will be informed in the cockpit automatically by race control that he has been notified as having exceeded track limits. And here comes the Cadillac on the inside of Cameron. He's going to have to be cautious here, defending. He doesn't want to break late and go in too deep and run out wide and get another track limits wor worry. Richard Westbrook, who also has a track limits uh, infringement as well, or one, one of his jokers used, putting a lot of pressure there on the number five Porsche. Still didn't see any notes on our screen as to the first lap incident between number five and the 94 Peugeot, but there was definite contact there. Yeah, he did. He lost the rear end, didn't he? And then the, the kind of in recovery just slapped the rear of the number 94 car. But we saw this, didn't we, in Sebring as well. The Cadillac not quite having the pace or the restart capabilities of the Porsche, but definitely looking after its rear tyres better throughout a stint. Now, what we also didn't see very much of is LMP2, and there was a lot of carambulage at the start because the Vector Sport car... Ooh, changed a switch. position. OK, yes. so Dorian Pan down to third, is that? Or is that the second Prima car? No, no. down to third, and then another yeah. swap of position. Westbrook's yeah. got it done down into turn one. So Richard Westbrook moves up ahead of the Peugeot into sixth position. It is now Sean Galea leading from Olivier Platt it hypercar and then Ben Hanley up to second in LMP2. The Vector Sport car that started a, 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 a thousandth away from pole is now down in sixth place in LMP2. And the car that started fourth in LMP2 into Europol is down in eighth. Oh! oh. oh. car just lost under the braking. Lucky not to catch the 886. Yeah. They're all on truck clouds and they're thinking, well, what's about <laughs> this time? <laughs> oh, I wonder, I wonder, you were looking away at the, at the timing screen at the, at the time when it happened, Martin, but. Yeah. I, there, I there was a bit of contact, I think, between that car and the number five Porsche oh. on the exit of turn three. Just oh. before they committed to turn four, I'm sure they had a side-by-side -side moment oh. as Cameron makes a wow. do-or-die move there on uh, Dallalana, I think. Let's Once take again. a look here. Oh, no, oh, it was actually the 86. Ahead. It was the 86, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it was the, front to rear. The GR racing car, Michael Wainwright, you just saw him clip the uh, as he pulled out. That's what we were all thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Laura's just seen her reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't. Yes, always. <laughs> so, luckily, oh, it's always on you. Luckily, the words froze on her lips because <laughs> we can all no, read in no, slow no. motion. <laughs> OK, so the Cadillac moves on and up. And, of course, Laura Wontrop Plaza is the head of GM Racing. So that means the Cadillac hypercar program. It also means the uh, Corvette racing operation in GTE Am here. It means the US Cadillac operation. It also means the new GT3 Corvette program that comes on stream towards the end of this uh, season with the first customer cars being delivered. So a multitude, uh, instead of having a uniform for every team, she's just got GM racing, which, which, which covers it all. WRT lead then, 22 United up to second. Diane Pan down to third, but still ahead of Gerda van der Gaard in the 23 United Autosports car. And the van wall makes up a position, I think, there. I think that was Tom Dillman. This could be a pass here, Martin. Sorry to butt in there. United. You've got the 23 car now. United sending it down the inside into turn five, gets the job done. It's going to be a black flag, isn't it, for Mike Wainwright? <laughs> yeah, but track limits, that was a lot of track limits on the exit of turn five. Oh, yeah. So that would have been noted. Olivier Pla being warned about track limits, the 86-88 Porsche contact there. I think it's going to be a black, black and orange flag for Mike Wainwright, because that front, uh, whole right-hand front wing is flapping around in the breeze. It's yeah. probably only being held on by the wiring for the headlight, which, as you may appreciate, at 150 miles an hour, isn't enough. Indeed. Uh, Second place battle in GTE Am, still behind the 21 Ferrari, but only by a second and a half. So Ben Keating has got eyeline sight of the 21 car. He's got much more of uh, a deal on his plate, though, defending against Sarah Bovey. Yeah, 88 has made his way back to pit lane, and that means that for the first time of the race, the 93 car moves up a position, is actually about to get onto terms with the back of the GTM uh, grid after 20 minutes of putting a lap on them. Now, here's a chance for Olivier Pla in the bright blue Glickenhaus. He gets the run on tr in traffic on the 22 United Autosport LMP2 car. Ben Handley, who had a look back down the inside and mm, wasn't really going to happen for him. 
It's not really his race to fight, is it, to get to Glickenhaus? He'd much prefer for, for Pla just to get the job done and, and drive away in the distance, but they are crisscrossing each other's performance yeah. gains and differences through the lap. There's a strip there. Triple, triple, triple seven. Oh, the triple seven, yeah. yeah. This D station, Satoshi Hoshino. Hoshino does not like starting the race. But he has started. And that is the front wing of the number 86 car. Yep. So yellow flag on the front stretch down to turn one, that at might, turn one, between one and two, in fact. That might be a safety car moment, you know, when you've got people mm -hmm. on track having to recover a big part of the car. Louise Beckett is down in the pit lane. What do you know? The, it was a new set of tyres for the 88 and the 86. GR Racing team are ready for that car to come in. Yeah, it'll be a little less of the car when it does arrive, because I'm pretty sure that is the right front fender. Yeah, yeah so uh, totally flat spotted the tyres, uh, Ryan Hardwick in the 88 car. He's had a couple of incidents in free practice. Has not been entirely uh, untouched by others. Yeah, he's not the best of starts with WCC, does he, with the car eliminated. Um, from competition at Sebring in free practice two after a brush from uh, Richard Westbrook. This is a brand new car. <laughs> Richard Westbrook was having a, a, a chat. Well, it, at least it wasn't me this time <laughs> about contact with the car. Talking about brand new cars, by the way, in fourth place in uh, GTE Pro, Luis Perez Compank in the 83 Richard Mille racing team. Ferrari, that's another of the red cars. You'll see it coming into the background of the shot in a moment as the caddy goes by Ben Keating's Corvette. Brothers in arms. Yep, the 83 car, a bit less upside dowdy this weekend so, so far. far. <laughs> but uh, you're yeah, right, a brand new Ferrari 488, that's a rare thing. Yeah. And uh, this, well, this car originally intended to be their Le Mans car. And, and I wonder how many more 488s will be built. Uh, Probably none. I can tell you that a number were built for this year. Right. Uh, but it will almost certainly be the last. That is a diminishing supply. Indeed. Body shells, for yeah. starters. 296 GT3, of course, to replace that car. And that will join the new LM GT3 class that uh, joins the replaces GT uh, E AM next year in the FI World Endurance Championship. And uh, as we found out the last few days before we travelled out here, um, a tyre contract has gone the way of Goodyear mm. for that new class in the FI World Endurance Championship and the European Le Mans Series for three years from 2024. The uh, D station car that we saw facing the wrong way, Stewart's are investigating an incident between 777, which is D station, and 57. And that is the, the Kessel Racing Car Kessie. Guys Ferrari. It, it, we saw, you know what we saw this at Sebring? It was very feisty between Hashino san and, and Kimura san throughout their stints, and it seems to have continued. Well, you know, you're in very equal cars, even if they are completely poles apart, one with the engine at the front, one with the mid-engine, and so on and so on. But your performance levels are exactly the same. And you know, we we saw Takeshi Kimura in the Kessel Racing Ferrari. Uh, a couple of times in races at Fuji, absolutely refusing to give ground to anybody. In and out for Mike Wainwright. Maybe a, a penalty to serve, but let's hear from Louise Beckett in the pit lane. Yeah, it's a new front right bodywork to that car, but also because the wing mirror was hanging off, it was a new right door as well. They completely replaced the door. Excellent stuff, and that will be lifted off the pins, put the new one in, plug in the dry brake connector for the electrics, and away you go. So it's not quite the long labor job it would be if you're trying to do it on a road car. So the stewards will take no action regarding the race start, so whatever uh, contact, biffery, and tomfoolery went on, they don't decide that any of it was illegal. And let's now hear from our race leader, Mike Conway. Had a really bad car. Uh, okay, copy. Avoid curb turn nine. Remember for. Uh, one quick uh, addition. Huh? Uh, one. WRT leading in LMP2. Sean Galel, though, coming under pressure from Ben Hanley. In fact, has that been a pass already? Yeah, one yeah, of the Hanley uh, went United. Past him at the line, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, so Ben Hanley leading LMP2 from Sean Galel. 
to get a van der Garde. It's a 1-3 for United. They'll be looking for better fortune than came their way at Sebring with the 22 car eliminated by, uh, well, what can we say? It was a bit of camera equipment that killed the kill switch. So you would expect, naturally, the United to see another pass into one, turn five. One yeah, one, two for United yeah, Auto Sports. You would expect that, though. So again, a track limit infringement on the exit of turn five after a pass uh, into that corner. Mm. Sebastian Bremi being pinged for track limits at turn one as well. But as, you would ex as is Richard Westbrook. You would expect the United to be making a bit of ground uh, on the silver graded driver there of Sean Galel in the WRT and of course the silver graded driver of Dorian Pan. So uh, they've got to make this uh, they've got to make this ground now while they can before the driver on the right hand side of that shot, Josh Pearson, gets into one of the United's the car 23 later on in the race. Yeah. Nick Nielsen getting on to turn two with James Collado. So the two 499Ps are going to be lapping in formation for a little wee while. 51 in third. The 50 car follows suit in fourth. Now, this battle is 21 seconds off the lead already. How many laps have we done? 16. Right, well, this is the at this point, it is who has the pace in the car. Will they let Nick Nielsen have a crack at this, or are they going to just work together on that gap? Well, I think if you've got a quicker car behind you, particularly at this stage, you just let him go and and because you never know what fortune is going to bring. It's unlikely that we'll get through six hours here in Portimao without a safety car. And of course, that juggles everything up. We managed to avoid full course yellow. Uh, there were double yellows on the start finish line um, a moment or two ago. I think that was for recovering that bit of bodywork. Uh, luckily, it was a long way offline by the pit wall. Again, as the LMP2 car comes through, Ben Keating held offline. Sarah Bovey in the pink Porsche, looking at the inside. Keating runs out wide, exceeds track limits. So that'll be one of his uh, warnings racked up. And Sarah Bovey has a good run on him. And Ant, you so often in a slower car, even in LMP2, if somebody quicker comes by a rival, it opens up all sorts of opportunities. Well, vice versa as well. You know, in the LMP2 cars or even the hypercar, you're always using the traffic to your advantage. And uh, Sometimes can be a disadvantage if you, the car in front, don't want to be overtaken, of course, and you get into a bit of traffic, and suddenly the car you've been racing well with behind has, has found a way past. It's just where you catch the car and how you gain or lose that momentum. You were just watching uh, in the Iron Dames garage, Rahul Frey, the Swiss driver, who's the, uh, the another of the drivers in that pink machine, watching intently. And here comes the fan wall. This is Tom Dillman right behind with the uh, dark green car with a pale green nose. Slipping through traffic. <laughs> 27 minutes into the six hours of Portimao. Race two of the FIA World Endurance Championship here in Portugal. Our second visit to this roller coaster track coming here behind closed doors in 2021. Big crowd. Probably still trying to get in here. In fact, there was an hour long queue about an hour before the start trying yep. to get in and queues to get in the grandstands. Really good to see lots of fans here. And don't forget, if you are in Northern Europe, and you, particularly if you haven't managed to get tickets for Le Mans for the 24 hours in tune, we race again in two weeks' time at Spa Francorchamps. Squeeze there, the number nine car on the 85. Yeah, Diane Pan going by. One of her stablemates, actually. That was one man, uh, this no, the other one. It's one man, well, Correa, Correa. The identical, yeah. uh, but slightly different. No, yeah, utterly identical, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yes, indeed. This battle of GTM continues. Was enthralling at Sebring, no less so here. And Diego Alessi was one and a half seconds in front. He no longer is. That's him, the yep. red Ferrari with the yellow strip. Now it's down to a second. So despite the fact that Ben Keating has been trying to hold off Sarah Bovey for the entire race so far, they are actually closing in and now within a second. So in the DRS activation zone, except we don't have that sort of thing in this racing. It's, uh, I just feel we're going to be talking about these battles at the front of that class throughout this. It just, it's got that feel of a season-long duel, and I hope mm. more than a duel. Diego Lessi making a fight of it here. Yep, absolutely so. Toyota out front, the number seven car, by seven seconds now, and holding that advantage over Sebastian Buemi. And Buemi 
not as quick in the number eight car and exceeding track limits as well to try and keep Mike Conway in check. Now, as we talked about before the race started, Buemi injured in a Formula E crash last time out in Formula E. So he's damaged his right wrist, it's strapped up, and that is not helping because, and this is not power steering, air conditioned road car luxury. These things are brutal. Well, I mean, they do have power steering, but it's nowhere near to the level of that of uh, the assistance in a road car, of course, and it's a very tough track. But I think he's doing OK uh, in terms of his the physical aspect. Uh, yes, the wrist is strapped up, but it, it hasn't really been holding him up and, uh, at all through this weekend. Um, but I think Mike is just he's driving an absolute blinder at the moment. Mm. He's, he's edging away. As I say that, the gap's come down from about 7 seconds to 6.7, <laughs> but it must Welcome be traffic. To yeah, it's that, gone. That's <laughs> mates for you. Yeah. Sorry, Mike. We'll, we'll make him stop talking about it. Yeah, th yeah, thanks, Mike. Just put your foot down again <laughs> to make me uh, stand corrected. But, um, yeah, it was when we started, when, when, when we got past the Ferrari, it was around four seconds. So globally, it's gone up. And um, that's a surprise. Usually these two, they, they often start the race Buemi and Conway, and they fight it out tooth and nail all the way first to, to the first set of pit stops. And um, it's not the case this time. It's surprising to see. There's 94, Peugeot making its way through traffic. The 93, by the way, their progress up to 26th place now. Yep. And uh, next target is that tr leading trio in GTE AM for position as the recovery of that car that started this race late. He's now just passed uh, both uh, Sarabovi and Ben Keating. And we're not hearing anything on the radio from the team, so presumably Paul Deresta is not having a panic that the car feels odd again, and so hopefully that power steering issue... You know, it's, it's uh, all sorts of new car issues, and uh, Persia have had a number of them with that car. But it hasn't been a steering so far, so that's an, another first for them. I've been watching his times for a car that's been constantly in traffic for about the last, what is it, 31 minutes. Uh, his times aren't bad. It's not race leading pace, but it's not a million miles away from it. So Final warning for Paul Davalana. He's been warned for track infringements in the 98 Northwest AMR Aston. That means the next time he does it, it'll be into the pits for a penalty. And that's the entire race, remember. Not just this stint or yep. his time behind the wheel. Uh, so he'll have to next do this yeah. And he will have to do two stints in this race to, to get his minimum driver time uh, or a stint and a half. So, yeah, he is fresh out of jokers. So by the time we, we, we are informed of track limit infringements, but when there is a track limit warning, that's your last. You've had four, the fifth one, you do not get a get-out-of-jail-free card. James Collado started to creep away a little from Nick Nielsen over the last couple of laps, as you can see, but the gap has never really been much more than a second and, and often a little less. And Nielsen again closing back in on the 51 car in front of him. That really demonstrates the two different lines that you can take through turn 10 and 11. James going for the, uh, the inside line, braking with the car a bit straighter, and Nick Nielsen having to be easier on the brakes, but taking a wider arc through the whole corner to aim for a better exit. So I never really found out which was the, uh, the best way to go around that corner. Every driver's got a different approach. I guess whatever feels best yeah. is best. Let's hear from Paul DeResta. Try a massive rear lock there, it's over. BD forward. Up here we shake it. Could not be any worse, P2 done, GD. Massive rear lock, BB forward, he was asking. Yeah, brake balance, yeah. Uh, he wants to shift it forwards, and it seemed like a, it was a question that came from Paul there. Can I go forward mm. on the brake bias, the way that he phrased it? So uh, it's something that maybe the team are having to monitor. Um, usually it would just be to the driver's discretion whether they feel like they can go forwards or not. What are you eyeing there, Martin? No, <laughs> You're I, looking I, at the track limits. You see, yeah, yeah, you know, and he was so close, you know, just the width of the tyre, and in fact, just the width of the front tyre, because the rear tyre was just drifting a little, not entirely over the white line. There was chalk dust. But, you know, that's as close as you want to get. You want to use as much road as you can because that allows you to keep the speed up. But with only five mistakes allowed in an entire race, and there they're on their own, not in traffic, you've got to be clean all the time. Yeah, Bovi's still looking here for a way alongside and round Ben Keating, but no look so far, and the Toyota's just about to close in to 
go by. Uh, just a quick moment with that uh, that uh, Persia ball director. He's some three minutes off the lead after that uh, late start to the race. Both your four wheels over the white line there on the exit of 15. That is a corner that they're monitoring. I think what happened was she was desperate to carry the speed to try and get a run down into turn one, but just didn't lift out of it enough in a bit of turbulent air for good measure and uh, sent the car off the track momentarily. But a great fight. Deborah Meyer there in the uh, gold rim glasses to the right of uh, Rahul Freinarshot. And she's the head of the FI the Motorsport Commission, as well as the person that uh, started this fabulous Iron Dames project. But yeah, the driving force behind it, and they've been rewarded with the contract to run Lamborghini's hypercar program as well. So talk about big ambitions in that crew. They have got an awful lot going on. Of course, they are also doing the engineering for the Prema Racing LMP2 crew. We're on board with Antonio Felix da Costa, the local hero, trying to run down no longer teenage Dorian Pa, but uh, one of the younger drivers in the field. And Dorian heading into the pit lane, so we were just hearing from Louise Beckett, they're expecting LMP2 pit stops. She's the first to break for the pits. Gerda van der Gaard in from second place in the number 23 United Autosport. Dorian Pan in from fourth uh, in the number nine Prema car. We have our first LMP2 stoppers. Also in are Vector and Inter Europol, who were second and fourth on the grid. So they are just making doubly sure. Rui Andrade coming in as well for Jota is also David Heinemeyer Hansen. If you're new to this form of racing, it's a pro, sort of pro-am formula in uh, LMP2. So you're going to see a, a kind of expansion and contraction of these gaps. Let's have a listen to one of those teams, the 48 Hertz Team Jota Orica. Push now, big push. Rocking up for fuel, big push. That's... Right. That's, you're still out there. They're in there. That's push, it. Push. This, this is the in-lap, out-lap push to try and get that leapfrog. So to try and overcut, if you like, the car that he was chasing, which is Prema's Dorian Pan. There is the other Jota car. They're yep. both in gold. But this is the last time this season that we will see two LMP2 cars from Jota. They start working on their new Porsche hybrid. Next Not week. quite on Monday because they'll oh. be travelling, but yes, next yeah. week in the run-up to its debut in Spa. The first batch of there they go with Antonio Felix Costa was in no taking uh, no uh, prisoners there was it? Okay, now, so he's got two in laps basically over Dorian Pan. So she will come out as everybody does from the pit line on cold tyres and really tippy toey. Sean Galel stays in the car. Ben Hanley is in. Correa stays in. Antonio Felix da Costa, the last to stop then. Juju Canal, no, he's in for Alpine as well. It will be Antonio Felix da Costa going a lap longer than the entire field. Well, that means he's been doing an awful lot of lift and coast. So uh, that's why he wasn't making headway through the pack there. They're focusing on the on the long run here to try and save maybe a splash towards the end of the race. Is he paying for his own fuel, do you think? <laughs> Must be. <laughs> Although he's not as tight as me. <laughs> so we're listening to what's going on with the number 50 Ferrari. Nick Nelson. We've done 23 laps. What's the situation on your left tires? Would you consider to double the left or not at all? I have a small vibration there, but nothing, nothing critical. Copy, copy. And here's a chance for an overtake down towards turn five. Collado knows it. He was hindered by the Ferrari. He had to a lap ahead of him through four, but he's got it covered just about. Big defense there from Collado. Yeah, great stuff. Elbows out, wasn't it? Properly. Possibly just. But Nilsson just looks like he's possibly got a bit more pace. Uh, I know you said that the gap was, was kind of increasing Yo -yo between the two of them. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's just been ebbing and flowing more than anything. And. Uh, yeah, Collado definitely had to fight for it there to save the overtake. And it's very hard actually to even follow at this kind of distance because of that turbulent air getting kicked up from the car in front. So in now comes the number 48 car from the lead of LMP2 and Telio Felix da Costa. 
136 7 uh, is flying lap and what is this going to give us as the Hertz team Jota team go to work Morning. warning flag now for, for Ben Keating so he's getting a, a edging towards doom and gloom moments for track limits uh, should also say by the way I wasn't sure whether or not either of you spotted it but it's going to be a five second longer pit stop for the Kessel racing car Takeshi Kimura judged at fault for the instant that turned around the triple seven yeah, Aston ben, Martin Ben Keating Trouble. also having his final warning and uh, yeah the Vector Sport car recovering from what looks like it might have been a spin for Ryan Curry. okay mate if you can let the sister car go they are quicker at the moment. They are not quicker. I have traffic. Sometimes you get up, sometimes you don't. All right, mate, we have to open up the gap or you're going to hear me again. <laughs> that's that's a fair enough. That comment's wow. fair yeah. enough. So, yeah, I mean, look, welcome to the world that Toyota have been in for the last, wow, mm. God knows how long. Um, they've been fighting each other. They've got protocols in place now, how they fight each other. And what happens now is that you're going to see Collado driving out of his skin to try and open that gap. And Nilsson will try as well. Yeah. And they'll be taking 10 tenths risks through traffic. You and might you might risk a bit of reliability there as well. And track limits, of course, is a thing. Is I love it though because it's it is be, oh, trouble. It's ultimate the vector pressure. Car. It's the vector car right. is super slow on he's, track. He's got a light out on the on the left rear as well, so maybe something to do with a. Has he got carrying a puncture? Is it damaged the left rear of the car? It was Salado looking in the mirrors, thinking, right, I'm looking at this gap. I've got to increase it. And you can see that it was down to just over three tenths a couple of laps ago. So he's. Yeah, you know, and the teams are going to have to instill the same sort of strategy that, that Toyota have had. If you catch up the guy in front, get on the horn, I want to go by. Toyota's rule is you have two laps to break free, and if you don't, back in your box, Sunbeam, and everybody else with the two-car team is going to have to have a similar strategy. So something hanging down Loose on that left, I was left rear. I was going to ask, He was on, we didn't see the incident, whether or not it was just a spin or whether or not there was something else. He was close on track to the 93 Peugeot. Uh, the last time I looked at okay. the timing and scoring, it was looked like it was out of turn five, but we'll see what Vector tell us about that. I wouldn't be surprised if there's been some contact there. Well, Look, I, I, I would imagine he's had a spin and just hit the left rear somehow, and it's and it's either bent or damaged the uh, the left rear of the car. Well, let's catch up with Louise Beckett in the pit lane. Ben Hanley out of the 22 United car after leading when he brought it into the pits. Ben Hanley, that looked like a good uh, run for the 22 United. In fact, both of you were working well together, but um, obviously hard work. Uh, yeah, it's always tricky at the start. You know, round here is notoriously difficult to follow. Um, but the 22 United car was, you know, fantastic throughout the stint. Um, we were just managing the fuel and the tyres a little bit. And I was stuck behind the Glickenhaus, but at the same time, he kind of helped me a bit with some of the cars in front when he went past them. So, yeah, you'd like to think it swings and roundabouts. You know, you get stuck behind someone and then later on in the race, it comes to your advantage. So, it seems to be what happened throughout this stint. So. Um, yeah, but obviously we went forward, we were leading the stint. Um, it's a long way to go, so it's a great start. The car feels fantastic, so big thanks to United for the opportunity. And yeah, let's see what we've got for the rest of the race. Thank you. Anthony, side by side. Yeah, Anthony pointing to the screen as the Ferraris do swap position. Now, that didn't look like that was James Collado intentionally letting him through. It didn't, did it? At Not all. really. I, I think it happened because of the car they just lapped before. And so now it's Nielsen's chance to say, look, I was faster, it was genuine, and now I'm the one to increase the gap. And Collado will be on a mission to prove the his engineer wrong. Oh, Ooh. goodness. Wow, that was, that was a, yeah, a little bit risky there, if, if anything, wasn't it? But, yeah, uh, James having to whip out well, behind the 888 car, but... He did have to whip out, yeah, exactly, but uh, maybe he wasn't... Sh sure that Nielsen was going to be right there as close as he was when he came out from the back of the uh, the slower car that he was lapping. You're looking at me with I, a, I, a smirk. I, I, I predict a season-long cameo here. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is going to be something 
we hear quite a bit of through this season. While we're talking Ferrari, by the way, we talked about the new Ferrari chassis here for the uh, AF Corsa team, uh, the, the car of Lewis Perez Compact, the Richard Mille AF Corsa team, and how many how few of those are going to come out as a 488 because the 296 GT3 car is on its way. Yes. It's just today secured its first international victory. Wow. At the Nordschleifer. Oh, change of position. Yes, Sarah I was Bovey. just about to tell you that, by the way. That's, right. uh, that's happened, uh, I think, at the end of the previous lap. I'll double check. Diego Alessi is still leading, but the gap is now out to 4.4 seconds ahead of Sarah Bovey, but she is racing away from Ben Keating there. We'll catch up, I'm sure, with Vector Sport, either with Louise Beckett or from Fiona Miller, their PR. Little way uh, to go yet before we can expect these cars on pit lane, so this can still bed in. It was at the end of the previous lap. It was, it, it was uh, more or less over the line. So into turn one up the inside from Sarah Bovey. Well, we saw her uh, a number of times, didn't we? Trying to get a really good run out of the final corner. And there she did, got properly hooked up, up to second place. Yeah, that was a, a really nice overtake. And I did have the suspicion that she was a bit faster throughout the first part of this race. And uh, let's see if she can keep edging away that gap to Ben Keating behind and start to close the gap to the car in front of uh, Alessi. A couple of, uh, a couple of um, gaps to look at. 21 seconds, by the way, behind Sebastian Bramey, Nick Nielsen. Let's see whether or not that can come down. Let's go down to pit lane with Louise Beckett. Just spoken to Vector, the number 10, and it seems like a power train issue, but they don't know at the moment, so they can't give us any more information because the team are still trying to figure it all out. Thanks, Lou. That, we'll is so rare. On that. Yeah, that is exactly. so rare in LMP2. Yeah. Yeah. These things are just ironclad. It must have just been a coincidence that, he, that the left rear light was out and something hanging down. Yeah, no, carry on. Carry, carry your thought. I, I have another, an, another thought for you. But, you know, it wouldn't be the first time we've seen something like this happen. Um, you can have a, a spark plug breakdown. It's happened to me before uh, in LMP2. But, um, yeah, the, the back end clearly off of that car. And, yeah, it was such a shame for Vector Sport. They had real speed here. Absolute pace. Almost got pole position. Uh, just one thousandth off pole position was Gabby Aubrey. Did a brilliant job. They've been quick all weekend. And this really doesn't... Uh, He'll be gutted. He'll be gutted yeah. not to get the chance to show what he could do in the race. Well, he might still get a chance to show what he, he could do might. in the race. They're unlikely to get a decent podium finish. By the way, Sarabovi Ben Keating... Yes. Ben has no track limits left. He's on his final public warning. That's going to be it. That's As a good. result, he lifted coming out of 15 yeah. to avoid getting a drive through, and Sarah got the run on him exactly as she was hoping. And, and when you are out of luck or out of, you know, get out jail free cards, then you have to play by the rules really scrupulously because the penalty for exceeding track limits is much greater than the penalty for not exceeding track limits. Meanwhile, here come the Toyotas, the leaders battling together. Let's hear what James Collado's got to say. I'm back to the big I see, man, I see. Let's just hang with him. No! Mate, when we're faster, we'll get by. They will let us by. It works both ways. <laughs> That's you know, a good message, and it's fair. Yeah. It's fair. That's the way it has to work, like you said, Martin. It, give it a try. See if the other one is faster. If there's no gap, gap increase, swap back again. It's pretty simple. I, I, I'm not sure what Ferrari's equivalent of calm, Seb, is, but I think we're going to need that for James Collado, the angry young man of Ferrari racing at the moment. Mike Conway, though, under real pressure for the lead. Sebastian Bremi right with him now. And this is a... This is a sort of second win for Sebastian Buemi in this stint because he had dropped back seven seconds and has closed right up to, well, that stage in traffic, not even seven tenths. He was just a car and he could almost touch the leader. So Buemi coming right back at Conway. Now, possibly Mike has started to find a little issue with the balance of the car that is sort of wearing his tires a I bit think, more. Yeah, or I think... he's saving more fuel. Well, I think that Mike possibly just could have started too quickly. He's just put too much energy through his tyres in the first part of this race. And Buemi's played, he's playing the longer game. And uh, I was surprised. I did say it was, it was weird in the beginning how he's losing so much time to Conway, up to seven seconds. 
from three or four seconds at the beginning after Seb had cleared the number 51 Ferrari of Collado. But now to be as close, did Conway just get into some mammoth traffic? It could well uh, could, yeah, I mean, the cameras came to them when they were in a in that traffic situation in turn four, but this is Collado now we're riding Drop on board right with. Back. It's, it's lost a second on the last mm. lap, so it's the fastest lap of the race for the 50 Ferrari, for the car. Yep. Just want to listen to the 51 car, but it's, it's lost time, but that's because well, we're really good lap time for... Well, Nielsen did a personal best yes, on that last set, 33-2, and compared to Collado's 34-3. And has brought down that uh, gap, by the way, under 20 seconds. So we'll listen in with the number eight car, and uh, this is Seb Wamey in pursuit. Okay, Seb, prepare to swap in turn one. Prepare to swap turn one. Touching the tire behind him. Yeah, swap we turn one. The oh, wow. Okay, so Sebastian has been on the radio. I am quicker than you, Felipe. Well, they're not going to make it uh, turn one this time, are they? It's too not far away. Really, no. Now, there's been a number of races where the crew of number eight have been outpaced by number seven, but have actually won on fuel economy by a lot of lifting and coasting. You're right, it's not happening this lap, but it My is God, going really to happen. There. Really hindered there by the uh, into Europol in front, and I think we're, gonna see, a, we're yeah. gonna see a swap here down into five because of that. There it goes. Very strange, though. I mean, Conway just rocketed away, didn't he, at the start, mm -hmm. and uh, continued to pull the gap on Buemi. Oh, and that was very close there. You've got to have trust in the car that you're overtaking or lapping, as it was in that, that now, position. And the danger for Conway there is if he gets held up by an LMP2 car, a little GT clump at the wrong place, and Sebastian suddenly gets like a second and a half on him in that incident, then he can't come back after two laps and go, look, he's, he hasn't got away because he has got away. So you, you've, you're really under pressure there as the driver who's just had to concede the place to stick right with your teammate at all costs. And actually, there are a couple of GT cars not too far in front of them. As we look at Lewis Perez Compact holding off Michael Dynan. So uh, a North versus South America's battle in the squabble for fourth. Look on board with Mike Dynan. Blue flags being shown to him and why LMP coming up behind you. Yeah. That is partly the onboard safety screen, so he is still in a blue flag zone. Then when it clears, that will go back down to a black screen. It'll show red flags, yellow flags, black and orange flags, white flags, white, black and white driver flags warning you about track limits at the particular corner that you've been examined in. And there is Dynan in the Brilliant blue, Aston Martin looking down the inside of Lewis Perez, Compank into turn one, it's going to be close, Anthony. Yeah, well, bullied him out of it almost, really. Yeah, it's... nice move. Yeah, I mean, there was no way that he could turn in and commit to the corner because the Aston was there on the inside. And uh, you can really see there how cumbersome, how lazy the GT car is when they have to correct the, the steering after committing to the corner. Half a tyre's width it inside. Was fine. It, it was fine. fine. Absolutely <laughs> fine. <laughs> And, and, and the, no sweat. the corners are not just monitored by humans. They also have locked off cameras on a number of those for yeah. track limits. So, so there is video evidence. It's, it's not just, oh, I think it was out. It's not like Wimbledon. It's not just on the human eye. It's a good move by Mike Dyer. And that's what you need to do. You know, you, you need either to come in right deep down the inside on the straight and force him to break late and as a result run wide, and then you can undercut him, or you need to get your nose down the inside. Or it was a lesson if you're in Lewis that. Hamilton around the outside. Yeah, but it was a lesson in that, wasn't it? You don't need to physically pass the car before the apex. No. Just showing your nose, like you say, being a problem for the driver not being able to turn in and commit to the corner. Yeah. That's all it's all you need in turn one. Damage the rear of the number 88 car. They'll be saying you should have seen the other guy. Well, well, no. No doubt. That's because of Mike Wainwright hitting yeah, him absolutely. from behind, wasn't it, a dozen laps ago or so. So they're carrying that little bit of damage and they will fix it in the pit stop. This fight continues. Westbrook has the 94 Peugeot in his sights of Nico Muller. This is a great little scrap, isn't He's it? Catching. Uh, Hand over fist now at this stage in the race. This is brilliant stuff. The Cadillac, once again, really kind on its tyres. None of the hypercars have pitted yet. So all the LMP2s. And we have had a GTE AM yeah. pit stop. Miguel Pedro Ramos. I wonder if that was 
He's had a number of track infringements. I don't think it was a penalty, so he may just have stopped earlier. And that worked out brilliantly there for Richard Westbrook. He overtook the two back markers on the straight. The Peugeot, meanwhile, got held up big time in the final corner. Yeah, he'd already taken 1.6 seconds out of the Peugeot. Yeah. Um, look at look how close we are. This is not Formula E, but look how close we are to the pit window for everybody. The Peugeot two laps behind because it was st stopped in the pit, so it's got 12% energy. Uh, Sebastian Buemi has got more energy than number seven car, so he will go a lap longer, it looks like. Now, it may be that that's where they were fueled because the number seven car may have been, number eight may have uh, had the first choice of when they came in, so number seven is left with having to come in earlier. Uh, also sipping as if from a small China Cup of Earl Grey in the two <laughs> Porsches, because Ooh, they're, uh, they're well up on uh, the energy against some of the cars around them, yeah. so this is going to shake things up a bit. And again, like in Formula E, when you've got one or two percent extra energy, you've got another lap. Yes. Uh, not at Le Mans, OK? <laughs> you, need, you need more than that. You need more than a, a, a sip from a China teacup to get round a lap at Le Mans. But here, definitely, you can see Cadillac are getting ready. All the teams will be ready. All the teams will be ready three or four laps in advance, just in case. In case there's a full course yellow and you can uh, you know, use your pit stop window earlier or whatever else. Or just in case there's another incident with the car, the drivers will already be suited and booted and starting to get adrenaline pump and because when the car arrives you've got to get in there get the other guy out and get in fast well it's good to see that huddle of, of men there getting ready for the pit stop down at uh, cadillac you could just see it was a moment of right this is close between us and peugeot yep. if we come in on the same lap it's going to be down to us whether we turn that car around faster than them and again, like in Formula One, so much can be gained or lost in yeah. a pit stop that you never get on track. Yeah, Ferrari ready too for their car. Sarah Bovi now the with battle. the number 21 for, car for the lead in GTM. And still, still some minutes to go before we can expect to see the GT cars on pit lane. Now she's left Ben Keating seven seconds behind her. Looking set to take the lead here. And there's traffic faster. still to come. Way Got faster. To the inside, not quite there, Sarah. Now, we know that Ben Keating started on soft tyres. I wonder if they have given up the ghost as well, because he had to keep clean to avoid track limits and gave uh, allowed Sarah to take the place. But now she's just rocketed away and it's all over the back of the Ferrari. And she could well come into the pits as the GTE AM leader. Well, Anthony, this is close in traffic now. Sarah Bovi and the pink Porsche lost out there as the LMP2 battle came by, but she can pick up a toe here as well. Toyota in. This is the number seven car. And both Ferraris yep. in as well. OK. So it was the seven car in before car eight. That would explain why they've got less en total energy mm -hmm. compared to... Uh, the number eight car that's down to just that 1% now. Both Ferraris in. I, I want to see a secondary uh, thing, which is, you know, when your uh, uh, pump clicks over when you're at the gas station, yep. you get one that tells you how much, how many leases you got there. You've got the other one that tells you how much it's costing. I want the, I want the euros <laughs> going up underneath that as well. I'm loving this live graphic. Because, great because we can see now, while we're watching the pictures, how close the team is to full fuel, which is when you can then suddenly start to change the tyres. So Toyota are going to get there first. Now they don't... Didn't change tyres. I think it was just the left side there for Ferrari. Um, but interestingly, on the, the energy going up here, the fuel flow is monitored between different cars. You don't get the mm -hmm. same amount of fuel, necessarily, but you get the same time of that energy going into the car. Yeah. So uh, it, it's the fuel rate is, is different for the different teams. Interesting. That, OK, Toyota showing 99%. That's close enough to 100% to be maybe a slight glitch. Good turnaround from the Cadillac. Yep. Splits, the, splits the Ferraris. Oh. And where's the Peugeot? Nowhere. But was it a case of just one side of tight like the Ferrari did? Or at yep. least one of the Ferraris compared to all four on the Peugeot. 88 Porsche being told to respect blue flags. That's Ryan Hardwick in a Proton competition car that's got the sort of quasi uh, Felbermeyer colours on it. 
Uh, out comes the number six Porsche as the race leader, Sebastian Buemi, is in for service. Now, again, let's take a look at what tyres he does or does not take. You do not have enough tyres in Hypercar or LMP2 to change all four at each pit stop. You are tyre limited. In GTE Am, you do have enough for a full set at each pit stop. Double stinting these tyres is the Cadillac. No tyre change at all. That's, that explains their uh, excellent pit stop. Oh, and a massive oh. lock-up, though. That's really going to hurt. If they didn't Boy. change those tyres... Let's watch from on board. It's very low speed. Well, it's not very low speed, but... Oh, that could have hurt. Close. Could have hurt a lot more, couldn't it? But pressurising the second, and he's looking to go by the other Ferrari, and does so. Well, that's because he's, he's still got hot tyres on. Tires. Of course he does. And th that's a whole new strategy deal that we've never had before because the guy on new tyres, they'd be hot, he'd have a much better chance of holding you off. Whereas the guy on old tyres now, you can make up track position from the pit lane and then try and hold on at the end of your stint. The Toyotas are right back together, Buemi right ahead of Conway, who took tyres. Oh, I'll tell you what, the dynamics here as we get towards the end of the first hour, uh, one hour in the books, there's dynamic between the two uh, Toyota drivers, as you can see right now, there certainly is, and uh, audibly so between the two Ferrari guys, and Cadillac now in the mix, great and, stuff. And I tell you what, this is going to fry our brains at Le Mans, trying to keep in track with, well, how's he just got by him? Oh, he didn't change tyres. No, that doesn't make sense. Yes, it does, and, and yeah, yep. especially at night. Oh, it took... OK. No. Uh, Paul Dallalana reported to the stewards, so the first driver who will receive a penalty for track limits excursions, Paul Dallalana in the Northwest AMR, the 98 car that is down in 12th in the GTM field. Yeah, GTM's actually uh, going through their pit stop cycle. Yes. So are both eight, uh, uh, pits from the lead. And Ben Keating is in as well. Let's hear from the caddy team of Richard Westbrook. This tyre's not going to make it. It's fucked. Yeah. Excuse for the uh, the language there, if anyone heard that from Richard Westbrook. But, uh, yeah, I think it was that, that moment we saw in the pit lane entry locked up those tyres, and he's going to need to come in. That is a terrible situation now he, for Cadillac now. He's saying the tyre's not going to make it. What he means is... When you flat spot a racing tyre, instead of it being now a, a perfect circle, you, the track basically shaves a lot of the stationary tyre away at the bottom, and so there's a flat spot. But that also means that the tread is thinner. The, the actual... It's not tread, but the actual running part of the tyre yeah. is thinner. And what he's saying is, it's vibrating so much, he can already feel that this thing is about to blow. So now it's down to the team to either go, keep going and let's just hope, or we're going to have to bring you in immediately or very nearly immediately to change tyres and then give up much hope of holding off the Ferraris. Well, there you go. And the other thing that happens, Anthony, try and explain what, what we mean by the flat spot keeps finding itself again under braking. Well, you've effectively turned a, a circle into more like a, a 50p piece or a, a hexagonal tyre. So it keeps picking up that same flat spot and it locks up on that. It, it keeps finding it and you make it worse and worse and flatter and flatter. But now he's in real trouble here. The Ferrari drivers got their tyres up to temperature and they can just place the car wherever they want and both passed him, so right. disaster So if story. you're on the pit wall, even now, as that first pass is being made, box this lap. Box this lap. Let the... I think you've just got to take it as far as you can, no, but the... you're just hemorrhaging lap time right yeah, now. So the battle's lost. You've just got to take, bite the bullet now and leave yourself as much time to recover as you can. Migration minus one, migration minus one, and nurse the tyre as much as you can. Critical for strategy, but keep us updated. Okay, That's yeah. what I mean, that you've just got to nurse it, you've, you've committed, you've kept that tyre on, you've done your pit stop. It's effectively, you've given yourself a, a, a stop and go penalty yeah. by coming in and changing tyres. So you've got to try and manage it the best you can, and yes, it's uncomfortable, you, you, it blurs your vision, your whole body vibrates, it's awful, it's an awful experience, but Westbrook is a very experienced driver, and uh, he's, he's been in this position many times before in his career, I'm sure. Just got to stick with it.
Portimao, Portugal, race two of the FIA World Endurance Championship. Beautiful sunshine for locals and visitors alike with a lot of the major manufacturer team bosses here for this second ever hypercar race in the World Endurance Championship, joined by the FIA's new CEO. Drama before the start with a power steering issue for the 93 Peugeot. They rejoined two laps behind. Toyota locking out the front row, but Ferrari again aggressive at the start. The 94 Peugeot getting nudged out from behind, but the Ferrari moving up into second place. Right from the start, Ferrari and Porsche trying to take the battle to the Toyotas. Little contact from behind for the Peugeot from this number five Porsche. Peugeot ran out wide, Caddy followed. No penalties incurred for those first lap inclusions, but trouble behind. Vector got hit by United, that's why they dropped by, and into Europol also dropped back. Ben Keating leading at the front of GTE as Ferrari's battled behind, and contact there as well. Not a great clean start from the GTE field, it has to be said. The onboard view from the uh, GR Porsche looking to try and avoid any dramas. Number eight Toyota quickly finding a way by the better of the two Ferraris to make it a Toyota 1-2, just a couple of laps in. And then the Ferrari Porsche sandwich was evened out as the number 50 Ferrari moved up Nick Nielsen ahead of the Porsche. In LMP2, the United Autosports number 22 car started to work its way up the order. And then Cadillac Porsche battling in the middle of the hypercar pack. Penske Porsche winning their first race in Long Beach overnight. Trouble for the 88 Porsche after getting clipped by Mike Wainwright. Ryan Hardwick knocked into a spin. Diane Pan started on pole in the 63 Prema car. And United moved up to make it 1-2 before the first round of pit stops. With Antonio Felix da Costa coming in last for Hertz Team Jota. But it is Premier's Dorian Pan that leads in the battle for GTE Am. Sorobovi finally getting by Ben Keating as he ran out of track limits jokers and had to play it very clean. And in the battle for supremacy, it was the number seven Toyota out front almost all the way to the pit stops before the team eased the number eight in front and it is still the number eight Toyota that leads here in Portimao. So back to live and this race still well like 41 laps are under the in the books already for the leading number eight Toyota 0.8 of a second ahead of the sister seven 30 seconds 29 seconds are on the Porsche which emerges in third place then the two Ferraris 50 leads 51 Leading LMP2, it is the number 23 United Autosports car of Guy de van der Gaard, uh, in eighth position overall and ahead of the couple of the hypercars. Then the Prima car, number 63, and 48 Hertz Team Jota, the winners from Sebring. Uh, the second United rounds out the top four, but it's the battle in GTE Am, and again, that's reversed. It's AF Corsa lead, is back into the lead, uh, back in the second rather, for Ben Keating in the 33 Corvette, and the 85. Uh, Iron Dames car Sara Bovi uh, has dropped in back back in behind the Corvette and uh, I I think that uh, Ben Keating's can be very happy indeed of a different tyre on that C8R. Yeah, it looked like it was just using it a bit more than that of the uh, the Porsche behind with Bovi at the wheel, but um, yeah, that's an interesting fight now, isn't it? A, a different uh, a different dynamic to what we first thought. So the Corvette's clearly got uh, well, it had a brilliant pit stop for one, but um, the car's performing much better on its fresher tyres than it does relatively to the Porsche on its older tyres. So, I mean, Bovi looks like she's got the, uh, the bit between her teeth again and is putting the pressure on uh, Ben Keating, so uh, she's got to do that work all again. It took so long, pretty yeah, it, much. It did. Almost a whole stint to get past. We were saying about a, a brilliant in the pit lane, brilliant as well, May of course. A 1 minute 22 for the 21 car to retake the leaders. Here come the two Toyotas in amongst the battling GT cars. It was 1 minute 25 for Corvette, 1 minute 34 for the Iron Dames. So they dropped 10 seconds in that pit stop. Yeah, so both Toyotas uh, hindered their performance through the final couple of corners on the track is 
Conway going to get the Corvette before 15? No, so that's going to lose him a lot of ground there in respect to what Bohemia was able to do. And yeah, you lose that momentum onto the main straight. It didn't seem to lose out for the Corvette with Keating at the wheel. So um, yeah, that fight's going to continue on. Now looking at the uh, LMP2 battle here, got one of the Jota cars ahead of the United. And meanwhile, another drive-through penalty being handed to the car guys, Ferrari, of Takeshi Kimura. Again, he's run out of luck, exceeding track limits. Well, second penalty, of course, for that car, that driver. Not, but not a penalty yet, but reported to the stewards. Inevitably, it will be, though. Yep. Already had that five-second penalty added to its first pit stop for the contact with uh, the Toyota Mifuchi-driven 777 car. And those two are back together on track again. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> No fireworks at all. Antonio no. Felix da Costa then came in from the lead, but only in third place in LMP2. United lead, Prema in second. So Gerard van der Gaard in amongst the hypercars. He's up to ninth overall. Dorian Pan in second place, and Antonio Felix da Costa trying to hang on to third spot. Let's hear from Caddy's Richard Westbrook. Fire is critical. Fire is critical. Copy. I didn't actually get what he said. Tire is something. Hit. Yeah, useful or beautiful, I don't think Tire is critical. Tire yeah, is critical. Could, could well be. OK. Yeah. Which means his eyes are being rolled around in their sockets by the vibration in the car. It's not a pleasant thing. It's like driving over a cattle grid for endless, endless laps. So, 98, team manager being asked to report to that's, the race director. So that's Northwest West AMR. Stage. Paul Dallalana yep. has been handed a, a penalty, hasn't he? Or been no, no, that's the one, the one uh, yeah. reported for. He had he's, a drive well, he's through. He's done a drive through, so he's obviously continuing to exceed track limits. He did. I saw the. I saw another warning come yeah. up after his drive through. So the message has to go in at some point. Sarah Bobi putting massive pressure on the back end of that Corvette now. And don't forget Ben Keating, if he exceeds track limits again in this entire stint, or for the rest of the race, if he goes in for a third stint at any stage for any reason, he will, if he exceeds track limits, he will also incur a drive-through penalty. And remember, you've had a drive-through penalty. It's not another drive-through penalty. It's then a stop and hold, if I'm right. Yes, after your first one, and then it gets longer. Yeah. Because clearly you're not learning the lesson. Keating Sorry, goes in deep there, very deep, and uh, didn't meet the apex of Turn 5. That's given Bovey a good run up the hill towards Turn 7, but it's not a normal overtaking part of the track, so she's going to have to be patient here. See if she can line that Porsche up on the exit, nice and square, get maximum traction. Get into the slipstream of the Corvette through Turn 9 now, up the hill towards Turn 10, but we go to, on board to the Ferrari. Got the Porsche in front of us. Yeah, so this is the car of Nick Nielsen chasing Lawrence Vantor. Vantor in third place in that red and white Porsche. The other one with a similar livery, but with black stripes rather than white stripes. So it looks more like a solid color. And down the inside of the Jota car he comes, who tries to stay out of the way but needs to make apexes. Because they've got their own battle trying to stay ahead of the United car behind. That's Antonio Felix da Costa. Ooh, at 13. Again, minimum speed of the LMP2 and the GT cars is no worse at all than the hypercars, Anthony. No, definitely not. And you can see that Felix da Costa all over the back end of that Porsche through 13 and 14. And that's what caught Nielsen out. Now on the exit of the final corner, he's going to have the rug. The hypercar much faster in a straight line should clearly get the move done before that corner yet yeah, tucks back into the racing line. But <laughs> yeah. that was a bit too close for comfort I for think, Nielsen in 13. I think Felix de Costa was just enjoying a little bit too much the, uh, the form of the car that he's going to be piloting next time out. <laughs> <as well>. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, <laughs> big lock up, and that's going to be enough, is it, for the Ferrari? No, no, because no, the, the, the GR Porsche was in the way. So the car, the, comes, the, the Porsche fell over. Here comes Antonio Felix da Costa and again. James Collado picking up a toe off the LMP2 car. Don't forget, Collado was rankled by the team having Cross. to give the position Cross. away to Nick Nielsen. Uh, there was probably a, a little degree of effing and jeffing on the radio that we didn't hear. Uh, well, the, um, net result, so. the net result, by the way, uh, when we saw that switch take place between the two Ferraris, we've watched this again. So he went in too deep into three, then, got back on that. The, the key point was he cleared the Porsche. He cleared the Porsche. The Porsche then moved to avoid a potential impact with the 963, but that bought the Ferrari. 
Here we go, this will be interesting because now the Porsche's bulked behind the Aston through 12, but he gets the move done into 13. So you can test around this track like Porsche and Ferrari have done multiple times. You can do a million laps around this place. It's one of the circuits that you have the luxury. You can do a 36 hour endurance test through the night, but you don't have the traffic. Yeah. And that's what these drivers Absolutely are now right. experiencing. Some of them for the first ever time coming out from the GTs into the hypercars. And they're realizing where you can oh. and where you can't overtake. Speaking of overtaking, yeah. the Bobby gets it done. And also, by the way, right in the mix here is a second female driver. Lili Wadu is right here behind. Uh, ben Keating, and oh, looking yeah. to grab third place. Lilo did not get an opportunity to race at Sebring for the early uh, incident that affected Lewis Perez' comeback, but uh, she's now beginning to show form. Of course, the that, was the, that was the Ferrari. It you was. see the move here down the inside, a brilliant move there. He just stayed on the brakes deep enough before she's going to back out of it there. Yeah, that was a, a great move in the end, but that was the car, obviously, that flipped over yes. at Sebring, wasn't it? Black yeah. and orange flag for the Toyota. Yeah, so number seven Toyota, Mike Conway, has been warned about uh, to uh, some, something that the stewards have spotted on the car. Louise telling us that the 777 D-Station Aston is in the garage. Proton's Ryan Hardwick is also in the pit lane. How long has he been in there? It just, just came in, just, about came like in. just okay. last lap, sorry. So Vector Sport have rejoined the track, we're hearing, or just left the garage at any rate. So that is good news. And they head out of the pit lane. So they're back in the race. And that is Nico Muller having found his way by. Smiles down at the, uh, the Peugeot garage, found his way past uh, Richard Westbrook. Yep. But again, See, I, the, prob the problem is you would want to come in and change the tyres on the Cadillac to stop losing time, but that means that then you're in a tyre hole because you've used too many sets. Louise Beckett, what have you got in the pits for us? I am at Cadillac and Earl Bamba is all set to go. There's a set of tyres ready. The team are waiting for the car to come in. OK, thanks, Lou. I mean, the other option, Anthony, would be only to change the front and to use half a set, which means that you could do left sides only or, or rears only or something at a later stage rather than a full four tyre set. Yeah, I mean, you can chop and change them. Uh, you can even put different compounds front to rear yeah. on these cars as well in hypercar. So they have that flexibility. But like we're seeing the Jota, maybe with Felix da Costa saving a lot of fuel to save a splash towards the end of the race, potentially, you might be able to just get to that point in the race for Cadillac where you can tweak the strategy just a little bit, try something different. It's, it was obviously too early to come in now, but if you can just shorten this stint a little bit, then you might still be able to make it work through to the end of the race. But certainly, they missed their moment as soon as they committed to going back out there mm. on that flat spotted set of tyres. Yeah. So yeah. here's the Ferrari now of Nielsen down the inside of the Porsche number six into this is turn for a podium 11. spot at the moment. Up to third place goes Nick Nielsen. Good move. And we still don't know what is attracting the attention of the stewards on the number seven Toyota. So all sorts of dramas in all sorts of classes right now, aren't there? We wait to find out what exactly is going on with the seven. The triple seven in the garage. 57 is on pit road for, I think, a second penalty. Drive through, yeah. Yeah. And there is Dorian Pan. She brought the car in for Prema. Uh, that's that's the 41. That uh, was well, the Dorian Pan has been in, so uh, oh. she has been. Yeah, so 41 is in as well. And Both Alpines. Both so. Alpines on pit lane as well. There is the 41 just ahead of one of the United cars. That is the leading car. Gide van der Gerda has completed his stint. Phil Hansen gets into car 23. He's the driver that qualified that car. And had the penalty as well, didn't he, in qualifying for impeding another car? I have the mechanical warning for my dash, the, uh, the back one. Stand by, stand by, Mike. Had a weird power through uh, the lever. Uh, the engine's really low power, though. The river off. That doesn't sound like a hybrid problem, that sounds more ICE problem. The engine's got no power. Through turn 11, turn 11's quite quick, but even so, that it, it doesn't sound like he was referring to hybrid there. They've had hybrid issues with the cars uh, before uh, now, but... I, could, I couldn't hear that. Was he referring to a problem, or was he referring to what he's seeing in the car from WEC? The two things. So he's seen... It's strange that he's the one informing the team that he's got the black and orange flag, so yes. i.e. a mechanical failure flag. 
uh, which means you have to pit and sort the problem out. Uh, so he's seen that before the team that we saw it on our screen. Yes. Yeah. He's reporting it to the team, which is very bizarre. I've never heard it that way around no. before. Uh, but then he's gone on to say, and also, the power feels strange. I'm definitely down on power. Is he leaking something? Well, I mean, the only thing that you'd see with the naked eye is something loose or something leaking. Well, the only other uh, explanation if you see... Oh, oh that was... Oh, 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 oh. 21 Ferrari there, the uh, GTE AM leader, Diego Alessi, with mirrors full of hypercars. Let's hear a little bit more from the Toyota team, see if we can get to the bottom of this. OK, Mike, we have to stop. We have to change the drive shaft. So box this lap, box, box. OK. Drive shaft. Now, possibly uh, a front axle drive I, shaft. I wonder if what's happened here, remember, these cars have got all sorts of monitoring systems, including torque sensors on each of the axles. Have the... Is that the FIA bus have I, seen a I wonder if they've seen yeah. that something's gone on with one of those sensors. I think that's, I think that's entirely possible. And now... It could be now, a failed torque sensor. Toyota have come, done a deep dive and they're saying, I think we need to check, well, no, because they'll have doubled up on the, on, they'll have a, a, you know, a redundant set. But uh, it sounds like Toyota have done a deep dive in the data and gone, OK, we need to change the drive shaft. Now, if it was a rear drive shaft driven by 700 horsepower of, of internal combustion engine, you'd know about it without any doubt. Let's hear what else they've got to say. Sorry, mate, it's from FIA. It's mandatory. We have to stop and change drive shaft. So box this up. There you go, Graham Goodwin right. on the money. Absolutely right. Why do we have to stop? Well, apart from the fact you're not going very fast or as fast as you want to, and then the car feels flat, you actually have to. So they've either seen that something's in excess of what it should be, or they can't read the car. It's yeah. one of those two things that's caused it. Yeah. Whatever, that is victory or any hope of it gone for the number seven Toyota as the car is wheeled back in. And, and as always, Anthony, and you've been in this team and you've been in the Peugeot factory team, when you have got identical cars and there's a chance you're going to win, almost inevitably, it is one small either driver error or mechanical frailty in the car that makes the difference because the driver lineups are so close and the cars are so identical it's something that takes it away from you yeah i mean i often said that something always happens in an endurance race which means that it takes it away from your hands the drivers give or take a couple of tenths a lap here and there that's all you're going to find over another driver at this level um, sometimes the car might have a bad setup compared to your teammates mm. and you lose the race because of that. But more often than not, I found that something like this would always come your way or your teammates way. And that decided the race between the yeah. two teammates. Yeah. But yeah, a bitter blow for car tough. seven. Yeah. Re really tough because they're the championship leaders at the moment. So the number eight car, Toyota now have one bullet in the gun and there are three podium positions. Now, in terms of outright pace and potentially longevity of tyres and so on, Toyota don't have an issue. However, Toyota do have an issue because if one car goes wrong and the cars are identical, it is entirely possible that the other car could suffer the same problem. It doesn't usually happen when it's something, you know, way out of the normality range, but it's a possibility. We heard that message from Conway's engineer early on in the race, didn't we, saying avoid curb in turn nine, as yes. we've seen the, the pass there for uh, car 51 getting ahead of the, so uh, this the is Porsche. Looking, looking so good Ferrari, Ferrari now, all of a second and third. But yeah, I, we heard turn nine, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Avoid yes. curbs in turn yes. nine, the high-speed left-hander yeah. before the track rises up the hill. And there is a curb on the inside there. Could that have been putting could be. excess could be. force? Because the message possible. came to the driver. Yeah. yeah, so maybe the FIA was saying we're seeing extreme things here. Cadillac in. Now, will it be a driver change? Will Richard uh, Westbrook Earl stay in? Uh, Earl Bamber was ready, wasn't he? Well, Louise Beckett, as ever, right in the thick of the action. She's the Toyota Gazoo Racing. We'll hear from their team manager, Rob Loipen. Rob Loipen, we can see the cars in, the team are working on it. Can you explain this situation to us? Well, we are requested by the FIA to uh, bring our drive shafts data together. So there is an issue apparently 
and uh, yeah, we have to repair it. That's why the car came in. There is no issue with performance or technically, so this is, uh, yeah, comply with the regulations. That's it. We'll fight. Uh, if we look at the positive side, it's a good training for uh, upcoming races, but on the other side, uh, yeah, you would like to get to So explain exactly what you do have to change then. We are changing our rear left corner uh, in order to get uh, the data management and uh, the telemetry which is required uh, for the FIA uh, back, in, uh, back in place again. Okay, thank you. Thank you Sometimes you hate well. being right. Uh, genuinely, I mean, yeah. it's that's that's awful luck for them. And look what's involved. It's not just the suspension. It's not just the drive well, shaft. It's not just the brakes. It's all of the yeah. electronics. I was just going to say, if we'd, have kept, if we'd have kept that shot, you'd have seen the tiny little unit, which is the torque center on the on the rear axle there. I, I, I think that's exactly it. They can't read the car. If you can't read the car, you can't be sure that it's compliant, and that is part of the regulation. Yeah. yeah. It's it's. So there are four windows of performance that these hypercars have to meet. It's the power. That's the, that's the critical one we're talking about now. Yeah. It's the weight of the car, it's the downforce that the car can produce, and it's the drag of the car. Correct. If you, if you stay consistently within those, I mean, the, oh, you can't change the bodywork. That's yeah. that's homologated, yeah. so that's easy to see. Yeah. Uh, and they get they get scrutinized before and after every race and qualifying session. So this this is the power. Now you can't see the power unless it's got no. telemetry coming your way. If a sensor were to fail. You can't see it anymore. The team can't see it. That's no big drama for them. But the FIA not being able to see it, well, you could be running the car overpowered at that point. Uh, and by the way, we've just found the one area that we can tell you that there is a disadvantage to the LOH part of the hypercar formula, which is they've got four corners that that could affect, not two. Well, exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, you're not boosting on top of your power. No, no, in, you're in not. In hypercar no. as well. So you are it's, carrying around. It's that cumulative, um, you know, power output that needs to be measured at all points. That's the rule set. Now, much as you could see and hear from Rob, the frustration there, he understands why. He gets it. It, it, it's like it's like this it's like not seeing the weight of the car at the end of the race yeah absolutely and, and right. it's only your car that can't be weighed at the end of a race for some reason bizarre reason every day is school there, here, isn't it? yeah, yeah. It's, but it's, this is yet another aspect of this astonishing sport that we've got to get our heads around is that this is it's an important part of the formula this is why um, we've got just so many different organizations coming forward and putting their hands up and saying, yes, we'd like to be part of that. The, the, the way in which was, I think, most brilliantly described to, to us uh, last season is the difference between the formula that came before, the LMP1 formula, and we're keeping an eye on what's going on here. That was effectively quite an open technical book, but a very closed geometric book. You had to put yeah. the car within a box. And what you just brilliantly said there is there's those four values. You meet the defined values, the power, the drag, um, the downforce, and completely forgot the fourth Wait. one. Wait, well, it's hard to remember yes. those four. Yeah. That? And if you've, if you've met those, build what you like. Yeah. And exactly. that's why we see such different looking uh, solutions in the hypercar formula. Growing pains here, let's hope. Uh, but that's tragic stuff from uh, Toyota Kazoo Racing. They are still, by the way, uh, in the garage. Drop down now below all of the LMP2 cars. So the top 10 cars are all hypercars now with the number 93 Peugeot having made its way back up through the P2 cars. The uh, P11 in hypercar is the number seven Toyota, which was running untroubled in second place, but because of a failure, it seems, in the monitoring system required by the regulations, have got to change that axle. Really that strange that the driver detected a power difference as well. And I, I, I wonder if the two things were combined. Possible. Maybe the team couldn't actually see that power difference because they too had lost the uh, the torque sensor that goes on the, the, the rear drive shafts. Yeah, I mean, uh, by the way, it's, a, it's an opportune moment the ladies. Hot stuff uh, down there at Prema. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, to, to remind people that there is drama at the pit carriage we're not seeing at the moment, mm. but you can see that, I'm sure, in about 10 days. April the 25th, the uh, next edition of the WC Full Access program will be uh, online on YouTube, and that's that long form, near hour long uh, program now. 
uh, got some really good uh, responses. It's what the fans asked for, it's what they're now going to get, and I'm sure you'll see the dramas at Toto in that one. Change of position there on track. Richard Westbrook with a full set of tyres on now, stays in the car, so they sort of had a half stint because of that flat spot coming at the end of his first stint, which destroyed his right front corner. He had been passed by Tom Dillman in that duotone green that Floyd Van Orl machine, but he is now just retaking the place. So moves back up to eighth position. So their problems are less severe than that of the number seven Toyota team. But for Cadillac, uh, you know, they were in there swinging with Ferrari and well, certainly with the Porsche team. And uh, that has just been a setback. And in fact, it could have been a much worse setback because Richard Westbrook just avoided running hard into the back of the 94 Peugeot, and that would have been a much more severe penalty. Uh, just a quick note as well, that at this period of the race, the uh, the two Ferraris are hauling. They're both in the, the, the mid and low 34s, just seeing Seb Boemi respond to that and dip under 135. But what was a near 40 second gap is now down under 35 seconds. So they're seeing the opportunity with the chink in the armor at Toto to put them under pressure and are responding to that. So 35 seconds is the gap now between Seb Boemi and the lead car, the number eight Toyota, and the number 50 Ferrari, and that's of Nick Nielsen. With uh, James Glado five and a half seconds back from his teammate and his 50 car. Yeah, no matter how much you might shout about not being slower than the 50 car, I'm afraid that has been how it's turned out. Nick Nico Muller, we're just watching him from on board in traffic. By the way, if you are watching at home and enjoying the view of the entire race, Ferrari have a YouTube channel set up with live onboard of each of their cars. So if you want to have a, a second screen going, yeah. see, if it's not held together by tape, is it actually held together properly at all? It's race tape, isn't it? It's, uh, it does everything. All you need now no, is no, that. That's, that's proper athlete tape. That's not just a, a random no. bit of gaffer. That will hurt even more when but they peel it for off. For the purpose of the joke, <laughs> stick with it. <laughs> OK. Now <laughs> then, for a quick here it comes. Six laps lost for the number seven Toyota Gazoo racing car, and no longer because of the uh, paucity of entries over the last couple of seasons in hypercar, do they have a chance of a podium finish? Because there's far too many cars still going. <laughs> it's going to take some sort of nuclear holocaust to, uh, to get this car back up into the podium. And in fact, right now, it's not even going to be in the points. Yeah. Now, <laughs> apart from a car that stopped dead and didn't finish a race... Yeah. Tell me another time that's happened in the hypercar era of Toyota. I don't think it has. Well, it hasn't because there's never been more than 10 cars. Well, it's it's real drama, and it's going to be interesting to see now what exactly happens. It's Pichito Lopez brings the car out. The car has been on pit lane for 11 minutes and 18 seconds. You'd love to change your drive shaft as quick as that, wouldn't you, in your road car? I'd love to not have to. It's, <laughs> it's the entire <laughs> corner of the car. Most people will struggle to get their wheel off in 11 minutes and uh, put it back on again, never mind anything else. Also, by the way, on an outlap after six... 16 minutes on Ooh, the pit lane. Into this Europol versus Prema. That's a change for sixth position in LMP2. Both run out into a different county. And you were saying, um, uh, to us trackside, how tough it is to spot that apex there. That's an edgy place to make that pass. Well, they're left hand drive, you know, the, the LMP2 cars. And uh, it means that the A pillar on the left side is very, very close and it, 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 it obscures the vision gets in the way of the corner apex, so you never actually see that yellow curb of turn five the entire race. Car number eight leading in Portimao for Toyota Gazoo Racing. We're 90 minutes, 93 minutes into the race. Ferrari in second and third. Porsche battling with Peugeot for fourth place ahead of the Glickenhaus, the delayed Cadillac, the Floyd Van Orl machine, and the 93 Peugeot that started two laps down from the pit lane. The number seven Toyota, six laps down and now back out on track as D Station returned to the garage for a second time. After only a lap back out there, 16 minutes uh, in the pits, uh, then back out and then straight back in with Tomino Bufucci. Haven't heard much, but the bonnet was up, which suggests to me overheating problems or uh, some other major engine problem. Remember that car had was turned around yep. uh, in turn one after the, the, uh, the tussle with the number 57 car. Back out, we said, Vector Sport, that uh, the team believed that might well have been fly, uh, the, uh, the fly-by-wire throttle yep. on that car. Um, the 86 car, the other car that's had the delay after the bodywork damage, after the clash between the 86 and the 88. So um, 
36 of the 37 cars are currently running. Well, that, that is my rule of thumb. If it's not upside down, on fire or missing bits, it's electronics. And that's, uh, ladies and gentlemen, from the owner of a Morris Minor. <laughs> <laughs> Which doesn't have any electronics. <laughs> Barely has any electrics, I shall think. No, two fuses, <laughs> both of which are redundant. <laughs> Oh dear, the LMP2 uh, battle going on here. The, the drivers, uh, oh, is a mix between the silvers, the bronze drivers, and the, the platinum and golds. And, but Fabio Scherer, is, uh, he's a gold driver. He's the one we saw make that impressive pass down at uh, turn five against the Prema racing car. And uh, yeah, he's just done his personal best middle sector. So he's, he's been fast all weekend. Here he is actually, number 34. He's been fast all weekend. And in fact, Shira. closing in from behind, you can see Charles Milesi in the blue Senior Tech car. Uh, so again, Senior Tech running with their hypercar last year. They will be back with an Alpine hypercar next season as well. So they're treading water while developing that. And he is closing in on Philippe Urgan, again, a gold rated driver. Uh, Romanian, isn't he, Philippe? Yeah. It's uh, another. Great Another see. flag they've had to find to get out in the, in the, in the parade of nations, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good stuff. And, and LMP2 beginning to shape up. And remember, with that Pro-Am formula that sits here, the variety of uh, mixes of driving uh, ratings that you require from LMP2 team, you're going to see ebb and flow in that, uh, in that class, and the same as you are with GTM. And yet, United, who we barely even mentioned in most of free practice and certainly not at all in qualifying, have shuffled their way back to the front again with Premer in third and, and Jota in fourth ahead of WRT. But that's because they've only now put in their two silver drivers, Josh Pearson and Fred, uh, Frederick Lubin yeah. uh, aboard. Danny Kvyat named this week as um, one of the drivers that will be joining the Lamborghini hypercar and GTP programme from 2024 uh, is the, the, the man tasked with trying to close down the advantage of the two United cars. Well, from 2024, we could have Lamborghinis at both ends of the field because we could, we're going to have we a high very well. program. And of course, Lamborghini have a very strong thriving GT3 program. They so, most certainly do. Uh, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see the horse trading that goes on towards the end of the season because for every current brand that has a GT3 product, there are maybe half a dozen to a dozen teams that are running them, none of whom obviously would love to win oh, them no. on. No, 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 that, that, no. It's going to be said increasingly that is now the conversation down in the paddock in the, the shadowy areas next to trucks about who's doing what. It's about what's going to happen in GT. Great battle here in DJ Am. Uh, Am. Yeah, great battle going on. You can see from the onboard shot, the Aston, though, the marbles picking up more and more. It, it's really common here. Oh, warning flag just popped up on for car two. Westbrook for yep. abusing track limits, so he's on his final joker. Abusing the limits and the tyres. Mind you, he's, he's although he is half a stint down, he's actually got a full stint to do, so he's going to have to be careful. Ricardo Perra at the back of this little queue in the GR Porsche, the black and orange car. Still, have we seen a penalty for Mike Wainwright? Did they serve a penalty for, for that contact with... Uh, they have had... With 88? Just, they've had two pit stops. Uh, okay. So... Yeah. I think they have then had a penalty. I suspect that Mike has served his driver time. Yeah. ORT by TF, Oman Racing Team, run by TF Sport, Tom Ferrier's team. And Another the 54 car behind. Well, the 54 and the 25, that is a battle for position yep. between Michael Dynan in the Aston Martin, Francesco Castellacci, famously the most Italian name in the world. Um, uh, they are battling away for fifth position. The 86 car is looking to try to get by, and it's uh, Castellacci looking for an opportunity. Yeah, through the traffic as the LMP2 is working their way through and the hypercar of the Peugeot. Oh, and he's gone oh, off he's there gone. too wide in turn 13 and allows, oh, well, he's lost two positions there yeah. as the Aston. Well, lost one track, uh, one, uh, two track positions, uh, one in the race because uh, Perra has just unlapped himself from Michael Darren. And remember, this is the car that suffered bodywork damage in the brush with the 88 car earlier in the race and is on lap down. Dynan also now being warned about track limits, <laughs> so he's on his final warning, but he is getting towards the end of his stint. It, it's a double stint for Michael Dynan in this car. 
Uh, or is it? Did Amada Harty start it? I'm going to have to check the starting drivers list. I had a I had a feeling we talked about Michael no, I think, early I think on. Michael did start. I the think car. he did start it. So uh, most of the uh, bronze drivers in the class have gone for a double stint, and ORT was started by Michael Dynan. So yeah, he's coming towards. Well, maybe another 20 minutes of the stint left, actually, because they'll be close on the second hour of the race by the time they change. So, as we're watching the number four car up the inside of the 86 and look to try, but it might even be overtaken with the, by the again, it almost was by the 911 uh, with that great traction up the hill from turn five. So, finally, got the four and a half litres of Gibson ponies under so control. Here's that moment in uh, turn 11. Number 54, Ferrari thought it could uh, have an opportunity because the Persia had just gone by United then in LMP2, slipping around the outside, then on the inside. They think that's what put the Aston off yeah. in 13. And he was well off early there. Yeah. That was nowhere near getting to the apex. I think Mike Dynan just drifted out wide and, uh, and that was his final track limits excursion as and well. And you're asking a lot from amateur drivers in that situation to not make contact with the, the cars you know, it's a tough call, isn't it? Racing their way through. It's a tough call. Yeah, do you risk the hard. contact or do you risk the drive-through? Josh Pearson leading in LMP2 is United Autosport 1-2. Josh Pearson, Frederick Lubin 1-2. Danny Kvyat third for Premier in the 63 car. And David Beckman for Jota in 48 now, ahead of Robin Freins and Fabio Scherer ahead of Philip Urgan. Shah Malesi closing in on Urgan in the number nine Premier car. Malesi behind in the Alpine. Yeah, David Beckman uh, subbing in, if you like, for Hertz Team Jota for these first two races because of the require a silver driver in LMP2. So a right driver in LMP2 as they cycled uh, Will Stevens in for Sebring and out for this race. Will is here uh, and supporting the team this weekend uh, and is replaced in the car, of course, by Antonio Felix da Costa. But Beckman was very impressive at Sebring. Yeah. And quick again here now, he's uh, battling away with Danny Kvyat and Robin Trines. Well, like, the... we were, like we were saying before, though, you know, you're, the, the pro drivers give or take a tenth or two yes. here, you know, around different tracks, different situations with car balance, blah, blah, blah. But the biggest differentiator is your is the is the lowest denominator of your team the silver driver in LMP2 you're only as good as the weakest link absolutely in, in, in LMP2 and I think David Beckman did a brilliant job for Jota in, in Sebring um, as did Josh Pearson uh, until, until unfortunately the car broke down and uh, we all know the reason why behind that one but um, yeah you're only ever as good as your silver driver uh, I, I've not noticed, and apologies if, uh, gentlemen, you've mentioned it, and I've not, noti uh, I've not noted that you've mentioned it. Lilo Wadu not only threw into second in uh, GTM, but has pulled away and pulled away very substantially from Sarah Bovi and Ben Keating. The gap uh, to the lead of Diego Alessi is two and a half seconds, so it's the two AF Corsa run cars, the 21 and the 83. The 83 runs as Richard Mille of Corsa. Uh, Lilo Wadu, in her first stint in the WC in the GTM class, uh, has taken out 13 and a half seconds of a bovey and a further six and a half of a Ben Keating. And there is Ben Keating ahead of David Beckman, but actually Ben Keating's not too much further ahead. Only eight seconds ahead of Francesco Castellacci in the 54 AF Corsa car, the one that we just saw in that sort of big battle with Michael Dynan. So now Castellacci's free of Dynan, he's going to start to close. Ben Keating suggested that in qualifying, he thought Ferrari definitely should have the pace to go one, two, three, and it was those three cars that he nominated, the 54, the 21, and the 83. But actually, it looks like in race pace as well here, the Ferrari is just working better for some reason than the Porsche or the, As uh, the Aston Martin. That was last year, you idiot, or the Corvette. <laughs> No, it was great riding on board with, there with David Beckman. You know, you see how the driver has to work their way through the, the GT cars and, and compromise the line into turn five because you're on the inside suddenly you're on the marbles. And again, yeah, you can see them building up through that final corner. Now, so the hypercars and the LMP2 cars could overtake around the outside of that corner before quite comfortably. Now it's a no-no. You, you absolutely can't go there. If you dare venture out that far, you pick up those marbles and you're off the track before you know it. Lila Wadu is absolutely herring up to the rear end of the lead car here. Diego Letzi doesn't appear to have an answer to the pace of the 83 car at the moment. 
Well, there is the long-time race leader with the yellow highlights, Lila Wadu coming in with the white nose band, and the blinkers on. Here comes the Porsche, Porsche Peugeot down the inside. And again, as we talked about earlier at the start of the race, you can't buy one of those 9x8s, but you can buy a 9x8 because Lego Technic have just introduced a brand new 110th version. And yes, it's got this year's rear strakes and uh, extra winglets on as well. So you'll be bang up to date. You know what, there's a, there's a good moment to mention this. There are 37 world-class sports cars here. Which sports car was your son most interested in seeing here at Portimao? It was the one-tenth version yeah. of the Virgin Atlantic <laughs> team. That's really powerful, actually, yeah. genuinely. And it, by the way, there's been no shortage of uh, the media in the media room where the model is sitting at the moment in its glass case uh, interested as well. Thank you once again, uh, live on air, Graham, for uh, smuggling him into the media centre so it's we can okay. have a look at it. It's absolutely fine. It's, 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 only affected, <laughs> it's only affected for the rest of my career. <laughs> I, I've got to say, such as it is. I've got to say that was a definite <laughs> Hello Santa moment, wasn't it? Dear Santa, <laughs> Dad, yeah. Have Dear you seen Santa. this? Yeah, oh, thanks, Graham. Yeah. Right, so here we go Lessie for the lead, Lilu Wadu. Don't forget, Diego Lessi's been in all the way from the start. Lilu took over after the first round of pit stops here she comes gonna be turn one yes. the corner of choice easy on the brakes done and dusted Excellent absolutely stuff. no messing about truly the era of the finding of female talent in motorsport and it's great to see Leela wadu leads the race sarah bovi has led the race dorian pan i think led the one yes. she started from pole yeah. therefore de facto led the race great stuff yeah, absolutely, and, and it's fantastic that it it is a not just mechanically a level playing field, but in just about every other aspect as well in all of our categories. And there is no honestly good reason why a top female racing driver can't race a hypercar. Oh, hang on a minute, we're going to have some in a hypercar next year. Exactly so. Let's hope so. Yeah. No, I, 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 I can't imagine that Iron Lynx will be running that program and will not have a car hopefully bright pink still because that's <laughs> starting to that is starting to become you know a, a real crowd favorite not just with younger and older female fans but with everybody else but imagine a lamborghini bright pink oh, hypercar my daughter at the track as, as well yesterday her favorite car instant hit guess which one it was yeah. Well, and it also female car well. crew of, of Sarah Bovey's car. Well, of course it is. Links, but, you know. Of course it is. And the, the other thing it's important to say here, you know, this young lady is, is leading a race we've been bigging up in GTM and doing it on pace. There's no tokenism here. This is about performance. And what's been one of the great parts of that rivalry between Ben Keating and Sarah Bovey is the absolute respect. I just point out in the top three, there's one bloke. There's, there's only one male driver in the top three. I think we should complain. <laughs> no, we've definitely had plenty of very successful male drivers over the years in all sorts of motorsport. Um, more, you know, historically successful women drivers have been fewer and further between and, and sort of regarded with a degree of suspicion, perhaps, by the, the establishment, but no longer, and rightly so. Now, Richard Westbrook ahead of Olivier Pla, so he is picking up spots. There's definitely not much wrong with the pace of the Cadillac. What was his last lap? Uh, squint. It was a uh, 134.6. Yeah. The leader did a 134.59. So he's not potentially hanging around very much, Richard Westbrook, although he did have a full set of fresh tyres. That's going to help. Yeah, he's gone uh, yeah. by the Glickenhaus as well, hasn't he? So he's picked up two positions since that uh, out of sequence stop for tyres. Well, the, now, the, sorry, the other thing about Westy is that He's out of sequence on tyres and on fuel because they've done a partial stint. Now, how they shuffle that towards we can maybe save a stop at the end and somehow, yeah. you know, get us, you know, make a big jump while everybody else pits, I don't know. But whoever takes the car over is going to have to use those tyres that Westbrook is, is currently using. So 
it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, but right now they are certainly lapping as quick as anybody else out there. Speaking yeah. of lapping quickly, sorry, Graham, um, it's down to 30.6 seconds now. You just thing. spotted it, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Between fun. Nick Nielsen and Sebastian Boemi. So it was around 30. 35, 34, 35, 34, 34. 35. So it's coming down again here. But the gap between the leader and the third place Ferrari, James Collado, continues to grow. Ten so seconds. Nielsen is pulling away from Collado while he closes on the Toyota and we again look at you see the caddy is barely halfway into a stint so he's not going to stop this time Toyota at the moment their only hope is Floyd Van Wall, Glickenhaus or Peugeot Frailty of even a point. That's where this graphic really helps isn't it I'm loving this yeah. virtual energy tank in the hypercar category yeah so Ferrari using more energy than Toyota once again. Uh, one quick update from Corvette uh, that uh, Ben Keating reporting he believes he might have had contact with one of the Jota cars uh, yeah. out there. Uh, in, in turn five down at the hairpin, well, you know, if, if you haven't had contact at turn five, did you even race at Portimao? Yeah, I confirmed, by the way, drive shash and... Uh, drive shash 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 sensor. Do you want to borrow my teeth? No, thank you. They're no better than yours. <laughs> Yeah, drive shaft sensor for the Toyota Gazoo racing car, which is now up to 31st overall. Jose Maria Lopez and his next target will to go to, will be to go past Chris. You see, I told you they're no better than yours. To go by Christian Reed. Sebastian Bemi leads for Toyota. Ferrari in second place and in third place in LMP2 United Autosports 1-2. Josh Pearson leading Frederick Lubin. And it's a Ferrari 1-2 at the moment with Lila Wadu ahead of Diego Le see Sarah Bovis Porsche in third in GTE and there is the Glickenhaus again made their debut here in 2021 they had contact they had gearbox issues gearbox sensors and and shifters but they got on top of those very quickly yep it's uh, it was a very different looking color to the car at least that's uh, bright red of course at its debut here and uh, the I think fan favorite eggshell blue Let's hear from Louise Beckett in the pit lane. Yeah, I've just caught up with the 777 station team and uh, the car's parked in the garage. It's, don't, it's not going back out. Uh, it's an engine issue. They've tried to change some bits to it. They don't know. Um, so that's probably looks like it's done for the 777, unfortunately. Thank you, Lou. That is unfortunate for the TF Sport team. Don't often have Aston Martin engine issues. In fact, if these cars are... Are, are even more resilient than, than modern road cars. Very rarely do you see a mechanical issue on these cars. Normally, it is involving uh, a stationary object and, and some speed that, that takes cars out of these races. But unfortunately, D Station are out. Charles is still running. Is uh, trying to fend off here the close attentions of Louis Delatras. We've been talking about Lilia Wadu, who's striding away five five point seven seconds the good now in the lead charmelisi of course shared a p2 car with her last year um for the sydney tech team well the last time we talked about charles i said he was closing in on philip urgan in the prema car in front which you can't see in this shot so he's actually lost ground to urgan yep. and delatraz and louis delatraz coming up from behind for team wrt and indeed, Malaysia's lap time is a little off in the 37s here as Delatraz in the low 36s. One of two drivers who has a Formula One driving father. Delatraz. Jean-Denis Delatraz. Yes. Oh, yes. in Formula One for first, what? possibly. Uh, I'm a little sketchy. Sorry, sorry Stuart Dent. Uh, Villeneuve. Of course. Who else? Are there others that I'm... There must... Somebody... There's people now throwing bricks at their screen going, what about him, you moron? I'm, I, I can't think. But anyway, there you go. Jean-Denis Delachaise, possibly less well-known in the annals of Formula 1 than uh, Gilles Villeneuve. Uh, I, I know him more. Of course, I know, of course, his Formula 1 career. I know more from his sports car racing career, which, yes. uh, which ended only fairly recently, in fact, for Jean-Denis, if you're listening, Jean-Denis. I right. can see in the paddock um, at Sebring. Is he not still racing uh, historic cars as well? I think the two of them race historic. Uh, meanwhile, back with uh, Corvette Racing's Ben Keating. Under pressure now, really under pressure from Fr Francesco Castellacci. And Castellacci might get a Ferrari helping hand here as well. A uh, little uh, top-up of fluids. Nico Veroni. So it looks as though... It looked a little bit as though... Um, 
Nicky Katzberg was more ready to get into the car, but it might be uh, Nicholas Veroni that gets in. The Argentine driver when Ben Keating comes in in this Corvette. Castellacci uh, looking for a potential overtake into turn 10, late on the brakes, but Keating's got it covered. I was wondering whether the hypercar Ferrari going by Keating might leave him offline and open to attack, but uh, clearly the hypercar got by without delaying Ben too much. This is for fourth place in GTEM. Yeah, this is the silver rank Francesco Castellacci trying to get by. Uh, a man who's acknowledged as being one of the best problems rank drivers in the world. Ben Keating yeah. doing a fine job of fending off the silver Ferrari. Oh, he's gone quite wide there, has Castellacci. You see the car bounced. He didn't quite know where to place the car at the mid corner point through 15. Bounced a bit wide and uh, had to back out of it big time. Trouble, Always a at, yeah. sport. Trouble at turn 10 for Vector. I just saw the yellow flags are out in the Vector car facing the wrong way. It's the Prema. Contact from 63. Oh, that could be an interesting one, couldn't I'd it? I'd like to see that from a different angle. If we've got the onboard from 63 or a car that was behind, it's always hard to see from the offboard shot at that angle. But at first glance, I'd say it yeah. looks like Prema could be in a little bit of hot water there. And that's a big battle at the moment. Uh, but then again, the, the vector would have been lapped, yes, getting lapped correct. there. So then you have to take that into account well, as well. But the we have seen penalties come in. Yeah. Uh, for the car that looked like they were the innocent victim, yep. as the vector looked like there. If you've got a blue flag being waved at you, you need to be out of the way. We've seen penalties coming their it's way. It's not Formula One. It's a warning. It's not a get out of the way flag. It's it's to alert you to the fact there is a quicker car. Also, the vector sport car didn't reverse into the Prema car. Alex oh. Brundle got a, a drive through, I think it was, in Bahrain at the end of last year for that exact moment. And I he can was tell the you car right, that I got can tell you right now, which somewhere, was in the world, somewhere in the world, Alex Brundle is, go, is going, uh, go, uh, shouting his telly, going, Yes, yes, I did! <laughs> <laughs> Alex Brundle is in his Mustang at the members' meeting he, at Goodwood, so he won't be, be listening to oh, us. He will. No, he'll be, he'll be on the swilling course. fine champagne in the drivers' club. <laughs> uh, Toyota Gazoo racing the race leaders. Ferrari 2-3, but Nick Nielsen in the 50 Ferrari breaks for the border and heads into the pit lane. Now, he's been in the car since the start, and in will come the 51 car as well, so both in at the same time, and they are down to 1% and 0% energy. James Collado has been playing the, I'm not going to the fuel station until it gives me zero miles on my readout. Well, they've got to be careful, haven't they? Because if they go beyond that, there are penalties that come for that, I think I'm right in saying. Ooh. I think they're pretty big penalties. Because it, remember, remember, it's not fuel we're talking about here. It's, it's a total virtual energy. Yeah, it, it's a virtual uh, value. So, so if you use too much of your, too many megajoules basically yes. from the battery, then you can get into trouble. As long as it's not point not one, it's okay. Yeah. Well, this is the game at Formula Replay all the time, Absolutely. isn't it? Absolutely. Oh damn! What's ja this? Jamie O'Leary, Daniel Serra. Oh, Jamie, I love you dearly. Thank you. Yeah. I love you because I'd just like to see the disappointed look in his little face. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Serra, whose father, Chico Serra, as soon was as you a said Grand Prix it, driver in the 80s. As soon as you said it, I thought, you, 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 you put it on. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. And that's why we love social media as well. And by the way, while we're on air, uh, if you find Graham Goodwin on Twitter, because my Twitter doesn't work, uh, you can ask him questions and we will try and get the answers. Hashtag AskWEC, and you can send that on to me at... Uh, at DSC editor, at DSC editor, hashtag ask WEC. And uh, you know, if we ever get to a point where there's any kind of interruption in the action, we'll come and have a look at those. Well, no, we'll try and answer them anyway. Rapid pit stops going on here everywhere oh, there's a, there's for, a... for pretty much everybody. Uh, a, a pit stop infringement for Floyd Van Wall. They'll have oh, a five second stop and go penalty, not a five second holdout or added to their next pit stop. No. And that will have been. Too many people working on the car, no earth strap connected, no visor down on the fire, no fire extinguisher or, or, or one of those, yes. But they've gone like straight that. for that, so whatever that is, it's a significant issue. It's a slam dunk, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It's a, we're not arguing about that. Uh, so as the hypercars all stop for fuel,
Brazil, LMP2 continues, and in the GT Pro class, Lila Wadu running away, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. Diego Alessi now seven seconds back. Corvette Racing, Ben Keating in fourth place in that bright yellow C8R, and right behind the 54 AF Corsa Ferrari of Francesco Castellacci. So Castellacci uh, still stuck there in the Peugeot garage. Carlos Tavares in the cap, the uh, boss of the Stellantis group, who run Peugeot, among their many other projects. And the leader is on pit lane as well. Sebastian Buemi is in, which means, no, Lawrence Van Tour, oh, not shown as in the pits, but my eyes show that he is. Is that not number six? That is... No, that's number five, that's Dane Cameron. So number yeah. six, is this Porsche leading the race for the first time then? Uh, it's will be if Seb Boemi doesn't get off the pit lane very shortly. So where is the, the six well, is coming down through turn 15 now. It and was if it 50 pit, seconds behind. I can't see the eight coming in and going out just enough uh, it's time. It's got to pit, it's on zero percent. It's okay. got to pit. All right, so they do not get that opportunity. I think it was quite a good strategy from Ferrari, wasn't it, to side, to just put on one side of new tyres yes, mm -hmm. during that stint. It really did work. The gap came down from where it was before the first round of pit stops. Yeah. So this isn't done. You know, at the moment, strong position for the one Toyota that's still untroubled. Well, it's reset. I know that we, was, we were getting excited that the yeah, yeah. car 50 clawing away and eroding that gap that it had, but it's obviously because it had a, a fresh set of left-hand tyres on the car. Absolutely. Um, now it's even playing field again. All four tyres, brand new, driver changes all round. Ferrari have gone for four tyre change on both cars, driver changes as well. Nielsen to Molina, Collado to Giovanazzi. We're just about to take over to the end. Oh, the number five Porsche, yeah, really they, meandering yeah. out of the pit lane there. You, you could literally see the moment he dared go for the brake pedal because the nose just washed down the hill. It's really skillful stuff going out. I mean, they're used to driving around these nice, sticky, hot tyres, lower fuel, slap on a set of ambient cold tyres, brand new, and fill the car up with fuel again. You go out, you venture out there, your eyes are on stalks. Toyota actually put um, Jose Lopez out there uh, during the, the warm-up laps mm -hmm. to figure out what it feels like for this very moment. Yeah. He hadn't been on new tyres uh, on, you know, cold new tyres throughout the whole, which I find amazing. Wow. Yeah. Uh, throughout the whole event so far, so he used that warm up as to uh, to, to explore what it feels like. If you watch the number nine it, car, it's sort of almost like. Sorry, it's sort of almost like what traditionally you do is new driver, new tyres. Actually, it's sort of almost like you want to give the new driver hot tyres from the previous guy in his first exit from the pit lane, right. and then when he's really feeling the car a lot more, then put the new set of tyres on. So, like, have a single first stint, and then Ooh, a double tyre stint. Well, I'm not sure if it was, but the Alpine just in front of the WRT machine. No, just in front of the Premier is that? Yeah, it was I WRT, know, yeah. It was WRT, still, yeah. That, still that same battle between Delatraz, isn't it, as one of the United cars goes to the pit lane. Yeah. So we've got all sorts of pit stops underway at the moment. LMP2 stops, some of the leading cars in GTM, oh, including yes. the, the Corvette on pit lane now for Nico Veroni, I think, will be climbing Whoa, up. Whoa, off in turn one, one of the Porsches. Wildly off as well. So that's, that's the... So that is the... They've Five. done an outlap, so that's their first full Five. fat... Yep lap and it's not yeah there is contact there That's was contact from the rear wheel of one of the he Jota he, cars he thought he hit the Jota car on yeah. contact with the Jota car rather so um, GTM leading group with the exception of Lili Wadu stays out for another lap uh, come to pit lane also staying out from Jasper Castellacci so it's 83 from 54 and Matteo Crisoni for Iron Lynx he stays out yep. so he rises right up the order to, to third place but he will disappear down below that afterwards so Ben Keating has completed a double stint in the pole sitting Corvette and I'm sure Louise Beckett will catch up with him shortly you can see the Aston Martin going out as well double stint there for Michael Dynan 
Uh, I would think that might well be Ahmed Al Harty who goes out next. We'll wait and see, though. Number four and the number 93 both on pit lane at the moment. Ninth and tenth position right now, but the number four will have to come in again for that stop and go. Yeah, 93 driver change as well. They have completed their double stint, but of course, joined the race two laps behind everybody else. That doesn't stop them being in the top ten, though. So Tom Dillman back in the pits, and so that will be for that drive-through stop-and-go penalty. Again, in LMP2, by the way, as they cycle through this, this pit-stop cycle, the number 48 Hertz Team Jodicar, now with David Beckman at the wheel, profiting from the efforts earlier on of Antonio Felix da Costa and going longer than the rest of the field and coming to the top of the order as a result. Ben Keating there gets the plaudits of the hugely experienced Corvette crew. But he's really loving working with this team. It's first time since he was running SRT, the uh, Vipers, that he has driven an American car for an American team. And 54 driver change as well for the AF Corsa Ferrari. And Lila Wadu still leading in GTM from Matteo Cressoni and Francesco Castellacci is in the pits. He comes in from second. Yeah, that man's to the 60 r well. car up into second place for the time being at least. I'm a man now aboard the 21 Ferrari that's been in this mix. Here comes Lilu. Yeah. That was a very good stint indeed. Now, I know those that like to pour over the statistics and the data. Uh, that's one to look for. Definitely. Out comes the 48. That was close. Very close. But yeah. uh, close doesn't count. So 54, there was a driver change to Davide Rigon. So that car is not going to be hanging around. Davide Rigon, of course, was a factory GTE Pro driver with Sam Bird for a number of years in the uh, Ferrari team. And Lilu Wadu, single stint for her and a well-judged one as well. She is in and out. She and should be... Yeah, really good stint. She should be yeah. rightly delighted with that. And after the emotions that we saw at Sebring, I mean, not been able to go out uh, with the, the car being eliminated with the accident for co-driver as Paris Compact. My guess is, once she's got her breath back, you're going to see a big, wide smile on that young lady's face. Well, hopefully Louise can get down there and have a chat with her, because that was a proper stint, wasn't it? She, she took in a car in a decent position, and she just blew by the field to take the lead and brought it in P1, you know. And with distance. Is, is there a better job to, that you can do, Ant? If you, if you take the car and bring it in as the leader, you've done a proper job. Well, Louise is down with Ben Keating, so we'll hear from the Corvette driver right now. Ben Keating, you had a big applause for your team there when you got out of the car. Yeah. I feel like I did my job there. I took care of the car. In my first stint, my first hour, I got four track limit warnings. So if I get one more, then, uh, then I end up uh, having a penalty. And so I, I was worried the whole time. I really worried uh, that you know I was going to have some accidental track limits. I had to really change the way I was driving and be a little bit more conservative, go down a gear. But thankfully, I feel like I did what I needed to do. Unbelievable stops. This team was just so incredible. You know, I don't know how far ahead Sarah was for me after the first stint, but we came out in front after the stop. Unbelievably great stop. And, you know, I don't know how quick that second stop was, but uh, they had to wait for me to cross the line after doing the driver change to go. So it's, it's pretty bad when you're waiting on me. But uh, unbelievable job by the team. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like the first tire set I had. I think we made the wrong choice on uh, what to do, but you didn't really know. But uh, the second set was much better. I think we have a good race car. Yeah. I felt bad from starting up front and then running in fifth when I got out of the car. But now I look and I see that everybody is either silver or gold in front of us. So that makes me feel a little better. So hopefully we'll be there uh, by the time we get to the end. Well done, thank you. Yeah, Louise Beckett just have to work hard for that interview. Uh, ben is rightly loved by uh, sports car fans. Uh, five seconds going to be added to the next pit stop for car 63 for causing collision at turn five. That would have been the, the one with the vector. And finally, that move made, uh, and that's the 41 on the 35. But was it kept? 
for yeah. the six, rather. By apologies. So that's probably enraged Alex Brundle even more, hasn't it? Yes. That uh, decision there from what happened in Bahrain last year. <laughs> he was the one that got spun around, and uh, he was the one that got the penalty. This time, I'd say that's the right decision. Mm. Car 63, yeah, you've just spun around another competitor. So uh, it doesn't matter whether they had a, a, a blue flag or not. It's, I think the, the move was just a bit too late. And, should uh, I, it make that that one make sense this time around. Should I, by the way, the number four, the Floyd Van Wall car has come in to take that penalty, the, the penalty stop after it's stop uh, for regular service, so now drops to 14th place. So actually, I think the first stop was the penalty, and the second stop was to put in, um, or do, was the driver no, changed before? Seconds. It's, it's Esteban yeah. Gary area now, so you're right, they've done that change, then he had to serve the penalty that his teammate earned. LMP2 battles all the way down the field at the moment is United Autosports leading for uh, with Josh Pearson. Prema, car number 63 in second. And then in third place, the 48 Jota Sport car. So Danny Kvyat for Prema and then uh, David Beckman for Jota. 34 into Europol. That's where they qualified. Now, they were down in 11th place in the opening sequence of the race, having got biffed about in the first couple of corners, and now they're back up to fourth place. So into Europol having a really good run of it. Rio Hirakawa is the driver of the lead Toyota, car number eight, ahead of Miguel Molina and Antonio Giovinazzi. Kevin Est in the six Porsche, Head of Richard Westbrook, who's now up to fifth position in the Cadillac. And again, because of that enforced half stint stop, because uh, Westy had flat spotted the tyres, he's going to do basically two and a half stints. They're going to be out of fuel sequence, out of tyre sequence with everybody else. So they're going to look like heroes. Then look like they don't know what they're doing. Then look like heroes again. And it, it, where in the hero to zero balance the race end comes for them, I don't know. But somebody on the pit wall is definitely working on plan C, D, and E to, to try and align themselves with the end of the race rather than being caught out. Yeah, in uh, the GTE AM field, it's back up to the leader race. Lewis Perez Compank uh, picks up the car that Lilian really Wadu brought in uh, effectively from the lead. Then the 21 AF Corsa car, then the Iron Dames down the hands of Rahel Fry. So it's Lewis Perez Compank from Simon Mann from Rahel Fry. Kind of odd sequence there for the number 60 car. Came in from the lead with Matteo Crisoni. It's on pit lane at the moment. Um, so it's gone long on fuel, very long on fuel, uh, a good five minutes longer than many of its competitors. But uh, on a GTM fuel load, that's not really going to do it much good. No, the, they sort of stop at the top of the hour. They, they've gone from basically being last in the field to first in the field and are going to drop back to down towards last in the field. Look at the muck on the side of the number eight Toyota. We're only two hours into the race, two hours and ten minutes in, and it's already covered in rubber filth. You talked about cornering energy here, and the way a tyre, particularly a racing slick, grips the road is actually the road is pulling bits off the tyre all the time, particularly in the corners when it's really scrubbing. And those bits get rolled off like when you're rubbing blue tack off a, a poster or whatever, and that ends up at the side of the track. And, and it makes the exterior limits of the track really tricky to use because they become very slippery and loose like gravel. Let's hear from Lloyd Duval and Louise Beckett. Well, Lloyd Duval, this is definitely better than the bumps of Sebring here in Portimao, but how is it treating you guys in Peugeot? Yeah, definitely better. Uh, we were expecting it in a way. Uh, it's still uh, still not easy compared to the main competitor, which is uh, which is Toyota. They perform really well, but uh, it's a good race so far for us on the 94. Uh, Nico did a really good uh, double stint. You know, I'm pretty happy with the with the tires, with the behavior of the car. The pace is matching more or less the Cadillac and the Porsche, uh, so that's good. We are in the game. We are doing a clean race so far, which is the target. So there's a few hours to go. But uh, at least we are in the gap, and uh, definitely was a, it's a step forward compared to bring. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we all hoped for a, a better race here for uh, for Peugeot, um, but mostly we hoped for more reliability. And touch wood, I might have cursed it now. It seems well. I mean, it's already better than it was in Sebring, isn't it? Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, reliability issues uh, plagued them in Sebring, but along with that, just a terrible ride quality from the car and just a, a severe lack of performance. So, you know, the performance looks better here, like Loic was saying. And um, 
generally speaking, I'd say the car looks better. It looks easier to drive for the drivers. They have done some testing in Paul Ricard, I believe, after Sebring, tried to iron out some of the reliability issues that they were experiencing. So, yeah, you know, onwards and upwards for Peugeot. I'd like to hear from an aerodynamicist because we think that part of, feel that part of their problem in Sebring was that ground effect does not work on rally stages because the ground and car gap is never constant. And, and Sebring is like a rally stage. It's so bumpy, so many brakes in the surface and up and down and all over the place. When they get to Le Mans, in the Group C era, the rule always, and those were ground effect cars, the rule always was never cross the white line in the middle of the straight, because it is a two-lane public highway with quite a crown in it, and when you go over the crown, suddenly there is no gap between the middle of the floor, and then you end up with chronic porpoising, and you start to break your grip. So that's something that's not been a factor in the last 25 or 30 years at Le Mans, unless you were driving a Mercedes, but it is definitely going to be a factor for Peugeot there, I would think, because all, almost all of their grip comes from ground effect, which means you have to stay on one side or the other of the Mulsanne. But in traffic, you can't do that, can you? No, I think, I think the crown of the road is less severe than it was possibly in the past, but there, it is still there, and uh, it kind of dictates the ride height of the cars. Yeah. So I say, you know, the, the ground effects work best when you get the car lower to the ground. And I don't know if you noticed, but when we saw a shot of the Peugeot coming towards us earlier on into turn one, making an overtaking move, can't remember on which car it was, but I did see the sparks flying out the back of it. And it's the only car that does that uh, in, in the hypercar category. So um, there's something to do with it. I don't know if it's just too simplistic to say. It makes sense to me that it's a, more of a ground effects car, doesn't have a rear wing, therefore you have to put it lower on the ground and maybe a stiffer setup. But I, I put that question to one of the, the top engineers at Peugeot in Sebring, and he almost he didn't poo-poo the idea, but he, he he didn't say, you know, yes, that's absolutely correct. Uh, this this that's our problem. Uh, but it's, I feel like it is certainly part of the problem, maybe not the entire problem that that plagued them in Sebring for a lack of performance. Yeah, there's, there was definitely an uptick in their performance here. Uh, number 48 is going to be investigated for something that happened in the pit stops, which is bad news for the Jota team. David Beckman is currently lying in third place as we look inside the Brains Trust at WRT. They're all watching the race and not uh, paying attention to their phones. Alpine versus WRT, the battle for eighth place. And there's something in the air at Ferrari. Let's hear what. The bottom button in the pink row, press it. Press the bottom button in the pink row on the console. BBW reset. Copy that, man. The brakes are also very hot. The brakes are also very hot, so I need more lift and coast, man. Sorry. Try the brake-by-wire reset again. Ah, now we heard James Collado talking about BB, and I thought that was brake balance, but is BBW brake-by-wire? Well, they're two very different things, that's why. you got well, the BB as brake balance. I wonder if we just misheard that he was that he was talking about brake balance, or if he was actually talking about BBW, and we just didn't hear it entirely. Uh, I'm pretty sure that, um, yeah, he, he mentioned at the time that he had lots of rear locking and therefore the brake, but no, that, that the BB, that was um, Paul Resto, that was Peugeot. Okay. He wanted to go forward on the BB um, brake bias, so there's a change of position there. Yeah. Ooh, uh, and or was it? He's is, still got the car on his... Oh, the Ferrari's going to play a part in this, isn't it? Yes, it does. United car didn't quite have the run. So this is a, a nice little battle for fifth place. 22 in the hands of Phil Hansen and 40, uh, big part nine in the hands of Philip Urgan. So Philip versus Philip, and Hansen goes high, wide, and handsome. See what I did oh, there? Dear, I'll stop. Good. I'll stop. Fetch me coat. Please. <laughs> uh, so this is Hansen. Obviously, he's got the speed on uh, Urgan here, but um, couldn't quite get by and, and make it stick going into turn seven. But he'll surely have another run at it 
And he has caught him up. He's caught about four or five seconds in the last few laps. So he does have a fraction more speed, but he needs to have quite a lot more speed to make the pass, Graham. And he's, he's got to get a wriggle on as well because they're being caught by Louis Delatraz from behind here as well. So just out of shot here uh, is Louis Delatraz with one of the Ferraris coming through. There you go. There is the WRT car. Well clear, as we said now, mm -hmm. uh, from Charles Malaisi. In fact, Malaisi was overtaken at the end of that last lap by uh, Robert Fines in the yeah. number 31 Team WRT car. And we'll say again, because I'm sure she's listening, happy birthday to Robin Fines' grandmother, who is 100 years old yesterday. Uh, uh, Milesi is in a second stint, isn't he? And Delatraz and Fines were fresh in last time, or am I wrong in thinking that? I thought Charles Milesi is in a second stint. However, again, the United car, Phil Hansen having a good, hard look. A brilliant switch around there for uh, Phil Hansen. He timed it perfectly as the Ferrari just blasts past before seven. He's not going to get it done into turn seven, it's Hansen, but he's switched back on the inside of eight as well. It's a brilliant little tussle, this, between the two Phils. And look at the the second WRT car is right there. So that is Robin, uh, it's Louis Delatraz, rather, right behind the blue yeah. and red car. Phil Hansen, who uses all the curb to send it on the inside. That might have been a track limits there. It might have been, and uh, would have been frowned upon even more so if he had made the move on the inside into 11, but couldn't quite get through. Uh, I think luckily, actually, for him, that didn't work out, because all eyes were on him as he did that. Yeah. Again, classic LMP2 battling here with identical cars, the same engine, the same tyres. Drivers make the difference. He has been done. WRT found his way by. Properly tucked up. We didn't see why, because we were looking at the garage, but Robin Fries just went right by him, and now Phil Hansen trying to come back. He He's did, got he a to... great run here, hasn't he? He's going to be brave around the outside. He's going to have to be brave around the outside. Oh, well done, both. Tell you what, Frines did well there to back out of it, because I thought, you know, the inside line, surely you could muscle the car on the outside out of the way, but Hansen is a very aggressive racer, yeah. and uh, he wasn't having any of it. It was Frines actually... Delatraz, yeah, he... not Frines. It's oh, yeah, Delatraz, sorry. Yeah, Frines yeah. is catching him, but... Yeah, yeah so Delatraz did the right thing there, just backed out of it, but, and it's knowing your competition as well. Like I said, I know that Hansen's a very aggressive racer. So did Delatraz in that moment and thought, he's starting to turn in, I'm, I'm bailing. Well, I, I can't keep the nose in here, we're going to make contact. Yeah, and if we make contact, I'm on the inside and I'm the guy who's going to get pinged for it. By the way, they've just passed the pink Porsche of Sara Bovi, uh, the big one of Rahel Fry, who's taken over from Sara Bovi. That is the GTE AM leader again. That's because of the pace of Rahel Fry through this stint so far has caught and passed both Simon Mann and Lewis Perez Compank. And the ebb and flow continues in yep. GTM. It's a cracking race. She is the fastest GTM car out there, with the exception of David A. Rigon in the 54 car in fifth place, who is a couple of tenths quicker than her on the last lap. But it's all about that track position. The Iron Dames are 2.6 seconds ahead of the 83 car of Lewis Perez Compank in for his second stint, and Simon Mann in for his first is 8.5 behind the leader. United, Prema, and Jota, the top three. Then into Europol, uh, Billy Nomates in fourth place, closing a little on the 48 car, and then the Prema United WRT battle. Number 22 back in front, Phil Hansen getting back ahead of Louis Delatraz, as we saw there with that brave move. Then the WRT and Alpine train coming up behind. There are no real gaps in this midfield battle. This is the battle I expected to see in LMP2, and it only really happens when you've got drivers of pretty similar status, the Golds and the Platinums. There's really nothing between them. Um, it's, it's more just a... It seems like a higher rank, but it, yeah. it's, it's, it's really not. The gold drivers, as all platinum drivers know, are pretty much exactly the same speed as them. It's just yeah. what you've achieved in your career. Cadillac in. Again, they had a half stint because of a flat-spotted tyre for Richard Westbrook at the end of his first stint. So they now come in. Westy will hand over the car, having done two and a half stints, and try and settle down to stop his eyeballs rattling from that... Uh, yeah, damaged tire. Let's hear from the 51 at Ferrari. Okay, man, we're gonna not deploy from the front axle, so multi 10 and press OK. Multi 10 and press OK. We're gonna charge the SOC and try and see if we can survive. 
Okay, oh, and oh, well, translate yeah. that into <laughs> English for us. <laughs> so they've clearly been having problems with the brake by wire system. That's all about the harvesting of energy. They do that through the front axles. It's a front motor, electric motor on the Ferrari. When we're riding on board, you'll hear the high pitch whiny noise. That's the energy being deployed or harvested. So talking about the harvesting of energy on the Ferrari, uh, they're saying, right, we're seeing the brake pedals going long. The brake by wire system isn't behaving. We're going to turn it off and tr for a moment so we can try to regain some SOC, SOC state of charge, yep. um, which any hybrid road car user or EV road car user will be more than familiar with. This, they're trying to recharge the, uh, the state of charge to get it higher up to near 100%. So then they'll try and switch it back on, reactivate it to see if it starts behaving itself. I don't think it will. No. From my experience of driving hybrid racing cars. And, but I think that's the beauty of, of today's hypercars. They have the option to kind of run it or not. Yeah. Um, yes, you'll start burning more fuel if you're not running the electric energy. So that's going to go against them. And you're, you're now carrying around a bit of a dead weight, aren't you? It's not doing anything for you in terms of power deployment. So that interesting one up front, it doesn't sound good, basically. No. That's a to, to short translation of all of that. Electronic issues tend not to fix themselves automatically, no. do they? No. So, but if you can bypass it, and the, and the deal is, as we've explained a couple of times, the hybrid does not add more power. So you don't go, it's not like a, you know, a turbo overboost. You don't go from 700, deploy the hybrid and go to 800 horsepower. You stay at 700 horsepower and it's just transformed from being pure internal combustion to internal combustion and hybrid power mixed. And the LMDH cars produce about 50 horsepower equivalent in hybrid power. The Ferrari produces about 270. 100, 100, it's 270. 270. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we were looking at something else that was producing about 150. But but it, it's just the, the total amount of energy can't be any different. It, how you generate it can be. You don't have to be a hybrid. Glickenhaus isn't a hybrid, for instance. So you can be, but you don't have to be. Um, but yes, if, it, if it's going wrong, then that's probably going to be a race-long issue for them. At the moment, though, Ferrari still in second and third. The number six Penske Porsche, though, closing down at 51 cars. Antonio Giovinazzi struggles to, you know, when things aren't in whack, you've got to find a different way of driving and set the brake balance and so on. So he'll be working on that as Rio Hirokawa leads. And this car, Miguel Molina, is in second place. Uh, meantime, by the way, a couple of the delay cars, the uh, Van Wall down in 14th, but down in 22nd, and still, I think, two laps off the back of the LMB2 field yeah. is the delayed number seven uh, Toyota, but going very quickly indeed, going at race leading pace. More importantly for the Toyota, it's three full laps behind the Van Wall, Correct. which is the last point scoring car on that hypercar graphic. Toyota number seven right now will not score for the race. Toyota number seven at the moment on track is catching the sister car to unlap itself at least once. Yeah, well, it's only got another five laps to, <laughs> to find, I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, but the, there you go. The other quick uh, message we saw pop up on the screen, we did see investigation into the Hertz Team Jota pit stop. Mm. That is no further action. So okay. no penalty looms for the Sebring winning car. Another, another, sorry, Martin, and I was just going to say another added complication. We're hearing that uh, car 51 uh, with Joe Venazzi at the wheel, he's, he's being told to lift and coast as well, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is as soon as you turn off the hybrid system, you lose a bit of that retardation that helps you under braking through the front motor. You're now asking your front brakes to be doing it for you instead. And they're not designed on that car to be doing it 100% no. all the time. Yep. No. So they're not... I would see a... Oh, Hansen oh, under pressure again. Look, he's, this is the battle for fifth. No, the Prema right car with the green highlights, then the blue and red of Phil Hansen, United Autosports. And Louis Delachat is going the long way round the outside at 13. Oh, and gets, oh, touch, touch. gets invited into the gravel and as a result does not lose a place to his teammate, uh, Robin Freins. Freins could have stuck his nose down the inside there. Now he's going to stick his nose down the inside into 15, is he? No, he's not. 
So 41, Louis Delatraz just hangs on in front of 31. Uh, Hansen go, gets oh, the run and takes run. goes by the uh, the Prima car as well. And that's why we love LMP2 because it's so close. Because Hansen there was very nearly shuffled back up the one inside. and instead went up one. 41 goes through on the nine as well. So it's been a poor end to that run, uh, end to the last yeah. lap at the beginning of this one to nine. Philip Ergan has been holding his position quite happily. Well, quite happy, but has been holding his position under pressure for the last dozen laps and suddenly boom boom lost two places basically in the straight as, this... as exciting as it is and i love watching close racing i think that was a little bit over the mark for uh, for phil hansen there it was a bit too aggressive and there was contact and i think he might get in trouble there for uh, in... forcing another car off track okay. i think that i think the wrt uh, who was it the weird was it delatraz uh, i think he had a right to be there and um contact was made it was a little bit too over aggressive it uh, overstepped the mark there i think and damage was done to i think the back right of the uh of the united so look he's gone now's a good move around the outside he's you know you have to give a car room and but the question is, the the question the is you're in a left-hand drive car and he's coming around your right rear quarter Hansen doesn't even exceed track limits. The problem for Delatraz there is there's He's a tiny off. bit of concrete and then gravel. Yeah, and I, think, actually, I think Phil knew. I think Phil knew what he was doing I there. Think, uh, I, you know, you I have to try and run the other car out of road. Um, but now there's contact made and both cars damaged as a result. Leader in the pit. Oh, it's not. It's seven in the pits. Seven in the pits. Interesting. Now this car is the quickest in the race. Uh, or it was the quickest in the race early on. Set the lap, uh, fastest race lap on well, lap three in the hands of Mike Conway. But on his, on his penultimate lap there, um, in that stint uh, set a purple sector in the third sector. They are hauling. They are clearly pushing the performance here. Yeah. They'll be trying to learn what they can about the car. It's an effective test and hope, isn't it? Really. Well, it is, you know, in, and the hope here for the team is that everything they learn here might prevent them losing. <laughs> See, that's out of five. I know it's not out of five. That's a, a, a downhill down into, into five. five. But you see the hypercar being passed by LMP2s. Now, is that a problem with his braking, or is that something else going on? This is Estra right on that yeah. troubled uh, Tony Giovinazzi number 51 car. This is for third position. Giovinazzi yeah, is struggling to deal with this car without full braking. Of course, yeah, and he's having to lift and coast massively well as well to save the temperatures on the front brake. So he's just a sitting duck at this point and will get overtaken by the Porsche. Uh, trouble is, he's still got slower LMP2s in front of him, so he's having to work his way through them as well. But Estra's just losing time here at the moment, just stuck behind Joe. Got See, there yeah. we go. Not for long. He's got a slower LMP2 that actually isn't slower because the LMP2 car passed the Ferrari when we're on board with the Ferrari. So the Ferrari is really feeling the pressure here. There is Roger Penske. His car moves up to third place. Yes, Penske yes. Porsche claimed their first win with the 963 in the streets of Long Beach last yesterday. Well, look at it. It could be quite a weekend, couldn't it, for the Porsche Penske Motorsport? organization mm. a win and the prospects here of a strong run towards a potential podium finish now i think 51 is going to come into the pits i don't think they're going to go for another three and a half hours with this hobbled car i think they're going to try and fix it and they need to learn how to try and fix these things because if you're two and a half hours into le mans and it starts going uh, on the squonk then you really need to know what you're doing but i'll give you an idea of how much it's affecting it albeit there was traffic involved there there was an overtake involved there that was a 138 uh, from the Ferrari 133.9 for the race leader. Let's have a listen to what's going on with the 51. Okay, mate, big lift and coast, big lift and coast. We're working on a way to run without the BBW. I'll have to remove some brake blanking at the next stop. All right, so it's going to be a slightly longer stop. The problem with not having the friction of the motor generator the mgu on the front axle which harvests it, it when it's harvesting it helps to slow the car down so the brakes are smaller as a result than they might normally be if it if it didn't have a drive on the front so they're also heating up quicker so by removing some of the brake blanking they're going to expose the brake to more cooling air to try and give him that braking bite back but right now it's get to the end of the stint and we have to deal with it then but they they're not long past halfway through Glickenhaus in the pits now this is out of sequence Cadillac was out of sequence and we knew why they're half a stint away from everybody else 
seemed like a lot of uh, heat coming off the front of the brakes of the Dicken House. That's not unusual, but I wonder what else. The driver's door was open, they were looking in there. Here comes the Cadillac, and that picks up a spot now from the Glicken House, and the Toyota. Uh, the Peugeot also goes by the Glicken House, so that's the 93 Peugeot that started from the pit lane. So these cars are not battling for position on track. You can see they are a lap apart. Yeah, it's a shame, isn't it, for the Cadillac, just from that moment from Westbrook coming into the pit lane, behind the Peugeot, getting all crossed up, carrying that flat spot and then committing to going back out there on the same set has really ruined their race. He's clearly faster yeah. uh, than the 93 Peugeot there, makes his way by before turn seven. And uh, they had a quick racing car today, but unless there's some kind of safety car, I can't see it turning around. Or but... how far into the race, how much of a final stint does everybody do? Is it a full one, in which case they're in trouble? If it's a you short one, you are quicker maybe not. than Giovinazzi in front of you. Go get him. Yeah. Jack Luck over Ogre, but Ballet is very good. Copy. All right. Gus Menez is feeling the love from the 9x8. There is a podium, or a Ferrari that was just on the podium. Go get him. Yes, sir. I'm feeling this car. Oh, there it is, Gustavo yeah. Menezes. Uh, just under three and a half hours to go. Plenty of drama in the first two and a half hours. Plenty more time, for more to come. <laughs> and not just in hypercar. <laughs> LMP2 has doled out some real cracking racing, uh, albeit for fifth uh, place, let alone the top four, uh, all lapping pretty close together ahead of the group we've been watching over the last hour or so. GTM settled down for the moment. But uh, that's going to come back again to the normal motorised mayhem. We're going to go right down now to speak with Richard Westbrook, and he's with Louise Becker on pit lane. Well, Richard Westbrook, that must have been one bumpy ride. Yeah, it was, definitely for 15 laps. Um, I came up right underneath the Peugeot into the, to the pits, and um, I felt like he overslowed. But anyway... I had to sort of take decisive action. Uh, I tried to avoid him and had a big lock up. Obviously flat spotted the tires, uh, tires didn't have time to react in the pit stop. And yeah, we got half a stint out of it. So hopefully it hasn't hurt us too bad and we're, we've got the same amount of stops as everyone else now. So pace is quite good, uh, especially towards the end of the stint. Um, just like at Sebring really. So we're fighting for fifth and um, see if we can get best of the rest again. All right, thank you. Cheers, thank you. So that was interesting. He doesn't feel like it's compromised their race that much uh, because, uh, like we say, maybe it saved that splash towards the end of the race, and that's why they didn't let him pit so early. They forced him. They had to. They had no other choice. Just keep going until you can get to a point where we're within that window of eradicating that splash. Uh, we'll report, by the way, uh, courtesy of the technical bulletin that's uh, been now posted, the issue for the van wall that uh, gave them the, uh, the stop and uh, hold was front and total braking torque sensor was over the limit. So it's another uh, data-led penalty. But, like you said, Graham, this is... This is the, the, the day and age it's of the rule. hypercar. Yeah, it's yeah. the rule. You, they have the, the police have to see what you're doing at all times. But and it's as soon equivalent as you're of, of running below ride height. Yeah, or, completely correct. Or yeah. something else that's illegal. The, the, you know, it is a monitoring system that has to be there. There the, the will be purists, and at time I'm time, time, one of them, that will become a slightly twitching when you read this kind of stuff. This is the new reality. It is about efficiency as well as everything else. And these, th this is the reason why we've got the grid we've got. It's because you're providing a level playing field and everybody's got to get as close as possible to potential maximum performance they've got with that package. That's, yeah. that's the game. Uh, you know, to, to explain it in a way that was explained to me, it's look at LMP2. Each of those cars is exactly the same. Same tyres, same drivetrain, same uh, bodywork, same everything. And yet, and yet, some of these teams are a lot quicker than others. It's because of the contribution of the drivers yeah. and the team. That's what it should be in a balanced performance governed hypercar class. Right, let's in see what happens here. 51, this is Giovanazzi. Now we know it's going to be a slightly longer stop. 
potentially only break blanking, but let's stay with this. So we're expecting to see the mechanics diving in around that front area to uh, take out some front blanking. So this they is going to start off as a standard fuel stop, and they're cleaning the windscreen. That's You're only allowed to do safety items. Driver's door is not open, so there will be no driver's chain. So Antonio Giovinazzi in for a, a second full stint. But you can see the two guys at the front there, and you can see how hot the brakes are. And normally, you don't get that sort of chimney of smoke effect. That's really, really hot brakes. They've been working hard, haven't they? And about to work hard with the mechanics. As soon as that fuel nozzle's off, yeah, four people can be over that white line at any time. Now, are they going to do tyres as well? No, they don't do tyres. So Antonio Giovinazzi heads back out. Heading back out into the pit, uh, out from the pits is Antonio Giovinazzi in the Ferrari that was in third place with braking issues, brake by wire issues, and having to turn off the front hybrid harvesting. They have lost time, having to make a, a, an out of sequence pit stop to cure that. Welcome back to our viewers from Eurosport across Europe who've just watched the denouement of the Le Mans 24 hours. Now, don't worry, not the four wheeled one, Le Mans 24 Moto, the 24 hour endurance world championship bike race has just finished so let's recap the race uh, with three hours and 20 minutes remaining Chiyoshi Gazoo racing have had a race of two halves the number eight car that started on pole uh, was initially led by the number seven then found its way by as a result of being quicker the number seven car then having to have a stop because one of their FIA mandated sensors a torque sensor for the rear wheels uh, had failed, and so the team had to change the entire left rear corner. 93 Peugeot was forced to start from the pit lane after it felt odd on the steering on the warm-up lap, and that resulted in work on the power steering. So they started the race two laps behind. They are, however, now up into eighth place in hypercar, with Glickenhaus having a gain, an out-of-sequence stop that dropped them to ninth, and Floyd Van Wall, a penalty for pit lane infringement, dropping them back down to 10th place. Ferrari second in, G, uh, in hypercar, and Porsche third in hypercar. Miguel Molina and Kevin Estra will be racing each other in GTE Pro for the last few seasons for their respective manufacturers, now battling with Toyota for the lead of the race. An all arms and elbows race in LMP2. Sees United Autosport still at the top of the pile ahead of Prema, who've just pitted and hurts Team Jota. There you can see the Van Wall hypercar. And having a little bit of trouble there. And Davidson in full drift mode. Oh, not yeah. good for tyres. Definitely not good for tyres and not good for lap time either. And while the uh, Prema car stops, that's the number 63 car, Danny Kviet uh, handing over the car. In the recap, just to bring you up to speed with GTE Am, it is the Iron Dames Porsche that leads Rahul Frey ahead of the Corvette of Nico Veroni and Davide Rigon in third place. Now, Louise Beckett is in the pit lane. She's catching up with Lilu Wadu, who brought her Ferrari in as the GTE Am leader. Lilu, finally we get to see you in the car on track in WEC. How was it? Uh, the car was very good. Uh, I can do something not uh, not bad. No, we will see after. I will uh, jump in the car after Luis and uh, we'll see what we can do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Lilu is getting more comfortable with talking to us in a second language. And Underplaying her role there significantly as well. The car felt OK and it was OK. Yeah, she went yeah. from fourth or fifth in class to the lead before handing it back to her co-driver. With a comfortable lead. That was quite OK. Uh, I'll translate for you. I kicked butt, I came back in, I was very pleased. <laughs> Clearly been to the uh, Kimi Raikkonen school of how to do in an interview. Um, one significant, chart out of there. Significant, significant background bullets in here. The... Uh, Incident of the of the issue that gave the penalty to the van wall that was a second offence on that uh, in the braking uh, sensors in excess. The number 50 Ferrari, which is currently running second, is on its first. So if there is a problem, they could be looking at a similar penalty. 
Oli Jarvis in, just got in for car 23, down at United, new tyres at the ready. So, through washes, the number eight, Rio Hirakawa, pulling away now, 44 seconds to the good, and I'll keep an eye on the, uh, the, the, the lap times for the Ferrari. I don't think there's a critical issue here, I think it's an issue they can manage, but with braking problems on the other Ferrari, the 51, with 50 having a warning for another brake-related issue, that doesn't bode very well for the remainder of the afternoon for them. No, it doesn't. This is going to be a difficult one for uh, particularly the car 51, you know, nursing those brakes. We saw the amount of smoke pouring off of them at the pit stop. That should lessen now that they've removed some of that brake blanking, but uh, it's still going to be hot work for those front brakes through the remainder of this uh, three hours, 17 minutes to go. And, uh, and it's up to the drivers to manage it as well. And Giovinazzi is going to have to play his part with this to make sure he can advise the next driver or drivers taking over from him exactly what he's doing, where he's lifting and coasting, and how he's managing this, this problem. And he's going to learn as he goes. He's going to be in fluid conversation with his engineers as well. We've seen a, or heard a snippet of. And um, yeah, this, it's just extra hard work on what's already a very difficult track to, uh, to circulate round, but making your way through slower cars, lapping those cars, and not, you know, staying within the track limits, all those kind of things. And it's this huge added complication on top of it. We have a battle here on track between a couple of the GTLs. That's Axel Jeffries in the blue and yellow 98 car, the Northwest AMR Aston Martin being caught here by the Kessel race in the car guy backed car. That's Scott, Scott Huffaker, sorry Scott, uh, who is just really geared as a Zimbabwean driver. So yet another new nation. We've had a fair few of those down through the years and uh, several of them again this year in the FI World Endurance Championship. LMP2 leader in, that's Phil Hansen, stays in the 22 United Auto Sports cars. Teammate Ollie Jarvis in 23, coming round now. You can see him there in the middle of that GTE battle. Now you can see the Ferrari hypercar coming up as well. And Jarvis should take the lead here. So that'll be a lead change, 23 ahead of 22. Why? Because the 22 is not yet out of the pit lane. So that is a lead change, isn't it? Three seconds quicker, Bobby Jarvis's car on pit lane than the number 22. And in fact, uh, Phil Hansen drops to third. Yeah, behind Mirko Bortolotti aboard the number 63 uh, Premier Racing. Good. You just saw the, Prima, saw the Prema car in the background of that shot there going into turn three. There's the leader, and you can't see the Prema car yet, but it's the uh, red, white, and green nose on the car. And 48 is in as well, so this is the new leader. David Beckman comes in with the lead and hands it over. So is that Sean getting back in, Sean Galel? Uh, not in that car, that's right, you that No, that's you for you, of course. So... Another good stint there from David Beckman in this car. He's uh, done done the team well for his two race stint with them, and I absolutely zero uh, zero problem in predicting that he will be in an LMP2 car somewhere else pretty soon. It's a surprise mm. that he's a silver driver as well. That it, I, I thought he was a, a bit more accomplished than that. It's, well, it's always you, you you toe that line. It's borderline stuff for some they, silver drivers out there. They, they call them super silvers. I wonder, I wonder if when they sent in the performance statistics to the FIA, they set the printer to just one side and forgot the other side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same for Sean Galea, isn't it? You know, yes, absolutely. In, in, Sean Galea was competing in F2. I know he hasn't done a full season of F2. Um, but yeah, that, that's well, that's the game you've got to play if you're in uh, in LMP2. Like well, I said, you're, you're only as good as your silver driver as a trio. Yeah, but being in F2 and being at the front of F2 can be very different things. So having done a part season in the cars doesn't necessarily mean he was, you know, a, a podium finisher or a race winner. He has been a race winner in the Asian Le Mans series. He's been a race winner in the European Le Mans series. Sure. Sure, well, I don't think he European. has. He's definitely in Asia. Asian uh, Le Mans series. In fact, uh, made his uh, debut there with, uh, with, I think it was Tom Wonquist's um, debut in LMP2. And Tom um, blazed the trail by destroying the car at turn four. <laughs> <laughs> this is nice. Seeing uh, Antonio yep. Felix da Costa having a debrief with Beckman oh, there uh, as uh, off oh, goes. Cold tyres. Yeah. Down at turn five. 
And again, for those who are just joining us, cold tyres doesn't mean not quite up to operating temperature. It means we don't have tyre ovens or tyre warmers of any kind. So they're about half the temperature of a tepid cup of tea and absolutely useless. For the drivers, it's like coming out onto ice. It is so low grip, and we've seen it all the way through free practice and in qualifying in the race. It's just heart in the mouth stuff for maybe two laps. And the 11 P2 seem to be faring the best out of all of the categories out there. Um, those Goodyear tyres are quite a narrow tyre as well. I think that yeah. helps in building up a bit of temperature, but still, it's well, it's the, like it's like treading on ice. It's, the car has always been a bit under-tired, hasn't it, the yeah. LMP2 car, for the power that it's had throughout its life, and, and that has fluctuated, depending on it's what, a good the, what the top car. cars was. No, no, a uh, great LMP2 race could, car. It could be a brilliant car if it just had some wider tyres, a bit more mechanical grip. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing and to say is... another 100 horsepower. No, no, that would have been fine. It would have been... The, the power... Well, I mean, it, it used to, didn't it? Before yes. um, exactly. they had to balance so it against the hypercars. Europe, will it Neil Amess again? Back to almost full power in the Neil Amess this year. They'll be significantly quicker. Uh, also worth saying, by the way, that uh, Goodyear had done up before them as the, as the sister brand, uh, certainly at, at this marketplace, did a lot of the testing of the LMP2 rubber here. So they'll have a huge amount of data as to what you can do with these, with these cars, with these tyres here. Again, you can see down at the turn five hairpin, all bets are off there. You can be in a GT car hooked up and comfortably overtake an LMP2 car up the hill, particularly if they're on cold tyres. And, and the same with a hypercar. Hypercar on cold tyres is easy prey for a well-driven GT car as the turn five hairpin. It, it's just a, a, an absolute gimme. You just go straight by them because they've got no grip. They'll sit there spinning their wheels. Yeah, you all have to share the track together and uh, you know the strengths and weaknesses of all the different cars out there. And the, the LMP2 and, and hypercar drivers, they know that how, how good the GT cars are in the slow speed corners and the, the brake and performance they have, the traction they have. They run the car, it's got a higher ride height. So whenever it rains as well, the GTs are often much quicker in all of the corners than the, than the prototypes. A 22-year-old Lila Wadu brought in the 83 car as the leader in GTM. Lewis Perez compact back in for his second and final stint is in fourth place, but under real pressure from Simon Mann. Simon Mann with the yellow noseband there. He's just gone by. No, no he behind. hasn't yet. No, he's uh, cello, Simon Mann right behind and piling on the pressure, the American driver. So this is again North America versus South America. By the way, lead of this class is developing into another battle. Raul Fry went to the lead, is being uh, that, that lead being clawed back by Nico Veroni in the uh, Corvette Racing number 33. So the Iron Dame's under some pressure. Uh, eight seconds to the good. Davide Rigon, though, is uh, catching both of them in the number 54 AF Corsa car. That's the Vistajet silver and red car. Uh, so those three, and just looking at this group, uh, just dropping away from the, that trio at the moment. That is the car. Davide Rigon's car is the car that's lapping quickest in the GTM field. His last lap at 141.6. Rahul Fry, the, the leader in that class, 142.5. 41 ahead of 34. Now as the Cadillac comes through, tries to deal with both of them. So up into sixth position, Louis Della tries ahead of Albert Costa. It's not just a handsome colour. That Cadillac really looks like a nicely balanced car. They're getting the head around it, aren't they? And remember, still lots of testing to come for this team. They'll be back here at Portimao in the week after uh, the Spa race in a couple of weeks' time. Not with one car, but with all six of the Ganassi drivers yeah. to get their first European test with the, the Cadillac. Well, here again in the LMP2 battle into Europol with Prema right behind, right alongside, and a WRT rather, and then a right past, but exceeding track limits. And don't forget, in LMP2, as in GT, as in hypercar, you can exceed track limits a maximum of four times in your entire drive time, not in a stint, in your entire race per driver. And on the fifth one, you get a penalty. So. Every one of those goes chalked up against you, particularly at turn five, which is very tightly monitored. Yeah, especially when you're going for that move down the inside. I mean, look, it was a great move from Delatraz as uh, Cadillac makes its way by Yifei Ye. Oh, and opens the door for the WRT car as well. This, his teammate Antonio Felix da Costa watching. 
And Delatraz is really cashing hand over fist now, isn't he, with uh, Yiffie? And Yiffie's only been in for two or three laps. Yep. Delatraz in his second stint, so he's fully dialed into the car, to the tyre, to the track. This could be real pressure for the Chinese driver. Absolutely. Yeah, he's been fast uh, all the way through up until now, hasn't he, has yeah. uh, Yife? Yeah, but now Delatraz, it's a real test for him. Yeah, piling on the pressure. Fastest uh, lap of the car's race goes to Miguel Molina in the chasing number 50 Ferrari, 132.788. Also a quick lap coming from Fred Bakovicki. Uh, the number five sorry, Graham, Porsche. Ife, Ife got all crossed up, yeah. uh, exiting that uh, penultimate corner. He's left himself pretty vulnerable here for the attack uh, from behind with Delatraz into the slipstream he comes. And don't forget, next time out, Yiffie will be in a Porsche hypercar in two weeks in Spa. We won't just have 11 hypercars, we will have 13 hypercars in the field. Come and watch them. Come along and, and watch. Yeah, absolutely. Ticket. Anywhere in Northern Europe, tickets are definitely absolutely. available. And if you've never been to Spa, let me tell you, you will never regret it. If you've been to Spa before, then you don't need to be told you're a convert. Make a trip. If you, especially if you can't get to Le Mans, come and see the warmer because boy, it's going to be fun. Here we go. Delatraz just drills him on the inside. If he had no answer to that, he's not comfortable in the car. Act. Doesn't look like it. And uh, I think on top of that, not giving it up though. Uh, not giving it up. He won't, gonna have he won't to. do it around the outside. I think it's not going to be enough for him. Yeah. So uh, Delatraz holds on to that position. A nice move down the inside of five. And uh, I think. Uh, he's going to come under attack as well from yeah. the Interiopol at the, any moment. The pain is not over because, no. again, Albert Costa up to speed and ready to attack. He's just watched how easy Yiffy was rolled over by the WRT car. He's going to fancy a bit of that as well. I was going to say, on top of it, I think he's having to lift and coast still. I think this yeah. is Jota's game that they're playing. They're going long, so he's lifted here. It's the only thing I can imagine yeah. to allow Delachaz, who, to be fair, was very good on the brakes anyway yeah. last time around there. Um, a brilliant move. Delatraz exceeding track limits on the exit, but you saw Yiffy Yi having to open the steering because he, I'm not sure he entirely expected Delatraz to come in. Uh, second consecutive fastest lap of their race from the number, the number 50 Ferrari 132.452. Gap is coming down, albeit still a sizable 143 seconds. And behind him in third place, Kevin the Estra number six Porsche well. also setting his fastest lap. So Estragon, hey, look at me, I'm king of the walk in the Porsche team. Yeah, Ollie Jarvis too, in the lead of LMP2, puts in the fastest time of that car's race. Sorry, I'm running on board with uh, the interior of there. Just a bit of oversteer, a bit of a snap through the exit of turn three, but he's homing in on the car in front there, car 48 Jota. And I think we can go to Yifei's radio message. To hear what's going on. You there. can go six nine, Bob. I have to avoid him, otherwise, he crushed. Yeah, that's what happens in racing. Yeah, if, man, if, you yeah. let, if you leave the door open and he comes in, yes, you do have to avoid him or you'll crash. <laughs> that's that's pretty basic. The thing is, there was a significant part of his car alongside him before yeah. he committed to turning into the corner. So, you know, you, the problem's there now. You have to... That's, yeah, that, that, I just think it was a great overtake and you have to deal with it. It's not like it happened midway through the corner. It was happening as you braked into the corner. Second place, Ferrari in the pits. Miguel Molina in for service. Our next round of hypercar stops triggered by Miguel Molina coming in from second place, having just set that car's fastest race lap. And here's the car that was behind him, Kevin Est, having just set his car's fastest race lap. And in fact, Miguel Molina's stats at stationary, sector one for that Ferrari is the fastest sector one of any car, quicker than either the fastest race lap, Mike Conway on lap three, all the number eight Toyota was capable of producing. So there is no doubt that the Ferrari has got potential to be a very quick car, which for racing fans is great news. Great to have Porsche back at the top tier, you know, looking for yet another record-breaking Le Mans victory outright. But for Ferrari, it's been a 50-year wait since they last raced at the top in Le Mans. So to see that the car has got pace potential, that's really good news. It must have been a, a fascinating thing, Martin, to see that in, I guess, in your kind of late teens, uh, 50 years ago. Mid-30s, yes. yeah, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> you cheeky scamp.
Well, there's a great view in the rear view mirror, and you can tell that you're not on board a Persia because there's a rear wing visible there. Yeah, he's fighting it a little bit, isn't he? Yeah, he's also it's lost up there. Also tell it's uh, not a Persia because that rear wing's got Porsche written on it. Yeah, no, I know, but it's got a <laughs> rear wing at all. But I sense that he is on the way in. This might be Kevin Estes in lap because if the Ferrari stop, then it's very likely that the Porsche and the Toyota won't be far behind. So tense times in the pits, and that's what we like to see. Not just young drivers, but lots of new fans coming in. I'm sure that this hypercar era will bring a whole host of new addicts to endurance racing. Just two and a half minutes from halfway mark of this six hour race. Plenty to keep us engaged through this first half in all three classes. It has, though, been a pretty dominant performance from Toyota, but not this car with the problems there. Martin. And so far, we've been green all the way. Cue uh, you know, the safety I'll, car. I'll, 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 you know, <laughs> there is this now. kind of silent competition of not saying it, isn't there? No, I know. No, it's a, no I'm, I'm a firm believer in saying it doesn't make it happen. No, absolutely no. As you say it three periods. times, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, we now have uh, the 50 Ferrari has stopped. The 94 Peugeot, which is the one that was not delayed, has also made a pit stop. And the leader is in. Rio Hirakawa should stay in and should not get fresh tyres. Why are they in the passenger door? Well, That's they just not they, standard. Yeah, I mean, they, they have to give the driver a, a drinks bottle as well. And they check you know, things inside the car and you can see they're all around it clearing out all of the uh, the, the scoops the flick ups just to take some rubber away and get the aerodynamics working more efficiently but um yeah they come inside the, the driver the, the the passenger side if you like right um quite often as uh, kevin Estra comes into the pits yeah, in the number six porsche flying in but doesn't flat spot the tires that's where it's done richard westbrook Mind you, Westy was saying that he thought that the Peugeot in front of him had uh, overbraked. Now, was that a full set? If they've done left sides, would that be left sides only? I don't think that. They only tend to do full sets when they do a driver change at the same mm. time, and Rio stayed in. Um, I think they're committed to a, a oh. least. Oh, here comes the United oh, Auto Sports bought. car. Properly bought there, yeah, and it's going to cost him. That's the lead of LMP2, United versus Prema. Wow. So that is Oli Jarvis with Mirko Bortolotti. No, it's not. Right it's the 31 car. Oh, is that's it the other one? Okay. 31 and 22. Robin Fryens. Okay, Robin Fryens still having a tilt. This is the this is the battle for third between Phil Hansen and Robin yep. Fryens. There you go. But did, oh. did allow Fryens to have a good run there, didn't it? Yes, it really did. That changed the balance of power almost totally there. Number six, Porsche in the pit lane. Will Which it take tyres? They have tyres ready, but it... It's the right, is it the right side they're going to do? Or rears only, maybe. Because no, don't forget... Left side, left side. Don't that forget makes with, more the, sense. with the hybrid on the LMDH cars, like the Porsche and the Cadillac, it's driving driving the rear wheels only so there's no relief from the front tires phil hansen creeps away again from robin frines in third place so it would make sense if they just did the left hand side on the toyota yeah. as well that's why he was struggling so much on the exit of the pit lane and round turn one what a pit lane exit as well yeah, as we, we, we flagged it up before uh, before the race today saying you know watch out for that one that was why. Yeah, that is why. He was then. sort of drifting over towards the, the, the middle of the road. I mean, that, that was that was well played, to be fair, by Rio. He knew what to expect. He knew he had clearly had traffic coming up behind him. And uh, brave from the drivers coming behind him as well to throw it around the outside. Just look as we look uh, across the rear deck of the Berger at the Cadillac here, just looking down the order of what we've got at the moment, LMP2. Oliver Jarvis, a stellar career already behind him and still ahead of him uh, for uh, United Autosports. Mirko Bortolotti, a Lamborghini factory driver, I'm sure a Lamborghini hypercar programme awaits. Phil Hansen and a star in the making for United. Robin Fines and stellar stuff from him too. Louis Delatraz, Ife Albert Costa, just uh, leaving a Lamborghini factory, drive behind himself, and that's just the top seven. This is a, a good fight that we saw earlier on, wasn't it? The number two Cadillac versus the 94 Peugeot. And uh, the Cadillac clearly got the speed at this stage Bet of the him race. Up on the braking there. Yeah. 
So uh, El, El Bamber at the wheel. He, he's going to be looking for a way by, oh, hopefully, in turn one for his sake. So it just looks like a more comfortable car here. It, it, I mean, particularly than the Peugeot, but it just looks like a really raceable car, the Cadillac. So he goes a bit wider on the entry to uh, turn 14 to try and square up the exit. Now the Peugeot has a slower car in front of him, car 21. That's a GT car. That might just... Well, did he get away with that one? No, he's lost a bit of momentum there. And this is going to give Bamba the chance he was looking for into turn one. So that's why he defends on the inside. Are we going to see a cross of line on the exit? Also, we are. Earl doesn't want to be held up here because this could be his in-lap. If not this lap, he'll be in the lap after. So this is really important stuff. He's looking racy, as Neil Bamba? Good stuff here with Gustavo Menezes defending brilliantly as well. That was good into turn one, great into turn three. He's going to go to the inside slightly here to protect himself into turn five. And Bamba's going to think about crossing the line on the exit of this one. What's they can't quite like? it. They can't do it here, can they? Not he? good enough. But coming into this section of the track, he was so much faster than Peugeot in this part of the track last time around thinks about sending it on the inside of turn eight, not a traditional overtaking corner. So what are we going to do here then, Earl? You've got the speed. You've got the speed in a straight line, as we saw on the run up the hill towards turn seven. The car looks quite good on the brakes, but Menez is doing a brilliant job in placing that Peugeot in all the right spots on this very tight, twisty track here in Portimao. And that was a great run through turn 12 into 13. Nicely done from Bamba there. Yeah. So he moves up into fifth position. Don't forget, though, the Cadillac is out of sequence, half a stop out of sequence with everybody else. So that's because Richard Westbrook, at the end of the first stint, flat spotted the front tyre really heavily, coming in behind that Peugeot into the pit lane and uh, only survived half a stint before it was just vibrating his brain so much they had to stop the car and, and change the tyres. Then he did another full stint, so he's done two and a half stints in the Cadillac, but it has put it half oh. in stint out of the way. Cadillac right on I the think edge he was, there. I think he yeah. was just uh, on the limit there. It wasn't over the, the track limits, but uh, they kicked up the plank dust, didn't they? We look back at the LMP2 battle between uh, Robin Frines and Phil Hansen in the number 22 United car. Still going on for third place. United were first and second before the last round of pit stops. They're now first and third with Premier's Mirko Bortolotti in second. Going back to uh, former factory uh, drivers for Lamborghini, Mirko Bortolotti is a current one. Albert Costa, is he no longer a factory Lamborghini no. driver? He is. Or he is might no longer. he be brought back into the fold in a year's time? Is he getting some prototype experience to get him up to pace? I think that's what it's I think he'd love to be able to be. Mm. Uh, but he's at the moment, uh, he, he, he is not part of that effort as we go side by side. There's a 54 around the outside and oh, off. Oh, and a long way off. Lee uh, Battle, and he's lost a bit of car as well, the yep. 54 Ferrari. So oh, that wow. is. Davide Rigon taking the lead from Nick Veroni on Veroni's in-lap. So I'm sorry, I was talking about the Cadillac while I was reading a note from Corvette, not Caddy. If uh, if the Corvette didn't pit there, I think he would have had to be asked to let him back. back. I mean, yes. it was a good move to go around the outside, yeah. but then too way off on the exit of, 30, <laughs> of uh, 14. Proper Italian move, wasn't it? Can't overtake <laughs> off the track. <laughs> well, you can, but you shouldn't. Uh, Floyd Van Orl also in the pits at the moment. Esteban Guerrieri in uh, full service at the end of his first stint in the number four car. And again, impressed with that car. You know, it's not got a massive motor manufacturer behind it, but it was fast and, and reliable in Sebring over a really brutal racetrack, and it's been reliable and fast here as well. I'm really liking that. Well, you know, ultimately, it's got a fantastic British name behind it, Gibson. <laughs> Well, let's hear from the second place team in our race, Ferrari number 50 with Miguel Molina at the wheel. Nicholas Nelson, you've been out of the car a while now, but the 50 Ferrari is performing very well here. Yeah, so far, so good. Um, seems like we're still lagging a bit of pace to the Toyotas, but, uh, you know, maybe the, the weather, when it starts to cool down a bit, it will play into our favour, but we'll have to wait and see. You know, the guys have been doing a massive job uh, preparing the car for Sebring and, yeah, and even, you know, collecting all the data we took from Sebring and preparing the car for here. And 
I think we'd, we've done a really good step in terms of uh, race pace, which was also the goal for, for this race. So, uh, so far, so good. And uh, yeah, the car's performing well, so we can be happy at the moment. OK, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, he's driven a good race, hasn't he, uh, Nick Nielsen, in the car 50 Ferrari. Uh, strong first in. There's a bit of bickering on the radio, wasn't there? between uh, James Collado and, and Nielsen, who was the faster at the time. And uh, I think he established that later on, that he had the speed there before car 51 ran into troubles. Maybe it was because of a, an early sign of those troubles coming in. Speaking of car 51, they'll also be using more fuel. We say that they've sorted the situation by just simply turning off that front motor. They'll be using, that was filling the gap of what the fuel's now having to do, don't forget. So that, total energy that we're looking at, if we were to see that bar again, you'd be seeing that coming down faster on car 51 than all of the other hypercars, because they've got no hybrid there to, to fill that gap. Um, anywhere in the region, I've been told, up to 15% less efficient. Wow. Wow. So the troubles are very much there through to the end of the race for them. But... Antonio Giovinazzi is holding his spot in fourth place still. He's only slipped off the podium. That was right when he was like, on board trying to rehack the, the computer. He only then got passed by Kevin Est. Earl Bamber is 12 him. seconds back. He is catching him. Gustavo Menezes, by the way, on a fastest race lap in the Peugeot. So we're probably coming towards the end of the... Uh, the next round of stops for Hypercar, or to the beginning of the next round of No stops. matter what's going on with the top two or three, and, you know, I don't think we can count Giovinazzi out of that, depending on what happens to the cars ahead of him, of course. The minor placing's not done. This is interesting, Louis Delatraz, yeah. because of uh, Hansen holding up potentially Robin Freins a little bit here, it's allowed Freins' <laughs> teammate, Delatraz, to reel him in, and he looks like he's more on the attack than Freins is on Hansen. Yeah, maybe Robin just got held up by a little bit of traffic earlier in the lap, and that's allowed Louis Delatraz to latch right onto the back. Of course, then he's picking up a double toe from both cars in front of him, so on any bit of fast running, he's just getting hoovered up behind. You hear those two... Uh, WRT cars coming down towards turn one, absolutely on the rev limiter. Yeah. They're in the slipstream. There must be a bit of a tailwind down towards turn one as well. I noticed got... that earlier in the race. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. that was very well done. It was done. How's it go again? That's a soft limit. Oh, so, oh okay. <laughs> That's the hard limiter. <laughs> Brilliant. So, no, uh, you're yeah, absolutely then. right. And there is a tailwind, and, and it might be actually that the tailwind has picked up since the start of the race, because when you were on the grid, it wasn't breezy, was it? No, no, it wasn't. A, a little breeze, but not windy. It might. Uh, We've blanked our windows out so we can't see any flags, but it may well be that the wind is picking up down. And it is a tailwind because it drives from the final corner to the first corner down what it, straight. What it does mean, however, is that for one of the best overtaken spots on the tracks, we do see that overtake. Yeah. That looked a bit like a, a, a let by let there, yeah, right. for me into turn 11. Yeah. Let's see what Delatraz can do. But it, what it does mean is that into turn one, because they're on the limiter, the car's not accelerating anymore. It's taken away the chance of a, of a potential overtaking spot on the track, which turn one usually is, just from the gearing of the car. Quick lap from Il Bamba last time around, 133.510, the fastest for them in the race so far. And that closes the gap to Giovinazzi to under nine seconds now, uh, the battle for fourth position as the two WRT cars hit Maybe. the limiter. Convoy. <laughs> Just when they need another two kph to get by. That's the problem. You saw it right there. He's mm. in the slipstream and the engine can't, well, it wants to do more, but it can't. It's on the rev limiter because it is too short. Yeah. But so that wasn't seeing how feisty Freins was there uh, makes me wonder if it if it really was a, a let by or a genuine pass in turn 11. Well, even if he was asked to let him by, you know immediately what happens. What happened with Ferrari? What happened with what always happens with Toyota? Yeah. The slower car immediately speeds up. The, by the way, these three it, it are in a battle for position with the Van Wall, which is just ahead of them. Mm. Axel Jeffries in the 98 Aston is the second driver in that car to have exceeded track limits too often and picked up a drive-through. Uh, team boss Paul Dallalana, uh, who is Mr. Northwest AMR, uh, or Northwest at any rate, is uh, is the first. So Axel Jeffries just doing. It, it seems that they have a problem with that car, keeping it on the track, which the TF Sport ORT car does not. 
Right, let's see what uh, Louis Delatraz can do then. Frines has had his go at uh, Phil Hansen. We had a look in the garage earlier at WRT, and you can see Van Sen Vos leaning back in his chair, looking quite relaxed. Oh, hang oh. on, that's oh. a lot of dust. Or is that actually some work uh, that's been going on? It's yeah, a, it's a car road off road <laughs> outside. It's the, it's the yeah. media shuttle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the lock stops, as ever. Yeah. Stop <laughs> scaring us like that. <laughs> that. That was in a different postcode. That was a big, big accident. <laughs> Again, Phil Hansen might just have, I mean, he doesn't even have one kilometre an hour in top speed, does he? He is not escaping Louis Delachaz, but Robin Fries, hmm, it looks like it, another tooth on the sprocket, Anthony. Exactly. That's yeah, what it needs, isn't old it? Carting days, yeah. I, I think that Fries has just burnt his tyres up in desperation, trying to get past the 22 United car, and you sit behind in the turbulence for too long, you put an extra friction through through everything on the car, and I think he's taken a bit of a breather at this stage. Ife Ye is catching them as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of banter going on there. That's Robert Kubitzer with his helmet there on in the garage, waiting for his go. Uh, by the way, uh, eyes again on GTE Am, where Matteo Cressoni leads it for Iron Lynx in the 30 or 60 car. Uh, that will drop back when it stops from uh, Nicholas Veroni in the Corvette, which did have contact with the 54 Ferrari on its in lap. Uh, the Iron Dames car of Rahul Frey in third, but this in, uh, the 83 Ferrari now once more has Lilu Wadu aboard. So the 22 year old will be picking up the pace in that car. Oh my goodness me, look at this. This is just, what is that, seven cars all going for the same apex? They're, they're being held up by the van wall. No doubt about it now. They're being held up by the hypercar in a number of these corners. It is where the difference of where these cars produce the performance. The, the lap times aren't that different, but the van wall is significantly slower in certain parts of the circuit. Yeah, it There's, is. Now, it's not an outlap or even a second lap out of the pits. I think Gaston no, no. Guerrieri stopped about four or five laps ago, but Phil Hansen has got the headlight flashes on, and so has Louis Delatraz. I do think if it was a headwind today instead of a tailwind down and towards Turn 1, we might have seen a, an overtake by now, but he does squeeze by. They oh, took there's too much contact there. Yeah. He just got away with it, though. Somehow, we didn't see bits of carbon fibre bodywork getting flown up. Well, that's because wow. they don't have dive planes on LMP2s anymore, or they would all have been it's, flying in the air there. It's but so fragile, though. Anyway, here we go. Again, dead in the water there at low speed. I'm not sure the van wall's quite where the team wants it to be. I, it was not that slow in practice. <laughs> Again, WRT looking at the screen. No, <laughs> but what are they seeing that we're not? They're seeing their second car going down the inside into turn four. Well, I think turn they were three. seeing. I think they were seeing that Hansen got by, and then, and then that bit of contact through turn three and four. But somehow they've all managed to survive. Now Frines has found his way past as well. The battle win eleven. That was all a bit too close for comfort, wasn't it? And I think it's all because of the uh, the van will be. It must be on older tyres at this stage in the race. But the LMP2 mm. cars buzzing all around it. Yeah. Well, we, we saw this in free practice when we were watching down at turn five, is that the, quote, slower your car is, actually, the quicker you are through turn five, because you lose less of your overall performance. Well, again, Phil Hansen clinging on to third. Louis Delatraz once more in the tow, starting to try and hoover his way back up onto the tail of the United Autosports car. And... Delatraz is absolutely going at this all arms and elbows, isn't he? Like, he Great. just closes right on Hansen. So I don't know if Phil is having a little bit more lift and coast. Meanwhile, the 51 Ferrari in fourth place, Antonio Giovanazzi. Let's hear what the team have got to say. Mate, I don't know how you're doing it, but you are. Keep it up. You're closing to the Porsche. Think to stiffen the front roll bar for oversteer. You see, that is... Having the mental capacity to drive at this speed is something that would strain any normal human being beyond a, a reason. But then having the spare capacity to deal with all the other lunatics on track is another factor. And then having to hack into the software and the hardware of the car while you're doing it and, and keep adjusting things. That's why you guys, Anthony, are a whole different caliber to people who just drive cars. You're amazing. <laughs>
we, we can do one thing right. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> <laughs> spent a whole lifetime doing it. We are into the second half of race two of the FIA World Endurance Championship in Portimao. Again, uh, no chance of rain here, hopefully, today. So the race continues to be run at a breathneck speed. The single healthy Toyota car number eight leads. As we see another car break for the pit lane, that is into Europol's Albert Costa comes in from sixth position, the car that was in fourth place on the grid. They've had a bit of an up and down race. Uh, another fastest lap of their race for the Cadillac. It's a 133.253. Again, closes the gap to Antonio Giovinazzi. Agree with what the uh, the Ferrari team are telling him, by the way, which is that gap to uh, Kevin Estra is coming down, but the gap to Earl Bamber is coming down more quickly. Yeah. But the Caddy is closing on the Ferrari, and the Ferrari is closing on the Porsche. We have four different brands in the top four in the top five, and it could get even more entertaining. Midway stage, race two of the World Endurance Championship here in Portimao. Beautiful sunshine to welcome everybody onto the grid and to welcome spectators for the first time in World Endurance to this Portuguese circuit when we made our debut here in 2021. It was tumbleweed. 93 Peugeot had to start from the pit lane after power steering issues this morning. They will start two laps down as Toyota locked out the front row of the grid, but right from the get-go, the Ferraris were angling to find a way through to try and blunt Toyota's challenge and straight away moved up into second place. There was contact behind, 94 Peugeot getting a nudge and eased off. Cadillac went out wide as well, trying to avoid damage from the number five Porsche. And it wasn't long before Toyota were back in 1-2. However, in LMP2, there was all sorts of touches. United Autosport running into the back of Vector. And in GT, it was a very quick run into the lead for Ferrari, but not before a little bit of paint was swapped on the run down to turn one. Ferrari being deposed as Toyota went back to 1-2 and started to ease away from the field. But there was a Porsche in a Ferrari sandwich for a while. And then the second of the Ferraris moved up to make it 3-4 for the Scuderia. In LMP2, the predicted front runners were right at the front. Jota and the likes of United Autosport in GTE. The battle for pole position had been between the pink Porsche and the yellow Corvette and the battle for second place remained in that mould. Peugeot being caught by Cadillac towards the end of the second stint as the number seven Toyota was eased back into the garage having to change a sensor and losing six laps. Ferrari in the ascendancy in GTE Am. They have led the class for most of the race, but it is touch and go with the Porsche and the Corvette. In LMP2, it is anybody's guess. Prema, WRT, United, into Europol, and Jota all struggling for supremacy. Right now, GTE Am is led by the Corvette of Nicholas Veroni, LMP2 by United Autosports car number 23, which led at the midway stage in Sebring, and Toyota number eight leads the race overall. Its gap is comfortably getting towards a minute, but behind, there are four other manufacturers looking for a spot on the podium. Yeah, back to live and on pit road at the moment, the number two Cadillac having closed that gap to the Ferrari ahead. Now drops back behind the 94 because, of course, they're off strategy. Yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons why it was closing in, because it was further down its tank of fuel and therefore lighter than the rivals ahead of it. But again, when they stop, then it will move back up into that top three squabble. So we've got Toyota, Ferrari, Porsche, Ferrari, then another car with the Peugeot. So we have genuine podium challenges from five hypercar manufacturers, which is fantastic news. United Autosports with a tenuous lead of just about four seconds from Prema. And in GTE Am, it is Corvette from Iron Dames 
from the Richard Mill Racing team. Lila Wadu already back up to third place for Richard Mill Racing. And again, the 19-year-old, a 22-year-old in that car doing a fantastic first stint to bring it from fifth to the lead. She's doing a great job in the second stint as well. Yeah, she's going head to head at the moment, trying to take time out of Rahel Fry, the flag carrier for female talent uh, for, what, three years now yeah. in this championship. And uh, that's a good marker for Lili Wadu. Yeah, and of course, uh, an ex-DTM racer for Audi, Rahul Frey. So she's got plenty of experience, lots of single-seater experience as well, and lots in GTs now. And that Iron Dames, Iron Lynx package, of course, will be running the hypercar program for Lamborghini next year when the uh, raging bull comes along to dance with the prancing horse and all the other yeah. animal. Rahel, by the way, closing in reasonably quickly at the moment on Nico Verona, who yeah. leads that GTM class. So it's under two seconds for the lead, and then a little way back, 20 seconds back for the Richard Mill AF Corsa car. And Lila Wadu in that Richard Mill car, just setting that car's fastest lap of the race. So she's quicker than the Lila Wadu previous <laughs> fastest lap. So she's, she's having an epic time here. Next year, what? Uh, Lilu was uh, K. Was she did she the LMS run? last year? Uh, no, she no. wasn't. She, she wasn't. So she has raced here. Yeah. I've seen her here uh, win a race in a little Renault Alpine Cup car, which I think was the series run by Signatech that turned the heads of uh, the guys that got her into that P2 car last year. Yeah. Switch is now with the Richard Mille brand uh, to GTM and is again a bit of a head turner in terms of the performance. And again, you know, with all age on her side, just 22 years old, Dorian Pan for Prima, only 19 yeah. still, you know, young racing drivers getting into this kind of caliber of, of competition at world championship level is just fantastic. You know, the youth is always important in sport and, and we've got a lot of impressive young talent all the way up and down this field. Yeah, Oli Jarvis by the way on pit lane from the lead in the LMP2 class. Mirko Bortolotti follows him in as well or has in fact preceded him in from second place. Thumbs up from Suzuki Nakajima there. There's the 23 car on its way. Uh, was that the end of a double for Ollie? It didn't look like there was a driver change, but we only no. really saw the lollipop disappear. He, uh, I think he's only done a single stint at this point in the race. Right he now, was, and he was the third one in. And again, now that cycles Phil Hansen in 22 back to the top of the pile. Reasonable pit stop from United, a minute and 16 seconds on pit lane. So that sounds like full service, does it not? Uh, just looking. Didn't look, didn't look like a tyre. Well, we didn't see enough of it to know whether there was a tyre stop or a driver change. Oli Jarvis remains in the car. So it's Phil Hansen who leads for United now by 2.3 seconds from Yiffy Yi in the 48 Jota car. Oli Jarvis third, Mirko Bottolotti fourth, ahead of his, well, former uh, factory Lamborghini teammate Albert Costa, who is fifth for Inter Europol, and Robert Kubica in now at WRT, as is Ferdy Habsburg. So it was all change in WRT during their pit stops. Completely correct, by the way, that was the end of Oli Jarvis's first stint aboard the car. He comes out in third before the rest of the pit stop cycle. Whoa! With the Hertz. Ooh, hello. And uh, those are the moves in traffic that you have to make, Anthony Davidson, to, to stay in front. Yeah, I mean, you learn. The, the, the good places you can overtake and where you can trust uh, the other drivers as well. This is getting a bit tasty, isn't it, between uh, yeah. Bortolotti and uh, Oli Jarvis. And both in their second stint. So although Jarvis yeah. stopped a lap later, he's not on cold, cold tyres. They may have lost a few degrees, but he's still got the grip just enough to hang on ahead of Bortolotti. Yeah. On the absolute attack here, as we're seeing on the bottom left screen there, Hansen out and yeah. Hanley in. This is in for the lead. 22. That cycles the 48 back again through on that fuel save from the very start of the race for Antonio Felix de Costa. Meanwhile, problems for the 51 Ferrari. Maybe, maybe. The team manager has been asked to report to the race director, Absolutely. so it may be that, like the uh, 
seven Toyota, there is something in the FIA mandated sensors that is not entirely uh, appropriate. Well, didn't need to go to the race director, uh, Toyota, for that one. That was an immediate warning directly uh, mm. to the car. Uh, so let's wait and see what happens here. It's unlikely to be the case that it's just Eduardo feeling lonely. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. Well, maybe he's found that the espresso machine in race control isn't up to snuff, and he's asked the Ferrari race director, <laughs> Ferrari director, to come along with an espresso. But maybe, uh, it's, maybe that also seems unlikely. But uh, yeah, that car has had some troubles uh, with the braking system. Number seven being examined underneath by the mechanics as uh, Mike Conway, I think, will take. No, no, no um, Jose Maria Lopez should stay yep. in, shouldn't he? Yeah, he stayed in. He's got a busy three weeks, uh, Jose Maria Lopez. Uh, he goes straight from here to Barcelona to make his debut in the European Le Series, where he's going to be a full season factor this year. Moving up the ladder. Absolutely. And then back again, of course, the following week for to the start. second, the third round rather yeah. than the FIWC. That'll make his head spin. Yeah. Hypercar to P2, back to hypercar. <laughs> of course, multiple World Touring Car champion as well, three time World Touring Car champion. Uh, Hello, Car 10, that's Vector Sport. Team manager being asked to answer the call on Discord, which is the uh, platform that is used by Race Control to talk to everybody. Out goes the 48 car. There was no driver change, so Yiffy Yi stays in. And in this Hertz team, by the way, as he is a Porsche Asia Motorsport driver, and as a result is a, a Porsche factory driver, so he is in this lineup. Uh, in preparation for the hypercar arriving for Spa. Uh, yeah, he is the uh, Porsche Motorsport Asia Pacific nominated driver, yep. so he's their retained uh, driver and will become the first Chinese driver, I believe. I'm trying to think if Hope and Tongue ever drove in LMP1. I don't think he did. P2 for Jackie Chan, DC Racing, but I don't recall P1. No, I think you're right. Will Ant Davidson be the first ex-Jota driver to slip behind the wheel of a hypercar? Are they going to let you sit in it no. in the garage? In <laughs> no, he's already said, no, it's not happening. It will happen. And if it's not you, it'll have to be me. Let's hear from WRT's Louis Delatraz. Trans, you brought the 41 WRT in. There was some great racing going on, even between the two WRTs. Yeah, thank you. It was, uh, it was good. I mean, we had a, a difficult start. We struggled all weekend for place. And it uh, seems like we've definitely improved the car, and, uh, and we were fast right now. So we came back. I gave everything I could. Had a lot of fun with, uh, with overtakes. And yeah, we had a bit of a fighting with the sister car. And I have to say, Robin let me by, which, uh, yeah, thank you to him, because it was, was nice. I was quicker at that moment, but also he was quicker before. So we tried to be smart and, uh, and don't uh, lose time together. And uh, it seemed to be traffic definitely holding some of you guys up. Um, how frustrating is that? Uh, frustrating, oh, yeah, it is frustrating, but uh, traffic is part of, uh, of endurance racing. And I think a good driver in endurance is, is good in traffic. And uh, yeah, we have to push through it, and that's like it is. Same for everyone. All right, thank you. Thank you. That answered yep. your question from earlier on, didn't it, Martin? How do you get through that? How do you trust those drivers you're going through? Like he just said, when you've been doing it a long time, and uh, that's the most important message. Of, to dinner. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, most important <laughs> message of the weekend. Uh, but yeah, when you've been when you've been doing it, and, and you get in a rhythm of where you can, where you can't overtake, where it's risky, where it's not risky. You even sit down with your teammates before a race to say, right, I don't want to see any of you overtaking a car into this corner or that corner because I know that's a 10 out of 10 risk moment. You say, yes, okay, we agree not to overtake there. Uh, you have your strategy plan as a driver where you're going to take risk and where you're not. How quickly do you forget that plan? Oh, no, you no, you, you don't, unless, and it, and it alters, uh, depending on, say, like now, car eight out there in front, yep. miles in the lead over, yeah, what is it, 59 seconds now. And so there is no need to be taking risks through traffic. You will bring it back down to, a, you know, like a, a one out of 10 risk. You, yep. you really take your time. You, you can afford to do that. But if you're fighting your way through or fighting another car and it's towards the end of the race, you will ramp that up. Uh, this is a growing battle here for third place. Kevin Estro being reeled in by what we still think is so a somewhat hobbled 51 Ferrari. So a remarkable job being done here by Antonio Giovinazzi. We wait to find out, if indeed we do find out, 
why the team manager of the 51 car has been called for race control, but for the time being, we'll call it as we see it. And other than the uh, little whoopsie in traffic there with the 56 car, uh, the 51 car through now and clear. And if, it's, if he's got the pace here, it's going to close this gap again to Kevin Est. I wonder if they've been able to sort something out with a hybrid system on that 51 Ferrari, because just under braking there, I could hear a bit more regen going on yep. than earlier on in the race. So here, the high-pitched whine is it now. I wonder if he's on power, if it comes in again. We're not staying with the onboard long enough to hear the car go over that magic 150 km an hour mark where they can start to deploy. But certainly under the braking, it's, it's, it's gaining some energy back there in the system. Well, the other part of this is this is still a very, very, very new car. They're learning as they go, as problems actually arrive. They're learning how to deal with them in, in rapid, uh, rapid succession. Sorry to have had two years of that. So Toyota, the experienced hypercar team, uh, have dealt with more or less every and any uh, issue that could be thrown in the car. Uh, energy right on the ragged edge of this car must be due in any moment now. So Giovinazzi we're here is changing switches for all he's worth behind the wheel of that 51 Ferrari and uh, you can see on the right hand side of your screen the energy bar going lower and lower. What would be interesting is to see that compared to other cars around him in the hypercar, see how much more fuel they're using because they're not deploying as much, if any, hybrid energy. And you can just hear it's like it's trying to kick in every now and again. Yeah. It's certainly harvesting stuff yeah. under the braking, but it, it's not deploying anywhere near as much. So maybe he's now in the process where he's recharging a bit of energy, getting that sock level higher, that yes. state of charge level higher, so that then he can use a bit more energy later on. That would explain why he's up and down on switches all the time. He, he's playing this like a... Like a well-tuned like violin. Like a, like a violin, yeah. Impressive stuff from Joe Benassi. But, you know, these, these F1 drivers, ex-F1 drivers, they've got hybrid cars as well. He would be more than used to this yes. juggling of switches on the steering with this extra capacity that you have to have to drive with, as well as doing fast lap times. Porsche nicely gets out of the way there as he exits the pits through that's turn the, two. That's the 86 car, the GR Racing car. That was nicely done. You got the Alpine as well. Got overtaken into turn one. So, yeah, I mean, it's still got some pace. And look at that. There we go. There's the graphic I wanted to see. 2%. 51 Ferrari, of course, at 2% left. Everyone else around him well over 50%. Yeah. And that's what your hybrid does for you. It's, it's filling that gap of what the fuel would usually do. So it's a long road home, but at the moment, an impressive run against the odds here from Giovinazzi. If there's one factor, aside from safety, that there's been absolutely astonishing progress in the last decade, decade and a half, it is reliability of all these systems. Yeah. And the systems only get more complex. I mean this kind of issue would have been a race stopper yeah, back, you know, exactly when, when hybrid first came out, it's 2012, the first year when Toyota rocked up on the scene with their hybrid Toyota, it, it would have failed by now. Something would have, it would have been a catastrophic failure, end of, end of play, car in the garage or in the barrier somewhere. But now they're able to massage these problems. We're going to see him peel off into the pits here because of that 2% energy left and the fuel goes into the car, and that's the only energy you've got. <laughs> <laughs> You're down to one source, my friend. One source, yeah. Look at the others, 74% for Cadillac. They're out of sync with the rest of them. 37% for the race leader. Very different story. The one question I guess I've got here, and I need to check, uh, I know certainly in the Epsom Brothers X Sports Car Championship, the fuel tanks are oversized. You'll never use a full tank of fuel uh, in GTP for this virtual fuel tank reason. Can they compensate by putting more fuel in the car? That is a very good question. Let's see how long this stop is. And uh, 
where that energy level goes up to once it's reset. Because the, the rule book doesn't care whether you use the electrical energy, it's the energy. That's why we have that energy bar. It's not fuel. Exactly. No, absolutely right. And it's not just purely hybrid energy. That That is, like we said, it's a, a combination of the two. Yep. And I wonder whether or not that's an adjustment they can make here. It does mean systems aren't op operating at an optimum level. But aren't you always refilling your car to maximum? No, you don't no. have to. In a hypercar? You don't have to. No, because you're only I allowed mean, you, a you certain amount. You yeah. never have to. You could well, just well, you could do a splash I mean, and dash and sit in the camera. I remembering what my friend and colleague, Marshall Pruitt, um, explained to me in a 110-litre tank in a GTP car. I believe. Now, the question is whether Ferrari have built a tank bigger than they that's need the point. for the total that's, that's, amount that's of energy. That's my question, and I, I don't know the answer. Um, so I'll drop it a note to our friends at Ferrari, now, and they'll be able to tell me. Because, sure it, because me in GTP, you have a standard 50-horsepower hybrid package that everybody uses, and then everybody's motor is different, you have to have a, a maximum... <sighs> fuel capacity that allows everybody's motor to be different. In a bespoke car, like the Ferrari, uh, a, you know, they, will have, they will have designed it to carry not yeah. one single ounce more than it's ever going to need in a stint. Well, Antonio Giovinazzi has been working his watsits off in the Ferrari. He's now with Louise Beckett in the pit lane, so the hard work never stops. Antonio, we know that there's problems with the car. We've been hearing the team radio. You have been working so hard during that stint. Just explain to people what you were doing as well as driving. Yeah, I think uh, since lap one, we had um, already felt the pedal quite long, and then we had an issue with the BBW. So I, I was not just driving. I was, uh, you know, using the steering, all the buttons to try to to react and uh, and to finish the to stint. We did it, but it uh, was a really hard. One of the hardest of my career, I would say. Uh, a lot of uh, radio, radio communication, uh, and it was also really hard. So, yeah, really happy for one side, but uh, we are thinking still fighting for the podium. So we need to, you know, keep uh, keep pushing and try to, to be there. Well done. That was great for you. Thank you very much. If they do make it to a podium, that was either way an heroic stint from him. This uh, is what I love about endurance racing, though. Yes. It, is, it really is a test of man, woman and machine. And it's just, can you get that thing back home? Like we saw in Bahrain last year with a number 51 Ferrari. Yes. With oh, yes, gear yes. Oh, yes. Can they make it? Can, what can you do as a driver? <laughs> what can you do as a team? You've got to bring this car home. That is the true test and, of and endurance. That, and that gearbox was literally a bag of spanners, was. wasn't it? I mean, it was, it was just, it, it was, was a, dropping it out of the car. It was a brick and a tumble drive, it wasn't was, it? It really was. was. And it was. getting it to the end meant winning the championship, and they managed to get it to the end. And sometimes, somehow, you drag a recalcitrant, recalcitrant car all the way to the line, and that's what it's about. Never, ever give up. I can remember very early on in the LMP 100 days, you gave a brilliant interview to talk about the mental acuity it needed at the point at which those systems were not as automated. You remember that? Mm. Um, that, yeah. that really spoke to the kind of the workload in that car. It, to be blunt, meant that certain drivers decided they didn't want to do that anymore and, and walked away from that. But that, that was the start of something different, wasn't it? And that where you weren't just driving the car as quickly as you could. I mean, luckily, I was used to that from the F1 testing days I did back in the traction control era. We had automatic gearboxes as well, and you could tune or decide where you wanted the gears to be downshifting automatically or not, and, and by how many. And Jacques could have been there as well during that time at BAR. He was race driver, I was test driver, and uh, he was one of those drivers that always liked to fully automatic gearbox, both up and down at all times. And the gearbox is amazing. Then that got banned. Traction control got banned. Uh, as well going forward, but what it gave me as a driver was that experience to lean on and it really came in useful when I got to drive a hybrid car in, in the World Endurance Championship um, because it gave me that extra capacity you needed as a driver to, like Giovinazzi has just been doing. Yeah, I mean, the flip side was I remember at, uh, I think, the prologue test some years later at Paul Ricard sitting down and chatting to Alex Wurtz, who'd been brought in for a day testing the car after not dri uh, driving for about 18 months, one of the drivers was not available, and telling us 
how long it just took his brain to catch up. I remember that day when he stepped back yeah. in. Yeah, he, With, his eyes were like saucers. Yeah. <laughs> and he, and he <laughs> said that it, it was that by that stage, the systems had been advanced enough that a lot of the things you've been dealing with kind of manually were automated, but you still needed the driver input to save all the time. Well, we were doing it autopilot by the end of it. Yep. It's like jumping in the road car you know so well, yep. and uh, you know where all the buttons are, or, you know, turning your, the AC up and down, or retuning the radio station that you want. You know how to do it, it's all intuitive. For the first time you drive that car, or yep. the, when you drive, a, uh, say, like a hire car, or something, someone else's car, you, it's full concentration, isn't it, before you know you would dare touch anything else. And that's what we're going through. But here's the point. Unless I finally state put one of my daughter's terrible CDs in the in the player, I'm not making that many adjustments to skipping tracks. How many adjustments on a racing lap back then? Well, I mean, it, uh, to be fair, most of your adjustments were, were done through the testing. Oh, that's a bit, uh, a bit of a moment there under the brake in the GT yeah. car holding up. Who's at the wheel of that GT at the moment in that... Uh, I'm not sure, but that's a vector sport car, oh, the that they, were, car. they were trying to go round. And that's sorry, it's not 21. It's a Matthias 21. Kaiser in the vector car. Yeah, of course, that's Simon Mann in the 21 car. Yeah. Well, he, yeah. He's doing a good job trying to keep his nose clean in the top three, but Matthias Kaiser was having to go try and go by, and then the hypercars were trying to go by at the same time. So, yeah, three different classes, one piece of tarmac. This is and, and for, for sixth position, by the way, and between the five and the 51. And different categories of drivers as well. It's not it's not just different cars out there. It's because we've been saying all day long that the GTs are really good on the brakes into turn five. And then suddenly there could be an AM driver behind the wheel uh, of one of the GTs. And they're braking a bit earlier than you would have expected. And yeah, that's, uh, that's how you can easily cause a chain reaction. Michael Christensen watching Kevin Esch in the number six Porsche that's currently lying in third place ahead of Gustavo Menezes. And then this battle as well, Cadillac and Porsche, Porsche and Ferrari. Lots of big names. Actually, it was really interesting, that shot we had of the Ferrari pit stop. Lots of fans in red, red hats and red shirts, leaning over the top of the grandstand watching. It's, it's amazing. I'm, I'm sure that having Ferrari in the World Championship is going to continue to accelerate interest. I'm sure we're going to get big crowds as we always do at Spa. I'm sure we're going to get enormous crowds at Monza as well. Who doesn't want to go and watch Ferrari race in the World Championship at Monza? Absolutely. In Italy, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great boost for the championship and it just brings another big name. You know, when you're racing for a factory like Porsche or Cadillac or, you know, coming with Lamborghini, whatever, when you've got names like Ferrari on the grid, you really know you're in a proper race with no disrespect to Toyota because they have been such a great benchmark. Yeah, they've been racing at Le Mans for more than three decades and, of course, recently so successfully. But Ferrari is just a special name in motor racing. In, in, in automotive worlds, it's just such a special name. And can you, can you imagine being these GT drivers, having gone through the testing and, the, you know, and, the, and then eventually six GT drivers from a pool of eight drivers that Ferrari put together going, yes, here's a, here's a ticket, amazing. here's the golden ticket. Amazing. I mean, fantastic for them and, and, uh, and a great opportunity to really be part of Ferrari history in a really major way. You know, if you look at what a number of these hypercar teams have opted to do, both here in the World Championship and also in North America, uh, uh, opting to trust the, the <laughs> talent they've got in their talent pool, mm. many of whom have had major single-seater experience. Boca Bottolotti is another great example of that, isn't he? Yep. Um, but beyond that, GT programmes, maybe something like Formula E as well. Yep. But all of a sudden, it's given an opportunity for professional motorsport to come straight back up again. Yeah, this great a, battle, this. It is a great battle, isn't it? Again, Porsche versus Ferrari. You know, this is what people pay big money to come and see. The two most successful manufacturers at Le Mans, and they're back. Pierre Guidi, car 51, nursing that car around, and he's got Fred Makowiki in the car five, Porsche. And yeah, Fred Macko a... was an occasional driver last year in the Porsches, wasn't he? Whereas Alessandro Pierre Guidi and James Collado, three-time GTE World Champions, the last ever GTE World Champions. Let's hear from okay, Alan. Okay, mate, let's not get caught in the trap, though. He is going to be stopping soon. Let's, we can't kill these tires. We're going to try and go for a double, okay? 
Yeah, how much of that message do you think Pierre Guidi actually listened to? <laughs> <laughs> Probably heard the words "yeah" and "okay." I mean, no, he's he is he is he's a very Italian Italian, but he doesn't drive like an Italian Italian. He's got a very clinical, mechanical brain right until the last lap of the race. But, but he, yeah, he knows what the plan is, and he knows that just by having a wild lunge, they may not end up on the podium. But yeah. this car. The 51 still has potential. I mean, look at it. Here's the eight catching them to lap them, by the way. The yeah. eight is closing in here. These two drivers, when Fred Makovicki, I think the first time I saw him race was something like 2004 in a Dodge Viper yeah. in Bahrain. Um, and then Alessandro Pierguidi, who's just matured massively in the last half a decade. He was wild, raw speed, but wild. Um, when he first came to GT racing. I remember... Well, that was a mistake there from right, Makowicki. Yes, Big mistake under the brakes, oh. and he's left himself a bit open here. Cuts back across on the run-up towards Turn 7. And you may remember uh, a spin at the start of the Spa 24 Hours when he was driving a GT car in front of the entire pack on lap one and missed by everybody. Right, running on board now with uh, Rio Hirokawa car eight in the lead. He sort of doesn't where need to quicker. challenge this, does it? Oh, Pierre Guidi goes for a bit of a gap that opened up in middle of turn 10, 11, but uh, just, I'm intrigued to see where the Toyota is faster than uh, than these two in front of him, because, I mean, before the Toyota arrived on the scene, yeah. they looked so fast, didn't they, these two cars? I mean, the hypercars, the fastest cars out there, and then the Toyota just just drifts up behind them. I sort of wonder, he doesn't really need to do much about this, does he? He can certainly no. afford to wait. He's got a, a huge 70-second lead now. Well, his team will also know that the Porsche is due to pit, so that's one of these two's cars out of the way. They're doing 135s. His yep. best laps are 133s, so he might lose 32. 10 or 20 seconds yep. if he has to sit behind them for 10 laps. Yeah but he's still got over a minute on the field. Well, he's still doing 134 now. He's, yeah. he's, he's, he's quicker coming to the, to the rear of these cars. He's going to lap no slow, slower than they are lapping. Right, this could be his opportunity now, Pierre Guidi. I mean, I know his engineer said, let's not get caught by the trap, but he's, he's in the turbulent air, too much friction going through those tires, and I just feel like he'd be in a more comfortable position if he's just ahead of that Porsche. And also, hot air going in through the brake yeah. cooling ducts. We know the brakes are a potential you know, soft spot, weak link there, so he wants to keep that laminar airflow to keep the brakes cool. Well, you say, if you're the engineer, you say either you drop back to save the car more, mm. or, or you do actually try and get by. I think All we can right. actually well, hear from... let's hear. <laughs> he's got a laconic race engineer. Let's see what he's got to say. If you can wait, if I don't know if this guy, the race is over. That's a no, the race is not over. You'll get around him when they stop. You'll get around him when they stop. We are faster. We have to make the double work or we have no chance. See, crystal clear communication. I, I, I have to go, I have to go, or we've lost it. No. Wait the till he gets. Makes the move this time, but the yeah. inside is let go by Pierre Greedy. Gives himself room to breathe. Wait I like, the, it. I like the engineer of the car 51. Yeah. Do, do you know his name? Or not? I, I, no, I asked Ferrari, and they said, we're not going to tell you the names of the engineers. Really? Yeah. Yeah, no, genuinely. I think and, I know who they, it is. And they also said they may not be the same engineers on the same cars all season all the time. long. Okay. Car, yeah. car 83 uh, reported with an open door. Policy. So Toyota Gazoo Racing lead as we approach the final two hours here, and they have now lapped the entire field bar, the top three. Two hours, ten minutes remain in Portimao in Portugal. Race two of the FIA World Endurance Championship. Toyota number eight from Toyota Gazoo Racing, Rio Hirokawa, keeping the pressure up. He has lapped everybody except the cars on the podium. In second place, Miguel Molina in the number 50A, of course, a Ferrari. And in third place for Penske Motorsport is Kevin Esch in the Porsche 963. The Peugeot in fourth place now. The 94 car has been lapped, but is having a strong race ahead of Earl Bamba's Cadillac and Fred Macko and Alessandro Pierre Guidi. And, uh, <laughs> late, late, late to late dive bomb there down into turn one. Did not go well for whichever of the two Jotas that was. 
can't tell. At least next time, one of them will look like a Porsche and the other one will be an LMP2, so we've got a fighting chance. Yeah, confirmed, by the way. Uh, the, the voice we're hearing is the voice I thought I was hearing. Justin Taylor, it is, ex-Audi. Uh -huh. I think then was with Rebellion uh, for a short while uh, in their last uh, encounters with the F1 World Endurance Championship, but uh, the American voice you're hearing with the calm Alessandro Calm tone uh, was uh, was Justin Taylor. He's highly experienced, highly successful. And, and, and actually, that's the sort of voice that you... Re and we hear so often on the radio, it's just calm, considered, there's no drama, here we go. Trying to take the place back from the Toyota. Oh, and, and this Ferrari, by the way, is the one that's struggling with less braking than it would expect to normally have. So, Alessandro Pueguidi. Now he lets it go. Now the Porsche let him go, but he let mm. him go in an odd place. That's put him under risk here from the 51 car. And that's why Pierre Guidi was so intent on being with the Toyota down into the hairpin at turn five. Did he get it's the other Toyota. It's, it's, it's the other Toyota. It's the other Toyota. It's number seven. seven. Okay. And that car not yet in the points. And. OK, it's only one car failure away from being in the top 10, but it's actually the entire LMP2 field is still ahead of the number uh, seven Toyota. So they don't have to let him pass. They won't be getting any blue flags like they did before when it was the car eight behind them. So now Pierre Guidi tries to get around the outside. I don't think it's going to be getting given the room there. No, no of course, right. the door was firmly shut in your face. Do you not get a blue flag if there is a faster car behind you? The blue flag is just a warning there is a faster car behind you. This isn't Formula One. It's not move over and let him through. No, it's, it's the same rule. It's, it's a lapped car is coming out. It's lapping you. So you get the got blue flag. Has he got him here? He's alongside. Yes, he has. Big breaking look at the the, the, no, the, the dust. Can he stop? Can he stop? He yes, can. he can. Hang on a minute, this is the Ferrari that hasn't got front brakes. Yeah, but, or but hasn't got as hang much on front a minute, brake. Though. He hasn't got as much front brake, but is, the, is it damage that he's now doing to those brakes? Well, that's well, the thing his engineer was pointing out, wasn't it? Just look, we are, in terms of the, the strategy, we're going to get past him. We are quicker. Look at the difference, though. He's immediately pulled out from the Porsche. He was partly right as well. The problem for Alessandro Pierre Guidi is twofold. He doesn't want to overstress the front of the car, but he doesn't want to lose a lot of time behind the Porsche. And, and the engineers will have seen the lap times, and they will know that he was being held up by the Porsche. Porsche seems to be stretching the fuel a long way. Has they been doing more lifting and coasting, perhaps? So, uh, look, now just the Toyota's working hard to get by, and a 54 Ferrari. 54. Uh, so who's I think in the wheel of 54? The Thomas Floor. I think that's just recovered from a spin. Yeah, that had all the hallmarks recovering from a spin. He's not on an outlap, so he's just uh, either had a mistake on his own or in traffic. It's traffic and... It's the United oh. Autosports car. Whichever one of those ones it was, it's the 22. This is what happened from uh, on board the... Ooh. Well, yeah. you, you can see there the ID screen on the right-hand side, blue flag, LMP behind you. So he knew that that was coming, but he didn't give it enough room to come around the outside. Yeah, I can't blame the, the LMP2 car no, in that I can't, situation. Then. But, um, yeah, it's, it's like we said earlier on, you're asking a lot from the AM drivers to have that spatial awareness, despite mm. having the warnings as well on the dash. You know, their eyes are on stalks trying to keep... Two laps to go, guess. <laughs> It wouldn't be a bad idea to do a steering wheel change. Is the situation bad? It's just flickering non-stop. I can see, but it's flickering non-stop. All right, well, that shouldn't cost them more than a few seconds in a pit stop, you would hope, because these cars are built to be serviceable. What Gus Menezes is saying is basically this, the, the steering wheel, which is a, a huge display, is just strobing at him, and it's very distracting. So he's in fourth place at the moment. Um, challenging the Peugeot, uh, challenging the Porsche for the podium and trying to hold off the Cadillac and the Ferrari Porsche battle behind him. So right now, Peugeot having about their best race with this hypercar and if that hasn't cursed it, then nothing will. We've actually got six of the hypercars together in a group, but two groups, three groups of two on different laps. Well, he's 
on an in lap either now or the next lap you could see that the team are ready for the 94 car to come in and you can see he's down uh, to one percent on the ometer yeah and in fact the number five porsche has still got nine percent and the number six porsche has still got six percent so i think alessandro pierre guidi probably was right to make that pass because he had a, he, the, the, the porsche wasn't coming in in a hurry no it's going to be quite busy uh, on pit lane with hypercar action mm. Uh, shortly four or five of them during the next couple of laps here, but uh, it's one two three four five six of them Look in the slow motion shot. I've not noticed it before how much of a Red Bull rake the the Peugeot has got with that qu quite nose down stance and of course current for our uh, current the Formula One cars also full ground effect cars Whereas if you're generating your aerodynamics from the top surfaces, you're trying to keep it level normally. That's Rahel Frey, is that at the end of her, nearly at the end of her run? It's a very uncharacteristic looping spin from her. Driver change, out gets Gustavo Menezes, takes his seat. Steering wheel's still on at the mm. moment. Are they going to do that when the next driver gets in, I wonder? Because now's the time to do it, when you're going to have to change all four tyres as well. Yeah. That's, that would definitely be the best time, whether they are ready to do it or whether they think it needs doing. And Louise is down nearby and cannot see a steering wheel ready. Ferrari in as well. This is at the 50 car from second place. So this is not a battle. Toyota must be in this lap as well. Only 1% left in Rio Hirakawa's energy allocation. So watching this, by the way, that spin from Rahel Fry has put a right in the sights. Uh, it's closed the gap for second place in GTM to around four seconds with Lilo Wadu, who's made great strides again in this Toyota. first second stint. Race leader is in, car number eight. And look at that graphic. The uh, Ferrari 51's already only at 63% energy left. Number seven, Toyota harassing the Porsche. Trying to find a way through. Yeah, 51 Ferrari is just burning fuel, isn't it? Or burning energy. So they clearly cannot overfill it with fuel compared to what it would normally take. Because your hybrid power and your eternal combustion power can only add up to a maximum amount of energy per stint. And that means that if you're not getting the energy from the hybrid, then you are just burning fuel with your internal combustion engine. You're burning it at a greater rate, as in a road car. If you don't have a hybrid, you burn fuel all the time. If you have hybrid, it alleviates some of that fuel. It's burn. like taking a hybrid road car onto a motorway. Yeah. Basically, that's what Ferrari are just doing now. You, you, the hybrid's just redundant. It's not doing yeah. anything anymore. And you're just carrying that weight around for, for nothing. Well, it goes to the number eight car. The car up. 148 laps, Brendan Hartley now will start lap 149. And they've had, I'm afraid to say, they've had a bigger advantage than what I thought they would ever have here in, in race trim. Oh, it's oh. the trouble for the five. That is Fred Vakovicki. And is this his in-lap? It is his in-lap. Yeah, he's look still at the energy four, bar. He's still got 4% energy, though, on the, on the graphic on the, on the main board. He's pulling off this. That. <clears throat> is he going to make it to the pit lane? It's pretty much all downhill from this part. Until you get to the bottom, then you have yeah. to climb up the hill to get... So he's not, now he's lifting and coasting. This is Louise Beckett in neutral down the hills. And this now here the, comes uh, the climb up towards the pit lane entry. What has he got? I do wonder if this is fuel, you know? Now remember, these cars cannot run um, on... Let me get this right. Electric only. No, they can't. They can't run if the hybrid system isn't working. There's no alternator on the car. Ooh. All right, well, the number six... Porsche is in from second. Its tank is full, as you can see, up to 100%. 50 Ferrari goes back in front. Five has made pit lane. Yeah. So at least even if he stops here, the mechanics can go and pick over the car. Correct. Yeah. There, there he goes. goes. Yeah. There he goes. Drives past. Boomph. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. There was not much left uh, to manoeuvre with, was there? That, the one thing I'm not sure is just how parallel he was there. There you go. That was well, it, now, it doesn't matter, actually, no, no, because the teams not have the other all car. been rehearsing, moving the cars in. I saw Peugeot deliberately in an empty pit lane with cars parked at angles, so they rehearsed running out with the dollies, getting it up, moving it round, dropping it back down, and then then you start with the fuel and so on. So they, they are rehearsing that because that is definitely going to be a fact of life, not just in the World Endurance Championship, but even more especially at Le Mans. So if nothing else happens this car during the service, then uh, we know it was just the fuel running out. Michael Christensen climbs aboard, Danish driver. But they usually do a full service and then if there is a, a big problem, they'll put then them they'll on, the, on the trolley and then they'll mm -hmm. wheel it into the, the back of the garage. Here comes the Cadillac up into third again. Remember, this is off strategy, Earl Bamba. He's now 10 seconds back from the number 50 Ferrari. And beginning into so, hearing from Louise that the Porsche is going to go straight back out. So it did look like it was just out of fuel. Yep. Spinning the wheels up on the apron is no longer a penalizable offense because uh, with the coal tires, it's all Probably impossible to get these away without a, a an IndyCar style push start without spinning the wheels. I'm just trying to work out what that means. It did say 2% energy remaining. It said four. Four remaining. So either they didn't get all the fuel in the tank, or something's wrong with the hybrid. Or it's not able to use all of the fuel Maybe. in the tank. Yep, okay. Well, there's Kevin Escher debriefing with the crew. He's explaining there, you can see visually how it, he's moving his arms around. He's describing snappiness of, of the rear end. Mm. And that's what I've been seeing with this car the whole way through this weekend. Actually, we saw it in Sebring as well on yep. older tyres, particularly there. And um, that's one weakness I'd say they've got in that car is mid-corner and the slow speed, particularly it's the rear is just snapping on the driver and you're having to have those lightning quick reactions on the wheel to, to compensate. Little doubt in my mind, by the way, what's going on at the moment for Cadillac. Uh, as I say, on a completely different strategy after being forced into that tyre stop after the big lock-up for Richard Westbrook earlier. They're going to be looking to take track position and put Ferrari under pressure at this point. Now that car in third place, that's its highest appearance in the race Correct. so far. Now, again, they are out of sequence, but previously they've been coming back up to fifth. Yep back up to fourth, yep. now up to third, and that indicates that the pace of the car is still extremely good and very consistent. Last lap for Earl Bamba, 135.23, compared to 135.95 for the race-leading Toyota. Yes, traffic, yada, 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 but the Cadillac is currently as quick as, as, as the Ferrari and quicker than the Porsche. And the other thing here is, we talk about the cars being off strategy, it may not necessarily, depending on what happens in the next two hours, mm. be a bad thing. Depends what happens. We've had a full green race for four hours and four minutes so far. And none of the hypercars have gone more than an hour on fuel, which means it's not a full set of stops. There's always going to be a need yep. for a partial stop at the end. Caddy have just done their partial stop at the beginning. If it stays green, it could work for them. Kevin Estra has just stepped out of the number six Porsche Penske. Uh, how is this Portimao going for you? You're talking a lot to the team and to your teammates. So what are you feeling back? Ah, it's a tough race. It's very hot. It's a lot hotter than it's been this week. So the track temp has been higher and the tire um, tire degradation is different. Um, it's it's a very strategic race at the moment because no 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 yellow, no focus yellow, nothing. So you have to be fast on a green lap pace, be constant, and make sure that you have fuel to the end. I think we might see some some fuel saving out there uh, to to make it a no splash at the end so we'll see if we, we are better than our competitors but uh, so far i think we've done a, the per perfect race for for the performance we have in the car right now and quite happy with what we've done let's see uh, now the last two hours with andre you've just said the forbidden word to me safety car no safety car and no full course yellow yeah well let's see i think i think it, it has been very clean also in traffic for me a lot easier than sebring not so much i think people getting used to the the flow and the class uh, difference in terms of pace. 
and it's a European track with a bit wider and everything. Um, so fingers crossed, but uh, but I think uh, well, you are never you know you're never safe. But I think uh, so far everybody has done a good race, uh, not uh, not being in trouble. All right, thank That's you. Thank you. Pretty decent summary, I'd say, there for Kevin Oates. It has actually been a pretty clean race, considering how tough this track is to pass on. Zero <laughs> full course yellows, zero safety cars. Yep. It's a good point yeah. he made, actually, about um, this being the second race in the championship and that you've gone through that teething trouble, those issues that you had, learning the new cars that have arrived in the hypercar series, uh, category this year and the reduction of speed, further reduction of speed at LMP2s. Um, you've now just got the GT AM category. The pros are no longer there. So he's saying, look, now we're all finding our way a bit more. And it's a wider circuit, a, a European track, grade one, FYA safety standard circuit with bigger runoff than Sebring. Uh, you know, we're all finding our way a bit more and it seems a bit easier. Yeah, I hadn't, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it's some one thing you think of when you're racing, but you step away from it and it's it's easy to forget that yeah you get in such a rhythm of those different categories and the performance of the cars from race to race and you all learn together you all have to share the track together and have you noticed how many fewer track limits notifications we're now. getting now than in the first hour or two everybody's really got their head around it corvette are in from the lead this will be a driver change double stint to start from Ben Keating, double stint now from Nicholas Veroni. They are now going to release the Katzberg. So he will take over that car from what was the race lead. The Iron Dames will cycle to the top ahead of Richard Mill and the two AF Corsa cars, 21 and 54. So he's, oh, Nicky Katzberg is only just getting to work now since he was sat here with us in the commentary box. Mate, I, I, I can't tell you how lazy he is. He said himself he's on holiday. <laughs> he really has been. Listen, his whole life is a holiday. He is a hard-working <laughs> driver, but it always feels like he's on holiday when you're around him. Into the final two hours in Portimao. Race two of the FIA World Endurance Championship. So far, Toyota has led every lap. The number eight car remains healthy after number seven had a sensor issue that they had to deal with and have dropped out of the points there. The 11th and last running hypercar currently, for the first time, not going to score points. Antonio Felix da Costa is about to be released. Anthony Davidson, everybody's starting to bring out their big guns for the final two hours. Uh, you're always do but um, that was a difficult stint wasn't it for Yifei Ye he, he, he had a much better performance in Sebring I felt and now it's time for Felix da Costa to try to uh, rectify that yeah uh, pit stops underway up and down the field this was the uh, the lead car at the moment in LMP2 because uh, yeah, again I, I was going to say he did bring it in from the lead <laughs> but, but this is the car that's been cycling oh, up and it's down not real, it's because, not real because of Antonio Felix da Costa's fuel saving in the first part yes. of this race yeah. um, also uh, noteworthy by the way uh, Jack Villeneuve has just joined the race uh, in the Van Wall uh, but down in 19th and actually that means Ooh. that the number 7 Toyota is up into 10th Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So that's, that's the first place. Stop. So that is a long stop for the panel. That's a real shame. Two minutes, 17 seconds. That is a real shame. So, uh, yeah, Jacques Villeneuve has been sitting. Actually, I was, I was, we were looking at a shot of him sitting there in the back of the, of the garage a little earlier on. I thought, I wonder if that's what his dad would have looked like <laughs> in later. No, but, but you do, don't you? Yeah. Because, like, you know, because he increasingly, you look at Damon Hill, and when he was young, I really never saw much a reflection of Graham. I'm, I'm sure Betty did, but I, I never really. But now you look at Damon Hill and the Graham Hill that I remember, not the young, or, you know, the, the, the pictures you see more of, not the young, but the middle aged yes, yes. Damon Hill. Damon really, really echoes Graham enormously. I, and I'm sure that Jacques does. Gilles, I'm, I'm sure that, that, you know, that family strong resemblance is, is enormously strong. I remember the, the, the most airy moment um, at Silverstone, sitting there doing some work in the press room and uh, a couple of guests joined us in the press room, one of whom was Mike Newton from RML at mm. the very successful LMP2. Uh, squad, and then and, he was talking. Still successfully driving both indeed, of his uh, MG EXs, <laughs> and uh, chatting then to Mike Oliver, was then chatting to the guy who was with him, 
Uh, my head must have gone around like an owl because it was James Hunt. Oh, it wasn't. No. It was Freddie Hunt. Oh, I know. It's, and he sounds so like his father. Oh, oh trouble uh, for the Van Wall. Van Wall, yeah. That's Jack oh, Villeneuve's yeah. outlap. That is his outlap. Oh, oh dear. Final corner. Didn't this happen to him at Sebring as well? Was he not the one that was sent out with the car that was just about to die? Uh, he got hit, didn't he? Or oh, somebody got hit in that car in the rear by one of the Peugeots. The, uh, no, the trouble at... Um, uh, trouble at the Van Wall Mill at um, Sebring was there's that's Colin. Oh, oh dear, Colin. Hey. Well, that, actually, that's really disappointing for this team because you know they will have sweated buckets to get this car built, designed, and everything else. And you know, there are racers, they want to race. Trouble for Floyd Van Wall now. It looks as though Control Alt Delete might have worked for Jacques Villeneuve. But that then rather worryingly means he's just starting a stint with a car that has decided it doesn't want to just start a stint and we're into the final two hours of this race. I'm surprised to see him not just bring it straight into the pits as well. So they uh -huh. must be confident that it can just, like you say, that after that reset, that it's now all things are fine. Unless he knows what finger trouble it was. We have had it Maybe. before where some pretty illustrious drivers have managed to switch the car off. I can remember that happening at least one once to an Audi uh, in a WC race. It's happened. Uh, having said, we've had very few notifications of track limits. All three of the LMP2 cars in that last shot at Turn 5 meandered way out wide there, no, not even remotely approaching staying off just, the curves. Just have a visual kind of image now of Eduardo Freitas just throwing the papers up in the air <laughs> and giving up. It does tend to happen, though, in, in this yeah. series of racing that, that, you know, they're very strict on track limits during qualifying. There's a zero tolerance policy in qualifying and then it's very strict at the start of the race and then it just sort of peters out and you see people exploiting that more and more as the no, race goes no, particularly no, no. when races get dark no. uh, this one won't today but in longer endurance races that does definitely happen lisa the assistant race director is absolutely not letting anybody get away with one micron of that old nonsense on the outside of the 48 for the number nine is this going to get it's got more than well, but didn't get close because he drove off into <laughs> Spain, basically. Yeah, he, he certainly left the Algarve there briefly. This is the Inter Europol car back down to eighth position now, and it is uh, Fabio Scherer back at the wheel, so he continues to try and bring that car back up to where it was. It was it was a factor in qualifying. They ended up fourth on the grid. They then got biffed at the start and have struggled to get themselves back to that sort of position again. Okay. I re but going back to that move with, um, who, who was that? Was the nine. Uh, ben Biscal, wasn't yes. it? In the number nine Premier against uh, Felix Costa. Really don't agree with what happened there in turn five. He overtook him off the track. It was a good move down the inside for De Costa. And, uh, or maybe he was defending position. I didn't quite see it beforehand, but either way, number nine overtook him off the track. Well, let's hear what's been going on with Jacques Villeneuve in the number four Van Wall. He's been on the radio with the team. Well, Jacques, if you want a safe, safe place, you're going to stop on track and forward cycle. Safe place, stop on track and forward cycle. Uh, a little easier if I stop with a bit high. I'm almost here. You want me to turn off the car and stop on the track, yeah? Yes, completely stop. Completely gone in a safe place, otherwise, we have to do with the mid-lane. Uh, okay, so what afflicted uh, it clearly has not completely gone away. Uh, now, Area 51, which is the safe place for hybrid cars, is just around this part of the track, yeah. actually, but it, he he doesn't really want to do that. No, what he, he wants to do is just is. pull over onto some concrete. Well, yeah, I'm not sure that's going to impress race control. Mm. We know we've got a problem, stop on track. I think that was a message from you think before, that was before it that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just it was information for what, okay, had, what yeah. had already happened. Yeah. It's not that he's going to stop again and, and do the same thing. Well, so I think just looking at the circuit map, he's yeah now gone through car number four. He's gone through the final corner. Seems to be four racing speed. This is a good little tussle, isn't it? Uh, hopefully, yeah. it develops further. Danny Fiat in the lead car in uh, oh sorry in in P2. Uh, in the LMP2 category, and you got uh, Ben Hanley behind him yep. in the uh, 22 United. I'm keeping an eye, by the way, and you're quite right about this one. Danny Kvyat, as we were saying a little earlier in the show, named this week as a Lamborghini uh, hypercar factory driver for next year. 
uh, but also closing, closing, closing. Earl Bamba now six and a half seconds back from Tony Thoroko for second place. Well, there's 23 from United Autosports. That is the race leader in LMP2. Now, don't forget, they led maybe halfway into the race in Sebring, and then the car was stopped by a short circuit as the camera work inside uh, failed to remain where it should have done. So they were denied victory. They would love, I'm sure, to take a win here. Gerd van der Gaard is part of the crew because Philippe Albuquerque who was, uh, will be with the team for most of the season, was in Long Beach yesterday, put the Acura on pole, and they very nearly won the race. But uh, United Autosports first and third at the moment. No power steering, no power steering. Copy, no power steering, stand by. Oh dear. So that's a, caller. So uh, that's a hydraulic trouble. power steering system in that car. And, Is it? Uh, okay. I wonder if it's going to start affecting other other components as well like the gearbox it would be a hydraulic assisted shift this is the driver yeah seventh place car and this car is coming to the pit lane problem is when you lose hydraulic assistance in these cars these days it's not just your you're down to a mechanical system you're having to push the fluid through the hydraulics yeah. as well yourself and it becomes impossible. near impossible you're, you're fighting to drive. it, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, it, it, it doesn't remove some of the assistance, it just doubles the load. Yeah. Team manager's car 41 to race director immediately, we've seen pop up on our screens. Yeah, that's Team WRT's fourth place car, Robert Kabitza. What's happened there? This uh, is going to be a race that's going to be determined. Uh, they misidentified a red and white <laughs> car that went way off track to uh, gain a position. Uh, Watching for the dollies here. Dollies are out. Dollies are, well, they were out, then they put them back. That might be another little points glimmer for the number seven Toyota team. Don't forget, they've already got into the points because the van wall has dropped behind them. Uh, and so although it is in 18th overall and the Glickenhaus is in 9th overall, if this Porsche stops and loses four laps, then suddenly, boink, the Toyota moves up another spot and the Van does as well. They must be confident that they believe they can fix this quickly, otherwise that would be in the garage. Yeah. Uh, incident involving cars 48 and number 9 at turn 5 is under investigation, by the way. Well, that, it, that, that it, up. It could well be the not giving the place back despite taking it off the track. It could be. Yeah. Now, the, the, the problem with that is if he's too far ahead of 48, telling him to give the place back is going to be tough. How far ahead is he? 1.1 seconds. So actually, that if they make the decision early enough and nobody pits and, and so on and so forth, then that should be fairly easy to do. Well, all the bodywork goes back on to the Porsche, but it's up in the air, and that suggests that it may be going back into the pits. Yes, it's up in the air. Are they waiting for the dollies? Yes, they are. Yeah. It was not a quick fix. So I think perhaps it was a ch uh, uh, an eyes on. Is this a... No, it's not. Okay. Bad news for the LMP2 class leader. Number 23 gets five seconds added to the next pit stop for a pit stop infringement. Wow. And their lead... 4.6 seconds. Well, that's unlike United Autosport, isn't, isn't it? There? Just so, what has gone wrong there, race director? Information to pit lane. Information to pit lane. Car 23 will have five seconds added to its next pit stop for a pit stop infringement. Car 23 will have five seconds added to the next pit stop for a pit stop infringement. So that will. Uh, mean they well it's, uh, they're literally just coming through to complete the lap 5.021 uh, seconds is the gap it's going to be very tight indeed now it's not a five second stop and go so it is five just seconds a added. longer pit stop correct but it means that if they come in as they are now five seconds apart they will go out together now it was a, a possibly a discourteous pit entry or exit they may have swept across somebody or come in a long way through somebody else's pit or something it's a minor infringement so it, it's not a full 35 40 second drive through no. but here again van der Gaard again may well be inheriting somebody else's penalty but the reality here is if you look at the top what is it four four cars and is that trouble for the seven uh, that is, box, is trouble for the seven. It's stopped dead in the blend lane. And that's, and that's nowhere near nowhere the near. end of the pit lane. Because they are right at the end, aren't they? So yeah. uh, what has happened Well, they're here? always pit in or pit out, aren't they, TGR? So, so Kobayashi. 
interesting so to hear from him. No sooner are they handed points than the wheels fall off the wagon again. Oh, it's Riviera, it's Riviera, it's Riviera. Okay, stop the car, stop the car and power cycle. Yeah, I lost power, everything, suddenly. Uh oh. Now, oh, okay, so he's right. All right. So, my my real worry is there is what we do not need in the blend lane, right in the middle of the pit lane, is a red car. By which I mean, we're not certain that the the high voltage electrics are safe. Yeah. R red car is a very very serious problem in the modern hybrid era. Completely agree. By the way, for those of you who remember the clash between car 54, the Ferrari, and they got spun around, and the car 22 uh, at turn, uh, penultimate mm. corner, turn 14, no further action. So they saw that just as a racing incident. I think, I think 22 might be a little bit aggrieved that there's... Because they got properly clattered. Anyway. <laughs> Nothing happened to their car, but, yeah, they did get well, clattered. I, I, but... Fortunately, because they got yeah. clattered in the side, not in a, in exactly. a wheel. Yeah, that yeah. could have been a wheel off the car. Uh, however, they go, I mean, the uh, penalty for the 23, you saw uh, Gary Roberts will put his hands on his head in the, in the uh, pit wall going, oh, OK. You know, we've taken four hours to eke out five seconds, and now it's just disappeared in a moment. This is GTE the Am, the battle for the lead. No, battle for the battle second. For second, rather. This is, this is now Michel Gatting holding off, mm -hmm. barely, Alessia Rivera, team yeah. that used to run Ferraris, now in Porsche, being caught by the team that very much runs Ferraris. So, Alessio Rivera in for the first time, taking over from Lilu Wadu, and Michelle Gatting also took over at the last stop from Rahel Fry. So, she's in for the first time as well. So, they should be on a, a fairly even strategy, and the Toyota number seven has dropped behind the van wall. I was about again. to say exactly that. But, so, Toyota but, has just dropped out of the points. It is, it is touch and go, isn't it, for uh, them? But if the Toyota gets out and it does, it's about to overhaul the number five Porsche, it's dropping down. Yeah. So, all of a sudden, attrition. Yeah, so the number five Porsche within two minutes will drop out of the points and both Van Wall and Toyota will be back in. There's a good reason why they use Portimao as an endurance test circuit. But what they need it's to do... It's a car killer. Yes. What they need to do is pay another 20 teams to come and do the same thing at the same time. So, <laughs> you, so you've got the traffic. Can you imagine racing this place through the night? Well, you know what? There's almost a plan there, isn't there? Which is you'd speak to one of the big GT... Uh, uh, championships and say, do you want a free winter race? Yes. Look at this. As long is as this going to be side by side in the final corner? It is. Side by each. Oh, the this is close. The they did well to get through there without contact. That's that was crazy stuff. Racing. Oh, Excellent look at this. Michelle Gatting going, come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. She got a good ride out of the final corner, but Lesia Rivera, he's on the inside line. And he's late on the brakes as well. Ooh, he's made it. He's, he's going to run wide. I know, no, he's, he's got it. He's... Yeah, he's but has well he though? OK, yeah, down to three, done. she's going to die for him. No, she doesn't. The van wall is there. Jacques Villeneuve, no, it's not, it's the Peugeot. Oh, that, was, that was really classy stuff. So Rivera was uh, teammates to Nick Nilsson last yeah. year, it's wasn't he? He's a Ferrari factory driver. Yeah. 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 And LMP2 champion, multiple yep. LMP2 champion. LMP2 pole sitter. Yeah. Absolute yep. precision between the two of them, really. Hats off to them both. Big respect. Yeah, I, and actually, especially to Michelle Gatting, because she's, she's not that kind of calibre of factory driver yet. Uh, so 14 seconds back, by the way, for Nikki Katzberg, that pair. And uh, just checking, the, the, around the same kind of pace. Yep. Well, there this is Rahel, Rahel Frey. She doesn't actually look like she's been in the car. No. Nope. That's what she looks like before. Outrageous. She's, she, how has she not got helmet hair? I mean, even Anthony Davidson got helmet hair. Jacques Villeneuve probably gets helmet yes, hair. Mate. All I can say is, I can say one word, product. Oh, product. Oh, yeah, no, that's very true. The hair game is strong. Uh, Corvette Racing leading, though, again. Richard Mill Racing team up to second place, and that gap, 14 seconds and, and 95 minutes to go. Here's a replay of the move, Anthony. Yeah, it's fantastic stuff. So you ease it back as far to the racing line as you can, but you had to be late on the brakes, as we saw earlier on, didn't we, in the LMP2 fight. If you give it a bit too much leeway, you'll just drive around the outside of you and turn in. <laughs> High five. Is that sticky down there? 
I think so. Uh, our cameraman rather than the environment. Uh, Corvette Racing lead from Richard Mille and Iron Dames. And three Ferraris in the top five. It's definitely not over. It might be over in terms of points for the number five Penske Porsche. So Roger Penske with both sides of the racing coin this weekend. Yesterday, a last lap lunge from the Acura did not deny Porsche its first win with a, uh, a GTP car, as they are in IMSA in Long Beach. But today, uh, they are having trouble with both their cars and major trouble with the number five machine. But again, you've got to break these things to make sure that they'll survive Le Mans. It's a good fight here developing Stuwell. Continuing on, isn't it, with the car nine, car 48, mm -hmm. Ben Viscal, Antonio Vizzi Costa, and also joining the fray is Fabio Scherer in the Inter Europol car number 34. But remember, on slightly different pet strategies here, because of the, the just the, the advantage eked out on lap numbers by De Costa earlier, so they the 48 will move up this field as the others pit uh, ahead of it. We assume it will, as uh, that little dummy there that De Costa played oh, on Ben yes. almost paid off because there was a lock-up and then desperation trying to get on power on the exit, a big snap of oversteer. So uh, De Costa's starting to. Uh, get into this and he wants his position back that was in his eyes I'm sure wrongly taken on the exit of turn five. Worth mentioning by the way with uh, what, just over 90 minutes to go Ferrari back to second and third there's Dorian Pan uh, gone back to the Iron Dames garage here so moved across from the Prima uh, racing pit box to uh, friends and colleagues at Iron Dames. She is part of the Iron Dames programme, of course, yeah, and very much. Rahel Fright, not only is she the nominated gold-ranked driver, but she's very much the team coordinator for the girls uh, across all of their programmes, not just in sports car racing, GT racing as well, of course, um, but also across in uh, some of the work they do with young single-seater racers. Let's just see if we can stay on board with Costa down towards Turn 1. How far is he lifting coasting? No, we've just gone to the off-board shot. And we just want to see, is he continuing on this uh, trend that he was doing in the first stint, where we clearly saw that he was going further than anybody else, and that comes through just saving so much fuel by lifting coasting. And, and don't forget, we heard from Kevin Esch that that the Porsche team are definitely trying to close the gap yeah. between the end of the race and the end of the fuel. So they're trying to eke it out enough to avoid a splash. And, and definitely if Jota can get closer to that, was it in Sebring? Was it in Sebring? Or I think he of one of the races last year where suddenly, wait, wait, who was he in the Sebring? They didn't have to stop. It was Jota. Yeah. It was Jota. And they didn't have to stop. And everybody else was peeling in, you know, one to go, three to go, whatever. A classic US fuel race. Yeah, it, that was when uh, you'll remember the Prima car surprised us by needing a late splash. Mm. Um, and that handed the advantage to Hertz Team Jota. So we just saw Will Stevens in the garage there, and uh, he was one of the trio that uh, were very light footed indeed through the 10 hours. Right, so uh, there's one man Eight around times. this circuit you would never want to be too close in your rear view mirrors, and that's Antonio Felix da Costa. <laughs> Give him an inch, he's going to take a mile. So you've got a Porsche in front here before the final corner. This is going to play into things, so you're going to have to lift off earlier here and lose a bit of momentum through that corner. But somehow, Ben Viscal has got away with it for now. But look, he's got, it's the Ferrari has got the yeah. good run on them both. He'll but clear Fis them both here. Viscal had to take a much tighter line and a better slingshot. And here comes the Costa. Oh, yeah. He's done it anyway. Following the Ferrari. Uh, did, got, the, got a little bit of slipstream, I think, there, but did a brilliant job there. Wonderful stuff from Tello Felix da Costa. But Viscal had to come much tighter out of the final corner, so less momentum onto the straight. Antonio had enough of a slingshot to tuck up behind the Ferrari. And Viscal sees He's the danger, but he's helpless. That was a good move from De Costa. He really had to fire it in there. Uh, you can see how much Viscal pushed it on the entry because yeah. he was well off track limits on the exit of turn one. So he oh. took it as far, well, beyond what he, the car was capable of doing. And he's lost another place oh, yeah, as a result. Hasn't he? Into so Europol jumped up past him. All of a sudden found himself in a whole world of not able to break in time pain 
Well, part of that is he ran out wide, and so the tyres would have been covered in marbles coming down to five. The thing's not stopping. Nice. That but was a good move. It yeah. was. And Fabio Scherer was good. As soon as Fabio Scherer saw him run off wide at one, he went, great, I'm having him. He's had a brilliant weekend, Fabio Scherer. Yeah. He, he, he's often fast around this circuit. He was two years ago as well. He's and, often uh, fast around everywhere. He's a, he's a puckered driver. This is back in the Porsche garage, isn't it? It is. Power steering, remember, the issue here. While well, we're watching this and uh, watching the 28 car this time, and that is a battle. No, it's not a battle on track, or is it? It is with the 36 car. Yeah, with Manessi has a look down the inside here. Is he going to make a move? No, 28's just got it covered for now. But that got very close. I've just thought of another Grand Prix driving relation. Who's that, then? Fittipaldi. Well, that's not the son, though, is it? Grandson. Yeah. Graham doesn't look impressed. Oh. <laughs> he is... It, but has he been punched in the face by Nelson Piquet? <laughs> <laughs> Who hasn't? <laughs> who, who among us has <laughs> not? <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Uh, on, on pit lane, the 708 uh, from Glickenhouse <laughs> Racing. Mark Briscoe. Where did that come from? <laughs> 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 I don't know the history here. This, this sounds good. Uh, Ryan Briscoe... Uh, Brought it in for Glickenhaus. Now, does he stay in the car or does he go back out? I think it's Ryan's first into the car, so I, I assume he will stay in and, and maybe to the end. Yeah, so Pietro Fittipaldi made his debut, didn't he, in the Dallara chassis. Um, then had a big accident at Spa, went straight on uh, from Eau Rouge into the tyre wall. Broke a leg, an ankle, which effectively put him out for the rest of the season. Ben Hanley was his teammate then with Henrik Hedman in the... Uh, what was the team, Graham? Sorry? Henrik Hedman. I'm, I'm going to Dragon say... Speed. Dragon Speed, thank you. I was going to say Alpine still, Stars, but still no, Still the only right. team I think to have won the LMP2 race in the European Le Mans Series in this round the WC. Oh, OK. So Pietro Filipaldi. Hanging on ahead of Charles Malesi. Malesi, you assume from the move this year, will likely be part of the Alpine hypercar program next year as well. And that's going to be a, a great boost for him as well. Anyone interested to see what uh, Yifei Ye was looking at on the laptop? All those pretty colours, like rainbow colours, they are basically is telling him he's looking at the driver stints yeah. everyone in lmp2 all of the driver stints uh that you look at the average lap time per stint uh it's it's, it's like it's like your bible it's what you go to to see how you performed in your stint compared to not just your teammates but everybody else as well in the same category and he was studying that one very hard Let's get down to the Porsche garage with Louise Beckett, see if we can find out exactly how far they've dug into this problem. As Carretta, you've been overseeing everything that's been going on with the number five. Can you give us a review of everything that's happened to the car? We actually had a... We faced some problems since quite a while with the power steering, and then uh, the pro problem became bigger and bigger. So now what we do is changing the power steering and the control unit to it. It takes, unfortunately, a little bit of time. Frustrating, but do you think the number six is safe from these issues? Yeah, that's really frustrating for us, but we keep on fighting with the number six, obviously. The number five car will be pretty much out of it. It takes quite a lot of time to change it. All right, thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a disappointment yeah. for Penske Porsche Motorsport, but they still have one dog in the fight, and in the end, only one car can win the race or can finish... Well, I suppose two cars can finish on the podium, but... Well, they'll also Still be using chance. this as an opportunity to just hone those repairs. Yep. It's, it, you know, we've seen this before. It was, uh, where was it with the Peugeot? It was, t it was at uh, Fuji, wasn't it? Yeah. Same problem. Oh, and at Monza. One was 42 minutes, the yep. other was 12. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's things that you don't do in the workshop. You strip the cars, you rebuild the cars, you life the components and change them in and out, but you don't fix things that aren't broken, if you know what I mean. But in the races, you often have to fix things that aren't broken. 51 Ferrari is in. It's still not smoking broken, away. but, yeah, a bit, a bit broken. Those front brakes still... Yeah. Oh, look at that. <laughs> I was going to say that. 
<laughs> Timing of... <laughs> yeah, OK, yeah. yeah. Might not be... The, I was just about to say, might not be looking as bad as they once were. But, <laughs> now, traditionally... They really are. Traditionally, we would say that's brake dust, by which we mean it's actually the friction material from the yes. pad. That was actually the dust that was once brakes. Yes. That is, <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is the carbon rotors yes. wearing away at an unprecedented... I mean, and that right front tyre, good grief. How's he going to make it through to the end? I mean, we see yeah. brake changes quite often in his cars Watch. around Le Mans. But this again. Oh, oh crazy. dear me. I mean, that's not... Fr well, it is friction material as well, but it is, it is brake rotors. Let's hear from the Jota team. What have 48 got to say? Ten laps to go. We have to up the 6.8. So ten laps on the stint to go. And... and what, what was the 6.8 about, Ant? That is 6.8 seconds back from the yeah. Ferdi Habsburg. Oh, OK. But uh, remember, this car keeps cycling back to the lead in the class. Yep. As the others are ahead of it pit, it's going to come down to, does this race go full green? And in which case, who's got what at the end of that final yeah. stint? Who outfumbles the the others the best? And this is it is going to be, you know, the final five minutes to the buzzer, isn't it? Who who scores the last basket? Um, ben Hanley in third, attacking Premier's Danny Kvyat still, but also, you know, the others won't be unaware of the fact that the 48 car is gradually creeping away. What they will also be not unaware of is it doesn't matter. Yes, lovely to win, but in the end, more important to take maximum points. So ignore what 48 is doing and stop looking at them and then focus on what your others are doing in terms of pace and fuel safety. Is that front tyres only for that Ferrari? Because that was a remarkably quick pit stop. It's 1 minute 16 seconds. It might have been, but you know what? I was just too put off by the uh, front dust. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't see. Coughing and spluttering. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I think it was front only. Well, I think one, you're right. So 116 uh, on the pit lane. To compare that with the last pit stop for the lead car, that was a 133 for a full service yeah. stop. Well, more accurately, let's compare it with the 50 Ferrari, uh, and it's... Uh, 128, it, yeah. 15 seconds. 128, yeah. 12 seconds, rather. So a 128, 130 is a regulation yes. four tyre stop. Yes, 15 so, seconds. Yeah, so it's either they can't fill the tank, which isn't right, because, I mean, I know it's running shorter and it will run a lot shorter each time, but then that looked like fronts only. And if you're struggling with brakes and yep. you might be starting to lock them up a lot more often, but the other thing is, if you then start putting fronts only, you can put fresher tyres on the front and help balance the braking against the, the more tired tyres on the back. What's well, not but a brilliant day, by the way, for the number seven Toto. It's just got a tiny bit better. They're now ahead again of the Van War, but got up into ninth, of course, now, not tenth, yeah. because of the troubles for the number five Porsche. This gap's continuing to close, isn't it? It See is. The, the experienced hands of Ben Hanley in, uh, in LMP2. He's been in this category for, I don't know, longer than I can remember, actually, but he's been... Oh, I'm to think the amount of laps he's done around this particular circuit. I Definitely think... more than Danny Kvyat's done, just put it that way. I think he started in 16. I think he just slightly predates the current formula. I think he used to race in a 05 Orica. Yeah. Here's the Vector Lo Sport team. Lo lovely lad, Ben Hanley. Really quietly spoken, but, boy, he can pedal a really car. Really fast. Yeah. Former Renault development driver when they sort of had a Formula One program that they were promoting people to, but yeah, very quick. Um, yeah, speaks softly, carries a big stick. And that car closing in still from behind on the second place. So United looking to reinstate themselves as one, two. And don't forget, for the 22 crew, 23 scored no point in Sebring, so 22 are the points leaders coming in here. Doesn't matter what 48 does, even if they win the race, they don't score any points because they don't exist uh, in terms of point scoring. So 22 right now is looking to claim maximum points, but they have got to get ahead somehow of the Prema car. And then we see who's done the better job with fuel between them and 23. 23 have had sort of the upper hand for most of the race in LMP2. Uh, just a bit of a moment, actually. I'm, I'm oh, hoping you? that both of my children are listening because I've Is just it checked. Is rage? No, I've just checked uh, Ben Hanley. I was completely right. Uh, so for, for once, I was right. <laughs>
Well, it's the second time you've been right today, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the bang on with the Toyota earlier on. I'm a dad. I have children and I know things. There you go. Yeah. I don't know much, but I know some things. Yeah. So... So... Kvyat actually just maintaining the gap there, isn't it? I mean, it sort of you, you goes up a little bit by a tenth here or there. Here Hanley's... comes a chance for Ben Hanley. Where's the Cadillac going to catch him? Alex Lynn at the wheel of the caddy, by the way, for the rest of the race. I think the problem is for Hanley is that he's now in the turbulent air. Mm. So they're so evenly matched in lap times. He's chipped away, chipped away at it, just a couple of tenths here and there, and he's got to within that zone where it is really problematic. Oh, which Ferrari is that, the number eight car? Is that about... Is he about to put a lap on second place. No, yeah. Yes, yes, he is. is. One minute yes, thirty-three. He is. Good well grief! Spotted. They are dominant here, aren't they? Well, the number eight is. Uh, you know, well, Toyota that's is a, the performance uh, of the car. Absolutely, Toyota yeah. is a unit, not. Let's have a look at board and see where that uh, where the deficit is. It's interesting, isn't it? There's one healthy Toyota, one healthy Porsche, one healthy Ferrari. Yeah. Well, one yeah. healthy Cadillac. Yes. <laughs> of one. One healthy Peugeot. One, one undelayed Peugeot. Yes. No, but, but in this race, Correct. and I think we can count the outlap as a race, it has had an issue. So each of the manufacturers, except Cadillac, have had a mechanical issue. Correct. On a car. Cadillac wouldn't have a car in the race if they had a mechanical issue because they've only got the one at the moment. But it comes. Of here course, it is. You, he's you going to lap the entire field. And this you is... never want to go to a lap down, do you, in, in this endurance racing? Because there we go. If you have a safety car, of course, you can claw back all of that deficit and be right on the oh, tail again. Oh, joking, oh, joking, is, joking aside, though, this 28 uh, Jota car on pit lane. Toyota won an eight hour race by two laps. Yeah, OK. We're an hour and 18 minutes away from the end of a six-hour race. If nothing else, on pace, this is an improvement. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I feel that all of the other manufacturers, and they are, they're going to continue to, to improve at a stratospheric race, yes. right, because so far they've run these cars in one race, now they've doubled their racing knowledge of the car. Well, it, and again, the teams, you know, we talked about the fact that half of the Penske Porsche team that was in Sebring weren't there at all during any testing or even Porsche employees. So they're learning, the drivers are learning, it's a new bag of tricks, it's a brand new toy, and Absolutely. they're learning every, every lap that they run. And again, to reiterate this point, the rule book basically is pretty simple, mm -hmm. but it basically says if you've got to have those four aspects of the car that have got to be within a quite narrow window. Yep. They've effectively got, you know, uh, if you look at it this way, you've got a box of Lego and a completely different box of Lego, but it weighs about the same. There's a little bit of damage on the front of the 41 car. They look like they might be leaving that, but it's had a scuff or two. That damage on the 41 car is uh, the remnants of what happened with the uh, the 22. Yeah. Lucky not to lose that nose. Do, you know what, do you know what, with, with that brake above the wheel arch, I'm not entirely sure I'd be particularly happy if I was in race control with them sending that out when it takes so little time for a nose change but they're battling for position okay. and there go Premier United right by them and again Danny Kviet in second, Ben Hanley in third Kim van der Gaard still leading don't forget though that the number 23 car when it comes into the pits will have five seconds added to its stationary time. That's a lap actually on the 41 for the moment. Yep here comes the 48. So Antonio Felix da Costa into the pits. He's not gone longer this time. Were they not out of sequence before? No, they were going longer. They were going a, a lap or two longer in the early well, part of the race. How long before the rest of the top three? That's stop. quite odd. Because we've not yet seen the 23 make it stop, have we? No. Just, they, they've not come into the seventh stop. That's reversal of fortunes. So the 48 car did not come back up to the top of the, the uh, timing yeah. screens. Well, maybe Antonio couldn't maybe find his slippers for the maybe second got a problem. Maybe there's a problem Ooh. finding around. Around the outside goes Danny Kvyat, up the inside and closing right Ooh. up there. And that's how much difference one car can make.
yeah, in a battle. Hanley's, Hanley's really starting to put pressure on Danny Fiat now. Mm. Fiat is losing time over Hanley's teammate Van der Garde up in front. And well, this Kri is... Kri had to take an artificially really wide line to get round the Aston, whereas yeah. Ben Hanley snuck up Vegas the inside, Kriat into the pit lane. Well, he Late made the most there. of that in lap, didn't he? And he's out gonna, comes 48. He's going to come into the pits, uh, the pits just as the number nine uh, leaves ahead of him. Yeah. 31 is out as well. So 31 and 48. 31 with Robin Fines, 48 with Antonio Felix da Costa. Won't be any fireworks there. Oh, and there's Fabio Scherer who sniffs an opportunity. So this is Fabio Scherer on the Jota Car 4 position. This is for fourth place. And Antonio weaving in a straight line, not to hold him back, but to try and get some heat oh. into the tyres, because right behind him is the United car, and he runs out wide, and through comes the United car as well. So Fabio Scherer goes through, so too behind him is the United car, and that is the 23 car, isn't it? No, 22, 22 and it's the 4, 34, it 22, and the 48 here. Yeah. Uh, 63 on pit lane. Yeah, Hanley's this is the still, battle for second. Hanley's still yet to come in. Obviously, the uh, the 63 car pulled in in front of him yep. of Fiat, and instead of freeing him up, he's now stuck in this battle between Scherer and uh, Felix da Costa. Yeah, but Scherer hasn't just come out of the pits, has he? Scherer is is still going. He's just That's rising right. up Should the order. Yeah, so he shouldn't be much slower than Ben Hanley. And this is where they all went by the 48 of Antonio Felix da Costa struggling on those cold tyres. Fabio Scherer dives down the hill, back up to fourth place into Europol, the yellow and green ahead of the 22 car of United. This is the new leader, 23 is on the pit lane now. Yep. So that was a very early pit stop then from Os van der Garde gesticulating about something. something not happy about something no. seat oh it's a driver change that's a very late call out, out what out. went on there could he not open the door no what? radio, radio. What? he said no radio no radio he didn't know he was getting out of the car okay and these they will get the five seconds that could save them here well, because what actually you often, what you often do is when you come you prepare before a pit stop you take out the the driver radio yep. mm -hmm. and uh you got it on the velcro yep. velcro onto the top of the helmet you're driving down the pit lane without any radio comms at that stage so he's he's not been told he's getting out the car and then all of a sudden tell him he is and he's not got the radio. and he hasn't heard it or he didn't have a radio and all he saw was box 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 on the pit board so he knew he had to come in, or his dash was telling him he had to come in, but he maybe had no radio, maybe the car's no radio. Now, did, was that stationary for five seconds after they finished the, the uh, tyres? We'll soon see. Let's have a look. That, uh, the, the guys were walking away with the tyres. That, that looked like Louise Beckett. Uh, uh, Ollie Jarvis above the car, by the way. It yeah. was a stop in one minute, 29 seconds. That's quite a long stop. Well. 120. No, forget the, forget for the last Hanley Ferrari in. stop. Here comes Hanley. I don't think they served that five seconds. Here comes Hanley with a lap on the field at this point. Yeah. So Ben Hanley is in. And where is Danny Kviert on the tracker? Turn five. He is coming down out of 14. 15. No, that's the number no, nine. Five. He's here on the street. Six, the other, seven. The other Prema car, Martin, yeah. you idiot. <laughs> You're looking everywhere else, and he's actually on screen. Never argue with a racing driver. They're always not wrong. Oh, look, warning flag for Felix da Costa, car 48, for driving standards. Yeah, yeah I, thought, I didn't think they were going to like that weaving around. I mean, mm. there's warming the tyres up, then there's getting in the way of others trying to make an overtake. So in traffic at the moment, the 63, or has been. Now it gets a bit of clear air. So Twice was saying there was no issue previously for the number seven car, and there was no issue at all for the number seven car when it was stationary in the middle of the pit lane. No issues. That is that is the uh, well the, uh, the diagnosis. I, that you saw nothing. I, I completely understand why they would take that attitude if it was a sensor failure that's not their sensor. I absolutely disagree. For the car to get in the pit lane uh, with needing a power recycle has no problems. Strange one. Yeah, they may, have, they may have forgotten that bit. Nothing to see here. 
<laughs> so Leslie that, Nielsen in Naked well, Gun. Nothing to see here. Return the, the, to your homes. Other than the fact that they lost <laughs> 34 seconds on pit lane. Just a mere bagatelle. Right, where does Hanley come out? Oh, miles behind Danny Kvyat. Look at that. Kvyat's already around turn four. Yep. So I, that was all four tyres going on car 22. Yeah. Kvyat didn't take tyres. 114 in the pits. Oh, there you go. So that's the difference. It's a 15-second difference. Let's hear from United's Guido van der Gaard with Louise Beckett. Guido van der Gaard, I can see the uh, frustration on your face. Uh, that's not how you want it to go for the 23 United. We saw what you were saying, so we were assuming you had no radio, but you tell us. No, no, I had no radio. So it was uh, beeping all the time, so the battery must, must die in the car. I, I could not see anything, couldn't hear anything, didn't know where I was. We were leading, we had a gap like eight seconds. And suddenly they come in and they want to change the driver. I did not know anything, so it was um, yeah, a big mess, but we're still hanging in there. I think Oli did a good job before. I was quite quick now, so um, yeah, it's just a pity. It is, thank you. Well, the car is a replay. Currently. That's a replay yeah. of the moment. He's saying, like, what, what? do you want me to do? What? And Ollie's in the background doing the revolving his hands. Do you want to drive a change or not? But, but he wasn't running round. He was told the, there was a driver change. That's why what was I got, he not That's what I can understand. Why weren't they already there? Yeah, I mean, if you're sitting in the car uh, as, as Van der Garde, what, and you look to your left and you see a driver standing there with their seat, do you know you quickly work out what's going on? Yeah. Plus still a couple of seconds. If he's in the garage, he's always in the garage, suited and booted, just in case. So the team, a team member was holding the seat in, Sir Louis says, but even so, Ollie Jarvis should have been running around. The moment the car hits its marks, you're running around. Well, you could see, I think it was Ollie behind the fuel rig was going like that. Yeah. He, he, you know, that doesn't mean anything uh, if you can't see, but was actually uh, offering the champ changeover um, hand signal. Do you think he was to trying to catch wall. Van der Garde's eye on, from the other side of the car, saying, it's you and me, mate, we're no, swapping he was, over this guy, because he knew there was, was no radio. He was asking was, the pit wall. was looking at the pit wall, yeah. so it's possible the pit wall had not been clear. Well, they, they may well have been clear to Ollie Jarvis, but when Jarvis is standing there and the door doesn't pop open the moment the car stops, he's going, well, are we doing this or not? Yeah. But they had 40 minutes to prepare for that moment. Like, do something with a yeah. pit board. Do they bring yes. pit boards now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some teams stopped using pit boards altogether, didn't even bring them to the track. Back Ooh. up to fourth, by the way, the 51 Ferrari. And nice. this is that replay of that. That's that is uh, Pierre Grini going up ahead of Luc Duval. Now, again, he's he's working with a car that is suboptimal under braking oh. as antonio felix da costa holds the tight line against the wrt car but doesn't hang on so a change there 41 who's in that is that louis Delatraz. Delatraz. no it's a louis Delatraz. Delatraz has had a good race That's hasn't he just but it's been a, astonishingly antonio felix da costa is now down in sixth position now, what is the strategy from the Hurst team, Jota team, uh, squad here? Louise Beckett in the pit lane. I did ask the team, they said it was slightly out of schedule, but not mainly, but the reason for it was they were taking left sides only. Now then, okay. we also have a battle that we need to look at in GTE Am. Nicky Katzberg leads. Oh, he has been caught, hasn't and he? And Alessia Rivera is, to quote, all over Nicky Katzberg. He absolutely is Sam Smith. That's an apt description. Yeah, so let's have her at three tenths of a second last time around. It's about the same this time around. It's Corvette versus Ferrari. Michelle Katting has dropped back from this battle by about 17 seconds. Those three look pretty stable at the moment. Well, I say it looks pretty stable at the moment. This certainly doesn't. After terrible luck at Sebring. The 83 car, the predecessors to this car, ended up on its roof at Turn 1. Oh, as I say, it's someone in the barrier. It's blue. It's not. It's, it's the Van Wall. Van it's Jacques Villeneuve backwards. Now, this could be our first full-course yellow of the race, and that is at the top of the hill. Eight. Turn 10. Turn, turn 10. 10. Oh, oh, he's lost braking. He's lost yeah. braking. The Massive black something cloud went, behind. Something went wrong with the braking system on that car. That's a brake disc exploding, isn't it? And luckily, not too big an impact. Watch again. Oh, so you can see it. Yeah. Brake disc 
absolutely. absolutely went bang. Had nothing that he could do there. Very lucky that wasn't a much, much bigger impact. Yeah. And square on with the fence in front of the marshal's post. But uh, right front break had gone in the biggest possible way. Yep. That's gone. Safety car is called. Ooh, and now, now, then. now we reshuffle our expectations of what's going to go on in the final 65 minutes. Now, what does this do to Cadillac's out of sequenceness? They're down currently in sixth position and have not had the time to jump back up out of sync to where they might have been in third when everybody else stopped. Yeah. So I'm afraid this tor possibly torpedoes Cadillac below the waterline. Possibly so. So an hour and five minutes, and we have our fire. first safety car. An hour and five minutes to go. Yeah, the brake is on fire because it's hot yeah. and full of rubber, but they have got the extinguishers on it. Yeah. Jacques Villeneuve. I'm um, sure is uh, pretty OK. And that's the first failure that we've seen on uh, on the Van Wall car. Let's hear what the team had to say. I lost the front brakes. No front brakes. The front brakes gave up. Kobe, are you OK? Are you OK? Yes, yes, but the front, well, one front brake blue. OK, if you can, bring the car to the garage. I am in the car. Uh, stop in the gravel. Thank you, the engine doesn't start. Yeah, that's that's not a car you want to bring back uh, to the ground. I think and, and actually, were, were I him, I think the answer would be no. Yeah. Uh, no, because he's done. No, he's, he's much, I think we've done. much yes. more calm and extremist than, than we have a right to expect. Again, look at the little indicator there on the right-hand side. The safety screen comes up, safety car. So it tells the drivers at the moment the safety car is scrambled, what's going on, or full course yellow, or red flag, or blue flags, white flags, all the others are repeated inside the car in the driver's eye line. So there's no mistaking the race director's instructions. Lucky that went where it did, relatively low speed, <laughs> managed to scrub off the speed backwards into the tire wall, and the impact with the tire wall actually remarkably gentle. Down into turn one, maybe uh, not so much maybe fun. Maybe not so much fun, no. Maybe that was hot. That was the point I was about to make. Yeah, uh, they're yeah. all through the final turn. But uh... So, safety car out for the first time. Now then, lots to think about. One of the new regulations in the World Endurance Championship this year concerns safety cars and wave arounds. Yeah. Do you want to explore that, or should we leave that for well, for starters? <laughs> you won't be seeing anybody down pit lane for the first three, three laps. laps of the uh, of this safety car period. So uh, we'll get this all sorted out. It'll then be. Sorry, just to, just to go back to what we were talking about earlier, there you saw United do have a manual pit board and they're hanging over to Ollie Jarvis, radio no comms, just in case. So, yeah. I just wonder whether or not they weren't aware there's no radio. Gerdo has been singularly unresponsive and well, hasn't whinged uh, once in, not, in not two stints. Funny. No. Gerdo is only doing this race with them. Yeah. They've not got a, a level playing field as yeah. to what communication they'll get back from uh, Gear of Undergaard. Right, so Other Box, next lap, copy, copy. Yeah. Guido, do you copy me? You'd, th you'd think. Yeah. You'd think. You know, there's the warning. If, if you're saying, OK, uh, two laps ago or something, and you don't get any response, I mean, I don't know how long there wasn't a radio for, and, uh, and maybe actually we, you know, uh, subsequently might have asked that, but either way, safety car remains out. Pit lane will be closed, pit entry closed for three laps. And so we head into the final hour with our first caution of the race. What do cautions breed, everybody? Cautions. Uh, possibly some more. <laughs> Temperature goes out of tyres, <laughs> but we may well see uh, some scrambling for the pits because it's going to take at least three laps to move the car. So there might be a potential window for everybody to dive in. And how, how long 
of of a of a one hour gap can they, it'll be sub it'll be about 58 minutes can a hypercar stop now and make it an lmp2 can't it's, it's, it's not going to be long before we get to that to, to that no window. we're going to be very close i don't think any car can go over an hour of uh, running gt with will coast. gte with an extended safety car will. But, but, but it means that as we get just into the final hour lmp2s don't need to come in they no. may want to to try and juggle the, the a shorter stop but hypercar and gt will oh where was that aston martin going where there's a pass around yeah there, there is a, they've started it already okay yes. yeah. so the key well, there'll, be, there'll be a little wee while because obviously we've got to get the recovery underway yeah but yeah pass around comes uh, from this so we will get the cars reordering themselves again so I, I i was sort of expecting that we would hear uh, pass around instructions on the radio from Eduardo, but it's been given to the team. So there's Jacques, he's perfectly fine. The Absolutely. car is uh, uh, actually probably not that badly damaged either, because it was not going at a lot of speed no. when it ended up in the barriers, no. but it was pretty darn dramatic. You know that uh, Anthony was out of the room, you know, the black that we saw coming out of the out of the, the Ferrari, Ferrari yeah. that's what it looked like when the van walls brake disc broke, but with flames. Final hour of the six hours of Portimao, round two of the FIA World Endurance Championship and our first caution of the race. We are under safety car as the number four van wall of Jacques Villeneuve is recovered. Let's take a look at how we got here. So it's a beautiful day for racing here in Portimao. Our second visit to the circuit, joined for the first time by Roger Penske, Laura Wontrop Clauser, and the rest of the team bosses with some great racing in prospect. CEO FIA, uh, Natalie Rabat was here to wave the green flag. And as the field got away, the 93 Peugeot was in the pit lane after suffering a power steering issue this morning. Toyota locked out the front row of the grid, but immediately Ferrari were on the front foot, attacking and moving through into second place to split the Japanese cars right from the start. Porsche were there too, and Peugeot as well. But the 94 Peugeot got a little biff and had to run out wide. The Cadillac also going off in avoidance of the slightly errant number five Porsche. But Toyota had not got the, war the start they wanted. There was more trouble in LMP2. Number of the front runners getting pushed back right at the start and in the GTE Pro field, although there was Ferrari on Ferrari action on row three of the grid, it wasn't long before Ferrari had taken the lead away from the front row starters. Toyota moved up to make it a 1-2, and Ferrari attacking Porsche. The number six car shuffled back from fourth to fifth position as Ferrari went 3-4. 48 Jota, 23 and 22 United battling for supremacy in LMP2 as the Peugeot and Cadillac battle raged behind the front five. Then drama for the number seven Toyota, the winners in Sebring, struggling with a sensor issue that required a left rear corner change. They dropped out of the points. As the battle raged throughout the LMP2 field, there was sing barely a single car that was not in some sort of tussle. Then trouble for Porsche, a power steering issue for the number five car has dropped them out of the points and they may struggle to finish the race with only an hour to go. 23 United Autosport leading into the final round of pit stops and a battle now on their hands with Prema to take the maximum points tally here. The safety car coming after a dramatic exit from the race for the Van Wall. Jacques Villeneuve just about making contact with the barriers. Minimal damage to the car after that brake failure. So we are under safety car. It was a dramatic looking exit for Villeneuve, but fortunately for him, a long way off before he hit the barriers. Anthony Davidson, as, uh, as I was saying to Graham a moment or two ago, that would not have been quite so uh, pleasant a ride down into turn one. Absolutely not. Yeah, and uh, you start thinking of other circuits that we go to, you know, Le Mans springs to mind, straight away higher speed tracks, Monza as well, where brake issues can become a very, very serious issue. I mean, it's always a serious issue when the driver's just a passenger, but so lucky for Jacques there that it was in a relatively slow speed part of the track. 
He did very well to keep that car as under control as he did with clearly one corner on brakes. Now, uh, from, from the lowest speed track on the calendar, which is where we are now, we go to one of the highest speed tracks in two weeks' time, and that will be at Spa-Francorchamps. Don't forget, tickets are available. We're no longer having to race behind closed doors as we did when we first came here two years ago. And if you want a taste of hypercar racing, and particularly if you've been unfortunate not to get a ticket to go to Le Mans, come to Spa. Look at the crowd that's come here to Portimao. They've been treated to five hours of fantastic racing. We've still got, this is gonna be a real cliffhanger at the end because we're now going into a dash to the flag that's gonna take 50 minutes or so. But come to Spa, it's easy to get to, it's convenient, it's a glorious racetrack. There are tickets for sale. Go online and find yourself a, a ticket or two and come to Spa Francorchamps to watch anything, to watch minis or beetles, it's a great track. To watch the world's greatest sports cars, it's an absolute must-see. Yeah, and beyond that, if you can't make it to Spa, and there's lots of people, I'm sure, that will be able to make it to Spa, but if you can't, there's a huge amount of new material available now on the FI World of Jones uh, Championship on the website, on the social media channels, on the YouTube channel, whether or not it's just trying to unpick just what is all this sports car wizardry. Uh, if you're an Instagram follower, if you follow us on YouTube or Twitter or wherever else, you will find a huge amount of material. Some of it pretty quick bite stuff, do that over a coffee. If you fancy a bit of a deeper dive, then there's plenty there as well. The ext new extended highlights program, uh, you can already see, of course, the one from Sebring, uh, together with the full access behind the scenes uh, behind closed doors documentary series that's been put together for each of these rounds the addition from this race Marshall on the right hand side at D side at D9 we have a Marshall on the right hand side at D9 that's not the Marshall I should tell you no, no that, that would be that would be a little bit partisan uh, but uh, you can watch that on April the 25th for the full access uh, story uh, behind the scenes here. And uh, I'm sure you'll see some of the dramas that we've seen from Toyota, from Ferrari, uh, and for that matter, from Van Warm uh, very recently. Uh, and it really is properly behind the scenes stuff. Uh, yeah, the safety car is coming in this lap. Uh, safety car is coming in at the end of this lap. No overtaking before the line. No overtaking before the line. Yeah, we and I can easily catch you out on a long straight like this one here in Portimao. And uh, I think, didn't we even see that in Sebring as well? Somebody overtaking before the line. Ready to, go. ready to go back to green flag racing. 53 minutes and 20 seconds on the clock. Green, 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 says the flag. That means the pit lane is open for business. And this will be the final stop for some of our hyper cars. Ferrari keep going. Both of their cars together. Leader in the pits. Leader is in. Ferrari and the number six Porsche keep going though. And nobody in from LMP2 yet. They need to run down. And this will help some of the teams that may have been a little adrift on fuel in LMP2 because it's taken five or ten minutes out of the race. It's given them another two or three laps of fuel. We're getting close perhaps to, we may not be, we may still be a long way from being able to make it on one more stop, but the teams will know and will be recalculating, Anthony, with every single lap what they've got left and what they need to achieve. Yeah, so all of the uh, LMP2s at least, I know they can't do 52 minutes at full racing speed. As we see the uh, Cadillac and the Peugeot yeah. 94 in the pit lane. So we've got five hyper, four hypercars in. We've got almost the entire GTEM field in because they've all just peeled in because they can go an hour on fuel. So they fuel now, they just race to the flag. So these are critical lapses for those that are staying out, maybe on an in-lap, maybe not. But it's going to be very entertaining to see what happens now in the last 10 or 15 minutes. It could be all change. Ooh. That was a little bit of a collision, I think, with the cameraman, but uh, it's 12 minutes of the safety car, by the way. So 12 minutes of safety car running, less a little bit for the pass, uh, the, uh, the wave by guys, a little bit more like full throttle. So you're absolutely right, it will put some of these cars back into the window as the Porsche comes. Porsche coming in, which so one is it, this, though? This is going to be the final stop for all of these cars in retune terms. That is the number six car, yep. currently sits third place. Uh, the Toyota on its way. Notice they've got different coloured lights. The LEDs change colour as they come into the pit lane, so the team will know when it's coming towards them which one it is. 
50 is in for Ferrari, 51 stays out. So Brendan Hartley will retain the lead uh, after that stop with the cars behind him now pitting. But the advantage still to stop. The advantage for Hartley is that the Toyota had a full lap on the entire field. He had lapped every other car at least once. And also GTM cars pitting there now in their yep. fueling window, remember. And uh, 21 car goes to the lead at the moment with the yep. least of power, but will need to stop. And yeah. the oh, Ferrari's really? gone to the wrong pit uh, garage, almost made a cardinal error. I think that may have cost him a second or so, but not much more than that. I wonder, if they I wonder if he went to the other AF Corsa garage where they're all wearing red overalls and th yeah. there you are. There's the GT garage, there's the hypercar garage. Wouldn't be remotely surprised if that's, uh, that something has acted upon them with that. Yes. There's some feedback. Trouble here. Trouble at Mill. That's 48 and the 35. And again, a little bit of a... Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Argy bargy. Good move, though, from the Alpine round the outside there. And the shakedown of all of this is 63 Prema. Danny Kviet has the lead from the 23 and 22 United Autosports. Well, let's hear from the number eight Toyota team. Rio Hirakawa is the man who has just handed over to Brendan Hartley. so far we just got one to go yeah so far i would say we've done perfect job yeah just finished the last pit stop so yeah finger fro finger crossed for last 50 minutes okay thank you thank you so they lead antonio foco second for ferrari alessandro pierre guidi third for ferrari for fans of the prancing horse and the scuderia this is looking very nice indeed but i think 51 might need another stop. They might be saved by the safety car. Antonio Felix da Costa on be the three abreast. inside there. <laughs> Thought yeah. for about three abreast into turn seven, but um, yeah, look at that. Great tussle in LMP2 as always. Yeah. They've been so evenly matched all weekend and it's uh, translated beautifully well into and today's race. In fact, he's just been bounced by Fabio Scherer, but he was trying to get by Robin Frines, who's uh, a long-time Formula E rival of Da Costa. He uh, almost went up one, but went down two instead. And this is splitting the difference here. That's WRT and into Europol with the car guy's car in front and Da Costa taking advantage to get through there and get in front of Scherer down into the hairpin. But Frines was completely off the track, overtaking yeah. the GT car there. I, he's, I mean, if, he doesn't, if that doesn't get flagged up, the, I don't know The problem know is will. he's committed up over the hill, and if then the GT car moves over to the right, he's either got to go round him or hit him. Yeah, but if there was a wall there, you wouldn't commit to going around the outside. There isn't a wall there. Yeah. And, and that's the problem, you know, we've, in recent years, that's why we've seen incidents in Eau Rouge, um, it, it encourages you without without a deterrent, a proper deterrent there in place. It just encourages you to make a move you wouldn't make. Just make clear, by the way, the total in the middle of these cars. This is for position. Uh, this is the number seven car back now into the top ten uh, through the two United cars. Change in GTE Am with the whole field pit stop. By the way. A faster pit stop again from the Corvette team has put the 88, uh, 33 Corvette of Nicky Katzberg back out ahead of the former leader, Alessio Rivera, in the Richard Mill Racing Ferrari. So, again, as Ben Keating said, the Corvette Racing team, right on the money, another really quick uh, pit stop has put them back in front. It's, it's almost too quick, and I wonder whether or not they've been playing there with maybe not a full set of tyres for the remaining 47 minutes. Eight seconds for the good, we'll soon see. So it is the, the 33 from the 83, then the Iron Dames, Michelle Gatting seven and a half seconds back. Let's have a look here, this is Antonio again on Fabio Scherer, a lap later, and again inviting him to sample the uh, runoff area. Yes, indeed. Antonio has had his elbows sharpened neatly, hasn't he, in the last oh. few weeks? Little tag going down the hill as Fabio tried to shut the door prematurely or early. There was a touch, wasn't there? <laughs> um, yeah, there might have been. Dare I say, proper Formula E stuff there from Antonio Felix de Corsa. Just and a making touch contact mid-court. No, I don't think there, but um, it was judge. well judged. Very well judged on the run into turn five. Hasn't gotten the place no. uh, because the uh, Scherer has come through this and is putting in another strong run here yeah. for the Interior Pole squad. Right, we're going to see another go at it again, probably. So this is turn three. 
pitch the car on the inside to try and get a good line through turn four, open that one up as much as he can. I think Shearer's got it covered this time around. De Costa is going to need a bit of traffic in the way to, to make a, a, a chance available, I think. Just trying to work out, by the way, whether or not the Alpine behind, is that the, has that been a change or is that the wrong Alpine? <laughs> uh, what, like the wrong trousers? No, no, it's, it's just that there is an Alpine very close by, but there should be the nine in between, but the yeah, nine no, is behind that I think that that's car. possibly Andre Negrao in the, in the other Alpine that's at the tail of the field. Meanwhile, back with our GTM, Corvette lead, Richard Mill and the Iron Dames, and then everyone else. Uh, yes. All of these. That is everyone else. That's GR Racing. So it's GR Racing. The yellow car is Iron Links number 60. Northwest AMR not in that. So this is not all for position, but the Project 56 car, the white car, and the Ferrari Matteo uh, of uh, Ulis de Pau, that is for position. But Matteo Crisoni trying to get himself insinuated in there as well in that 60 uh, Ferrari. So we'll have 30 laps in this team, 30 laps. There's no energy target, no energy target. The only limitation is your tires and the gap to the Porsche. I'll update you. That's what you want to hear as the driver, is that you don't have to lift and coast, you don't have to save. Go hell for leather, get that Porsche, big boy. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, no, no time to, or no need now, thanks to that safety car thing, to be saving energy for the, uh, the hypercars. But it's probably the same for all of them. It's not yeah. unique to the Ferrari. Now then, we're saying that everybody can go to the end. Can the 51 Ferrari go to the end? Because uh, the 51 Ferrari... Yes. Did they pit? Did they is, pit? If they did, they can. They didn't, but it's on a different strategy because it's using more fuel than everybody else. Again, Matteo Cairoli in the AO Porsche pulling away from Elise Dupal, but this 60 car, that is not in no. that battle for position. No, it's two laps down. It's two laps down, but it has been very annoying to the Ferrari driver. And behind them, the 77 Dempsey Proton car. Is on a different lap as well. on a different lap as well. Here's our race leader, number eight Toyota. Or is that the number seven? That's no, it the is eight. the number eight car. Felix nice. Costa, meanwhile, is going to have to be careful because really he's just careful. had a black and white flag, warning flag for aggressive driving uh, now. That's the second time we've seen uh, the race control spark into action based on some of his on track or yeah. off track or actions. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. He's stretching the patience very thinly. <laughs> They're reaching for the plate of biscuits. To this is a good fight, mail. isn't it? Two Uniteds, they've now yeah. th thanks to that safety car, and uh, they're having a, a great inter-team battle. Second with the and third. WRT's behind, and you've got the uh, Prema racing car of uh, Danny Fiat out in front. Just Toy losing to a ninth position, by the way, to that recovering number seven Toyota. You beat me to it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but, but Kviat is only three seconds in front of this battle, and if the two United cars work together cleverly, they might shake off the two WRT cars behind and close down Prema. Wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> Those WRTs have been flying all day. By the they? way, quickest man on the circuit at the moment, apart from the race leader, is Alessandro Pierre Greedy. He's now had two fastest laps of that car's race with heavily worn brakes, and it's now four seconds off second place. And Robin Frines on the back of this train sets his fastest race lap as well. So Ollie Jarvis being chased by Phil Hansen, and then Louis de la Traz and Robin Frines, and Frines is pushing the train along from behind. Fastest race lap for his car now as we head into the final 40 minutes of this six-hour race in Portimao. The first time we came here was eight hours, the second time six hours, and we seem to have packed as much information and, and action at least into the race so far as we did last time. Yeah, as we look behind the scenes here. So it's WRT. WRT, that's Van Sam Vos, song cap. Uh, but also GTM, so Corvette Racing gradually being caught and Nicky Katzberg by Alessio Rivera, who is now being caught by Michelle Gatting, who is now being caught by uh, Matteo Caroli, who is now being caught by Luis de Pau. So that'd be five of them side by side across the line in 40 minutes. Matteo Cairoli, however, being reported for the stewards for abusing track limits. That could be a last stint drive through. There's been a lot going on in LMP2, but you started the race on pole, and look where you are right now. Yeah, um, I took the start, so it was a, it was a good start, and uh, I'm, I'm happy about my, my stint. 
uh, especially the second one, the pace was, uh, was really good. And uh, they did the job as, as usual, my teammates, and now we are... For sure, the safety car doesn't help us because, um, yeah, we are in our uh, new styles, but I think Daniel is, uh, is, is strong and he, he, can manage, uh, he can manage well, so we will see, but uh, fingers crossed. All right, thank you. Thank you. 19 years old, Dorian Pan, the first woman to start from pole in LMP2. Uh, would she be the first woman to win in LMP2 if they cross the line first? Uh, we've had uh, we've had female drivers on the podium before now at the WEC. Keiko O'Hara uh, scored a podium finish in LMP2. Well, don't get ahead of yourself. Sorry to burst the bubble, guys, because that gap is coming down thick and fast. Danny Fiat versus Oliver Jarvis. Uh, in the 23 United car, it was three seconds last lap around. It's now 1.7 seconds. So I don't know if he had lots of traffic that last lap around. I hope for Fiat and Dorian Pan's sake, it was. But that gap is coming down. Remember, they only took two times. Exactly, that's what she was yeah. saying, wasn't it? That is, that's the, that is the point. Pierre Guidi, by the way, pits. Uh, the 63 car also due in. Um, Something is shredded in there, isn't there? Well, it's the front I mean, brakes of that 51, isn't it? Though? Everything is shredded in there. Porsche go back into third, 40 minutes to go. We're getting... So that message to the 50 Ferrari of Antonio Fuoco is you're off the leash. Make sure you stay where you are. They, they were on pole in Sebring. They were on the podium behind the two Toyotas in Sebring. And they now want to move up from bronze to silver. And this could be a first podium in World Endurance Championship for Port Penske Porsche as well. Something tells me there's not a single braking component on that car going back on the shelf of Maranello for possible use at the moment. I, I think, think they'll be playing a museum, been, right? <laughs> they may have been extensively <laughs> lifed, or in this case, killed. <laughs> uh, Back with WRT versus the tail gunner Phil Hansen, 22 car ahead of the pair of WRT cars of Lou Delachaz and Robin Fries. Fabio Scherer, uh, six seconds behind this battle, so he's not really uh, an issue yet for them. 31 being warned about overtaking beyond the track limits. That was Robin Fries when he swept around the outside of the GT car. Nicky Katzberg responding to the pressure, fastest lap of the race for the Corvette, but still half a second down on the current pace of Alessio Rivera. The gap is now six and a half seconds. Uh, controlling the gap now to Michel Gatting, that stabilised at just over seven seconds. Cairoli, who is going to get a drive through, is that correct? Um, I think is uh, four seconds back. I, I would think about. that he's been reported for it, yeah, so it's, it's, it's likely happen. to happen. And if it doesn't happen in time in the race, he'll have 30 seconds added to his race time. Um, just an update on that uh, 33 Corvette racing stop, including the outlap. They were 7.5 seconds quicker than the 83. There you go. That's, that's uh, what's done it. Well, and, and, and that's Katzberg somehow tippy-toeing round at ridiculous pace on the outlap as well when the tyres had lost a little bit of temperature, but not a lot. Yeah, it puts in another fastest lap this time around, and this time does go a bit quicker than Lercia Rivera, so 6.7 seconds is the gap. Now, don't forget the Ferrari 51 is out of sequence with all the others. It has just had to stop after all the others stopped. It, I don't know whether it needs another stop with 37 minutes remaining. It's out of sequence because it's using more fuel because it's got no hybrid, because it's not harvesting the power from the front axle. But they have mitigated against some of that by not changing tires. So they are really throwing everything at Alessandro Pierre Guidi. You haven't got any brakes, we're not giving you any tyres. You may have to stop again before the end, but just hold off the Cadillac. Yeah. <laughs> the Cadillac right with him. Yeah, that safety car really brought Cadillac back into this fight, didn't it, today? Now... 20, 27,500 more fans in this year than the first time we came here. So good to see. In fact, there's a lot of different nationalities what? wandering around in the paddock and in the grandstands. So it's not just locals, it's not just holidaymakers. People have made the trip to come here to Portimao to see these cars in the flesh for the first time. 
I'm sure we're going to see an awful lot of attendance at Spa in a couple of weeks as well. So United Autosports, they pit Phil Hansen, 36 minutes to go for the number 22 car. And that means basically because of the safety car, he's gone from first to last. Yes. All of those gaps that opened up over five hours disappeared over five minutes. But all of these cars are going to have to yeah, pit. Yeah, they'll all yes. have to stop again. Exactly. They're, just, they're just a bit out of sync compared to the rest. Now. Does that mean he can make it to the end? Yes, 100% he can from here. Okay, great. But everybody else that stops will stop for a shorter time Slightly because shorter. they will have to put less in. Yes, indeed. Um, you know, it might be one lap shorter, a couple of seconds. It might be two laps shorter, five seconds. But it, it, it's all going to have a big effect. Oh, no, five seconds added to the next pit stop for car 31, overtaking beyond the track. Yeah, yeah, that was Robin Frines, wasn't yeah. it? It's been pretty wild, hasn't it? That, that it's a, That's the fourth-place car at the moment. So that's going to drop them out of a podium potential. Now, the 23 United car had a five-second extra pit stop to length to serve when they had that Fred Carnot's army, are we changing drivers, aren't we changing drivers? We've not seen anything to suggest they didn't do it. No. Other than observe. Well, the team said they'd done it uh, okay, to Louise go. Beckett, so there we go. 31 is in. So this is going to be the, the stop plus five. Yeah. So at least they'll know exactly what the scale of the task is going to be. Well, Louis Delatraz will breathe the sigh of relief because he won't have Robin Fryens up his chuff all Here the way is the to five. the flag. This is the five. And that, so by the way, that's where we got it wrong. seconds before. That's where we got it wrong on the United one. They did yeah. the five at the start of the stop, not at the end yeah. of the stop. That's why he didn't get out. The, they, they were waving about the driver, and that's why he didn't get the driver next to the door. Ah, uh, because the five-second penalty, yeah. Yeah, that's, that would make a lot of sense. And but even more confusion for uh, for Van der Garder at the time because <laughs> yeah. nobody was touching the no, car. Nobody's moving. What? What <laughs> now? <laughs> I, he probably didn't even know he had the penalty because he couldn't be told. No, no, of course he wouldn't know. Am I invisible? What am I? Chop liver? <laughs> I'm, I'm here. Would somebody do something? No, got a yeah, penalty. A didn't know they got out of the car. That yeah. was what it was. A yeah. lot of it sense. It was now. slightly comedy, but uh, I'm sure not funny for anybody involved. Well, 36 Alpine has also just stopped yeah. with Charmel Acey, so that's their final stop. Premier stay on the top of the pile from 23 and 41. Cairoli serving, I think, the drive through right now. As if indeed. It if it yeah. weren't for that five second penalty, 23 would be in the lead of LMP2 right now. That was that the 9 or the Prema. 63? It's Prema, whichever one it is. It was nine. behind the United it's car. Because this so, is yeah. a 63. Yeah. yeah. So no, 41 oh, it was. Louis so yeah. Yeah. It's so too many red and white cars. Yeah. Said it before. We'll bore you senseless with it all the season. Till he brings a book. But Jarvis <laughs> has brought that. You can see the gap between himself and uh, Danny Fiat. Brought it down to just seven tenths of a second now. Ooh, Project One Porsche has been in the pits, yes, making yep, a much later final. No, 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 stop. that was, was the drive-through. That, that, that was the drive-through. Sorry, you're right. Yeah. That was the drive-through. So it is down now to when to the leading two cars. Where is Fabio Scherer? Ten further seconds back, 11 seconds back, and then a further group of cars behind that. Has the Vector Sport car been running the whole time? Yes. Okay, because it's just left the pit lane again. I thought. Okay. It lost all that time to the the, um, yeah. the uh, break by wire at the um, start of the race. The number five Penske Porsche is back out on track and circulating again. So the only cars we've lost are D Station and Floyd Vandal. Yeah. So D Station with an unusual, it seems, engine problem, overheating problem possibly, um, and Floyd Vandal with uh, an under braking problem. So yeah. the WRT 41 comes out behind the number 22 still. Yeah, lost a bit of ground actually there. Let's hear from the caddy team. Alex Lynn aboard the number two. The 51 has got so much pressure, it's dangerous. <laughs> tenuous. Uh, I mean, a, a, a good effort, but. Tenuous. <laughs> yes, the 51 has got a lot of brake dust. Mate, if you think it's dangerous following behind him and, it, and that you is being dispersed by a 150 <laughs> mile an hour wind, yeah, <laughs> try being the front the front tire man. Uh, it, it, I, I understand what he's saying and, and I'm sure that there's going to be zero retardation left in that car by the end of it. Our leaders, Brendan Hartley, Danny Creert and Nicky Katzberg in Hypercar LMP2 and GTE Am. And we have 32 minutes and counting to the flag. What, what I have just one quick thing here to do with GTM and the lower orders. Eighth place is the uh, is the 
one undelayed Aston Martin. Uh, the Northwest AMR car, two penalties, that really effectively put them out of things. Triple seven, as you quite rightly said, engine problems and out of it. Don't think TF Sport, ORT are going to be terribly pleased with the cards they've been dealt here this weekend. The Aston Martins were not on the pace at Sebring. They've not been on the pace here either. And I don't suppose they're going to be very pleased with the way that the, uh, the numbers look in terms of that which shall not speak its name. No, we'll have to see exactly what they do. You know, Spa is such a different racetrack. What percentage of this lap do you think you spend at full throttle land? Well, that's putting me on the spot. Yeah, it um, is. That's what you're here for, Sunshine. I would, say, I would say it's only around about 60 60 percent of the time 65 percent and at spa 75 80 percent 75 yeah, yeah. i mean definitely, it's definitely it's more a on throttle These lot are the of, a lot of wfo at spa so the 63 comes to pit lane in the hands of danny kiviat it's been a good stint from kiviat and even before he got into the pits he was no longer the leader the 23 car had gone by him as he came up pit road so i think we're about to see just how quickly ollie jarvis can go it's going to happen now into Europol, also on pit lane, what? as is the uh, number 28 from, uh, from Jota. Former factory Audi driver, Ollie Jarvis. Yes. I don't think we've got any clue how fast he can go. No, no, no. <laughs> Reasonably <laughs> rapidly. Yes. And by the way, lest we forget, because we often do, uh, reigning him's a champion, yeah. Ollie Jarvis. We, we don't often forget. Most importantly, I think he's going to have a free lap in terms of traffic. Just looking at the circuit map, this is, uh, yeah, this is right. Phil Hansen 22 that we look at on screen. But what you can't see possibly back at home watching this is that Jarvis at 23 has got a free track in front. Sixty-three Prema, thirty-four into Europol, and the twenty-eight Jota car all stopping on this lap for what they, I'm sure, think is going to be their final stop. They should have enough fuel to go. So hang on, this is twenty-two Capaldi. versus the sixty-three car. And the position remains United in front. Now, don't no, forget. No, the, 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 well, this is, this is the United car, the second United car going ahead. Yep. We're still waiting for the lead car, the 23, to pit. The 23 car is coming down, down through turn 15, and you're completely correct. Not one speck of traffic for Ollie Jarvis. So, <laughs> And that's why you see that reaction down in the pit lane with uh, yes. the Prema, Dorian Pan and her teammates. Yeah. Looking on, thinking, no, it was now not, he goes even, pit not lane. even close. Now he goes for pit lane. So, so what is this going? Remember, they right. were nose to tail when they came in. How quickly can United Autosports turn around what is the leading car? We have 29 minutes to go in this six-hour race at Baltimore. It's well, been blazing sunshine throughout. Well, there's even less fuel having to go into this car than there was with the 22 yeah. car. Yeah. 63 stopped for 105. So this should be an even shorter stop. Plonks down the chair in front of the timing screen, I've no doubt whatsoever in the TV screens. Yep. Dorian Pan. Hansen is at turn 13. Fuel hose off, car gets going. Hansen is at turn 14, penultimate corner. It's going to be a 1-2 for United, it isn't is. it? It is at the moment. And Ben Keating coming up towards the start finish line. Still six seconds, uh, not Ben Keating, Nicky Kasberg, still six seconds ahead of Alessia Rivera. And Alessia on a personal best lap. 23 is in the first. Oh, oh trouble. 51, 51 has finally. No. Has he run out of brakes for good? He's Where looped is it that around car? somewhere. That's behind the paddock. So that's the exit of five. It is the it exit is. of five. It's not going to do things any good either. Do we think those front, brakes, those front brakes have finally given up the ghost? Well, he's just I gone don't straight think on. he forgot where the corner was. So, yeah, either that or he's Here just touched the wheel on again. the line. Let's listen to this. No retardation at all, really. Yeah. Very yeah. lucky to keep it out of the barrier there. Well, went for, no, did a good job. Went for the hard standing instead of the gravel, and then he's donutted it. The rear brakes. You see how much work yeah. they're doing? Yeah. They're locking the rear brakes yeah. into that corner. So uh, This is what what they were talking about right at the very beginning when it started to, to play up, you know, four hours ago. You must have so much rear brake bias going on in that car. It must be awful. So I think, I think it will carry on circulating, but 
they're losing more well, and more time. Damn right he will, because they've got to learn how to drive around problems and also take points. This is about winning a championship or, or, or doing well in a championship for Ferrari for the first time in 50 years. Matteo Caroli, by the way, he's uh, about two laps ago served a drive through penalty. He's got another report to the stewards for abusing oh. time track limits. Antonio Felix da Costa in the pit lane the again, lead. but let's hear from the Ferrari team. Careful, Ali. I think the front right disc is broken. I think so. There's something wrong with me. Oh, that could be it. That could be it. Well, he has not come past the pits this time. <laughs> has come past oh, no, the pits this it, time. It, I mean, yeah, he, yes, well, that's what I mean. He's not going into pits. He's had barely any brakes at the front, so having barely any brakes on one side of the front is possibly not going to be much exactly of a difference. What I was say. Exactly so you, know, you could see the amount of rear braking the car had, and that's what they've been relying on for such a long time. OK, so let's look at where they are. 51 is how far ahead of sixth place Peugeot? A minute and 20. That's very nearly a lap ahead of their nearest rival. We've got no, 21 25 seconds ahead. ahead. Sorry, 21 seconds. 21 seconds ahead, and he lost on the last lap. He lost 23... Well, he went off a long yes. way. He will now adapt to what he's doing. So he might lose position to 94. It's going to take a lot longer he's... for 93 to get by him unless he has a catastrophic yeah, so failure. 94 has just taken three seconds out of him in the first sector. So he's going to lose yeah. that position yeah. in 25 minutes easily. Well, here is Antonio Fuoco in second place, the man who put Ferrari on a world championship sports car pole position for the first time in half a century at Sebring. Now now looking to put them not just on the podium, but in second place. Andre Lotra, meanwhile, under 13 seconds back from Fuoco, quicker last time around, 25 minutes to go. If he can maintain that rate of closing, it's going to be close. And but can he? And Lotra back with one of his former World Championship teams. <laughs> back with another one of his uh, sports car racing families in that number six Penske Porsche. His first time ever racing for the Penske organization. And Alex Lynn in the Cadillac, how far back is he? He's 50 40 seconds. seconds back from... He's 50, uh, 50 seconds, seconds back. back from Lotterer. Yeah, correct. Oh. And oh, that's, that's Pierre Guidi in front. That's the moment the brake the break broke. Yeah. I think you could just see the, the, a huge bit of debris come out even before he committed to the corner. Well, you can see. That's the 63 and the 41. Whoa, 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 steady now. That's our GTE leader as well, Nicky Katzberg. Can come on, boys. They're a lap. Where are they together? <laughs> That's well, for third. That is. 41 yeah. is in third, Louis Delatraz and Danny Kruger is in fourth, and that's why they were both trying to make some space for themselves. We, that was... might, we might have a problem here. There's a double yellow. There's no car off. That must be debris, and it's probably that break. Ten. Yeah. It's been removed, yeah. OK, that's good. But, yeah, I think that shot we saw riding on board of the Cadillac, uh, Alex Lynn, I think the shot we saw was the moment that he probably complained on the radio of how much brake yeah, dust was coming out there. And, I think and the moment the brake I think it was just now. I think it was just now. Because that happened long after the radio message. Yes. Normally the radio yeah, message is a couple of minutes after the event. So it's probably been doing that for a few laps. Uh, you know, these things, they're not steel. They don't just go. They're carbon on carbon. They take a long time to do, to, to decide. All well, of once it gets to a certain point, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's thin enough that it just it explodes. That, that's yeah. that's yeah. the instant. There. They yeah. see that bit, uh, there maybe yeah. there's a bit of rubber coming off the car. I don't know. But it could well have been a bit of pickup just flying off. But it's that it's that it's grabbing you know, as well, wasn't it? it it's was that cloud of brake of brake coming up in the air that Alex Lynn was complaining about before. But I'm sure he had that previously. Oh, so if I can? No, no. So it so it broke. That's the replay. So it broke going into turn one, the disc, and then that's why he had okay. nothing left at all in the front going into turn five, and that's why he ran out okay. ran wide. Hypercar in the pit lane. It's not the Ferrari, it's the Glickenhaus. They've been in for service. Well, they've been and reliable this, this, and this afternoon. Yeah. And they've, they've been in that group. After uh, they struggling at the heat of the tyres, this the first hour, if you remember. But since then, they've been in that group. They're, they're certainly not in contention for a podium position. But after what was not a stellar, uh, stellar Sebring, I've, I've not, are they going to get to the end here? Matteo Cairoli serves his second drive-through in as many minutes. 
So he's come and gone, and, uh, and so has any hope of a podium, I'm afraid. Rivera is closing that gap, though, four and a half seconds now to Nicky Katzberg. So the Richard Mille 83 car. Katzberg closing. didn't have tyres, I don't think, last time. Let's hear from Andre Lotter's team. Hey, Andre, keep doing what you're doing. Keep the lap times fast. We may have had an issue with fueling. We might get a fuel alarm, and I need you to tell me if that happens. Oh, dear. I, I sense that we could possibly cut off Andre's reply to that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> diplomatically, because we don't have a buzzer, exactly. Oh, that says a lot, doesn't it? The tap of the head there from the engineer. Again, look at the Ferrari in the brake, dust pouring off it as the Porsche goes by, followed by the, is that the 23 United Autosports, our LMP2 leader? So the Ferrari slips another spot. It didn't take long, did it? That's the 22 behind, 51 now. Yeah. Flash, flash, get out of the way, I'm faster. I've got brakes on my car. <laughs> OK, let's hear from the 51 Ferrari team. OK, mate, you can slow way down, you can slow way down. We don't need that much pace. The front left disc is doing all the work now, and it's too hot. So give some big lift off. If we continue like this, we'll only lose one position. Well, there you go. You know, this this is That's Bahrain last year with the gearbox at the back of That's what he needs to know. That, what, yeah. what, I'm sure Alexander at the moment is thinking, I've got to keep up the speed. Yep. Every point matters. Yep. What he needed to hear from Justin Taylor there was, look, number one, we've got to get it to the end. Number two is, no matter how slow you go, we'll only lose one spot. Yeah. Yeah, the real danger was immediate. That Now the danger is that yes. if, if you blow the other one up, you might end up nose first into the barriers. Here's what you should have got. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they're out and ready, but you would lose no, so much no, time no stopping chance. to change one that, you know, you'd only do it in a 24-hour race. Um, there's no mandatory last third of the race brake change here as there is in the Spa 24 hours. Look at the smear of black Robert. on the windscreen there as well. I know, just... I really hope that uh, Pierre Greedy wasn't looking at the screen, the, the, if there are any big screens around the circuit, because he could see that shot of some lovely brand new brake discs there staring at <laughs> <laughs> Torture, torture. <laughs> well, no, you know, it's, it's part of the driver's job, isn't it? Part of it, and the easy part of it, easier part of it, is when the car's perfect. Most days you're struggling with something, like the human body, most days you're struggling with something, and a lot of the time you're struggling with a lot. And, and you know, he dragged the car to the line that frankly anybody else listening to it would have parked, but it was the championship that was at stake. That's, this is, by the way, got two more Oregon side to side. The 9 and the 31 this time, that's a gain, that's for sixth position, mm -hmm. but just had a quick shot, by the way, of the lead battle in GTE Am. The Corvette is just holding off. Well, all three Alessio of these Rivera. cars are for position. This is one Manuel, one Manuel Correa, Robin Fries for WRT, and Fabio Scherer right behind in the green and yellow of Inter Europol. So that is and, a and three Pietro car Fittipaldi. battle. And Pietro Fittipaldi. And Pietro Fittipaldi, and not too four. far away, Charles Milesi. He's He's about seven or eight seconds back down the road. There's our GTE leader. When we get the longer Kansberg. shots, you'll see how close the Ferrari is. It's about a five-second yeah. gap. If we get a long shot of this group. Five-second gap, 18 minutes remaining. 18 minutes is... Mm, he's got to be half a second a lap quicker okay. just to get there per lap remaining. He needs to be a second a lap quicker than Katzberg to guarantee he'll pass him. Talking to one or two of the guys in, in the paddock, um, there is something up for grabs here which is quite unique, which is it's the last World Championship win for a GTE car. And that's really important in terms of the history of these things. Mm. They've, they've been a fabulous servant to endurance racing. GTE Pro serving from what was it, 2011, the year before the FI World Endurance Championship? These cars have been magnificent. Yeah. You know, no no lack of excitement in the category, either in Pro or AM when we had both, and certainly not this year when we've just got the GC AM class. It's, it's entirely uh, uh, balanced and, and entertaining all the way through. That's Lowe Duval having gone by, Alessandro Pierre Greedy now, and up into fifth. So it's Toyota, Ferrari, Porsche, Cadillac, Peugeot. Five makes, five places. One for Sam Smith, because he's got the time to look. Uh, what's Peugeot's best WEC result? Have they had a podium? Or did they have a fourth? I can do that. 
Go on, no, no, Sam Smith can do it because he's not on air. Uh, uh, <laughs> also there in the Peugeot garage, they're just texting, uh, tell me, chat, I, <laughs> what is the best result for Peugeot and the WEC? Haven's just asking on commentary, and I'd like to know before he comes up with an answer. I will never come up with an answer. <laughs> That's why Graham's in the computer. So Toyota leading by a lot from Ferrari. But I, I had in my mind it was a fourth, fourth at Monza. Summer. There you uh, go. Fourth at Fuji. Okay. Fourth in Bahrain. Okay. So four fourths. Fourth, 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 fourth. fourth, no, fourth they're fourth, up fourth. to fifth at the moment. They're out not of, in fourth. Caddy are in fourth. five cars. Cadillac are in fourth. But yeah, they were fourth and fifth. They surrounded the yeah. <laughs> surrounded the podium. Uh, Cadillac are in fourth place at the moment. So this is a better fourth. Is that what we're saying? This is the best fourth place, place they've ever. It's a proper fourth. Well, well, now listen, right now, fighting fourth. Right now in hypercar, the top five positions are five different brands. We've got Toyota leading Ferrari, Porsche, Cadillac, and Peugeot. Gap. Oh, gap. Gap. Right. Gap. <laughs> gap. Have they not got a radio either? They've, they've clearly not got letters. What they clearly haven't got is a magic marker. Mm, yes. Somebody's done that in a, you know, biro or felt-tip pen. You know, you've got a proper mark. So surely you can do it with gaffer tape as well. It's what Richard it. Dean does on his Sundays off, I think. Somebody needs to be colouring it in, rich. though. They haven't got long enough. Ollie Jarvis leading in LMP2, as he was in Sebring when the car came to a grinding halt. Here's the inter Europol car now under pressure from behind. And so this is Jota's Pietro Filipaldi. We talked about him and inside. Pietro up on the inside. Another kiss. Oh, Fabio Scherer going, mm, you try the outside here, sunshine. See if you enjoy that. Filipaldi is sticking to the task at hand, though, isn't he? Great stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the joke was, oh, we want to see the race. There it is. Well, the, the gaps, by the way, in uh, LMP2, with 15 minutes to go, it is three seconds, two seconds, five seconds, 10, three, one, two, 0.249 and 0.868. That sounds like a Eurosport countdown to the break. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. This is great stuff. And Fabio Scherra hanging on for Pietro Filipaldi. United Autosport 1-2, as they have been for quite a lot of the race, but That's again, it. oh, Filipaldi this time, tucks up Scherer on the inside. And away. Yeah, Jota lost a lot of speed relative to their performance in Sebring, haven't they? Yeah. Um, they, they've had a, a pretty decent car here, but uh, by no means the fastest one out there this time around. There was the move on the inside. Beautiful move there by Fittipaldi, turn three. I can confidently predict that the 48 guys will be quicker next time out. You'd like to think so, otherwise... You would rather be... hope so, because they will no longer be in an LMP2, they'll be in a Porsche hypercar, so... Yeah, the, the debrief could be quite tricky if they're not, let's put it that way. <laughs> just keep an eye on just exactly where Alexander Pierguidi. He has still got 56 seconds on mm. Miguel Jensen. Uh, under 14 minutes to go, that should be fine. I'm even sure though. he'll be told to get a hurry up and sacrifice his last remaining disc if it come, if push comes what? to, if push comes to, we know it's Ale. If push comes to shove, it's just under 139. It's not awful, no. uh, you know, but it is a matter of now being safe. Yeah. If push comes to shove, Mikkel Jensen is going to have to claw his way over him. Yes. That's all there is to it. And Jensen, being a former factory Porsche driver and Ferrari driver, will know all about how tough Alessandro Pierre Guidi can be. Uh, Michael Jensen, you know, no mug, but I think yeah. that's beyond his powers. 130, he's done 136 in that car. Here comes the Alpine. This is the better of the two Alpines, Charmelesi. The Alpines are actually the tail end Charlies in LMP2, with the exception of the extremely delayed Vector Sport car. They've been struggling, haven't they, both yeah. in Sebring and here? Guido van der Gaard has found his smile again. One and one and done. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I still don't get used to him not in yellow overalls. But well, he yeah. said that. He yeah. said, look, I saw him yesterday, yesterday, day before, rather, going to the uh, to the driver's thing in, in his overalls. He went, hey, look, no more yellow. I'd say, OK. 
and uh, no more first lap heroics either. He no. kept a very low profile at the start of the race, didn't he? He would always go from like last to first. Well, and in also, that yellow and also, he car. was so easy to spot. You could track his progress. Now, He's next to that fun. yellow car is next to the yellow car is. You know, it, it, it's it's like the Inter Europol car because it's such a distinct livery. You say beside the green and yellow car, this is the Alpine, and through goes Charles Milesi. I wonder how old Fabio Scherer's tyres are. Very, I would say. I think yeah, so. Yeah, I think this has done a double and whatever remained in the race as exactly. well. I, 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 because his pace, personally, I don't think will have dropped off so much. Let's hear from our third place team, the number six Porsche. No. Stay out, stay out. Uh, important, because oh. this was about whether or not they needed fuel. <laughs> that was the most succinct, I've got a fuel warning light on message I've ever heard. Click now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm busy, but it's just flickered. That's... <laughs> It's almost like Andre Lotter has to pay for each letter that he's uttering on the radio. <laughs> Into the final 12 minutes, nearly 11 minutes of this race here in Portimao. Round two of the World Endurance Championship. Toyota lead, Ferrari second, Porsche in third, but we've just heard Andre Lotter telling the team that his low fuel warning light has come on. He was told by the crew, we may have underfueled the car. 1 minute 40.366, the lap time last time around from Alessia Rivera in pursuit of the lead in GTM. And that gap is now under two seconds. It is almost nose to tell Nicky Katzberg and Alessia Rivera. <laughs> Number six Porsche is in. They did underfuel the car. So that is a Penske Porsche Motorsport World Endurance podium gone. Not yet. Uh, number two car in fourth place in turn nine now. It's going to be really tight. Let's see the energy. Let's see the energy graphic. Who's got what left? Because the caddy, don't forget, was on a different fuel strategy before the safety car. But they pitted straight after the safety. They should be fine. They should be fine. They're in turn 13. The fuel's still going in. Turn 14, he rolls. It's going to stay in a podium position because the number two Cadillac is just coming out of turn 14 now as the Porsche gets to pit exit. Here it comes, yeah. fully lit, of course. Yeah. It's going to be a lot closer, but it's not going to be an immediate risk. And the lap times were good enough, actually faster than that of Alex Lee in the last couple of laps round. So it seems to be, what, 28, 30% is yeah. all you need now to get it through to the end. So why has the Porsche got 50% fuel? That seems to be an awful lot, considering everybody else has got 18 to 20%. Is, is, is that because maybe they thought they'd under fuel, but they're not sure? Oh, OK. It could be. Alex Lynn has a target, though, and that's what you need, not just some nebulous distance. How far behind will he be at the next sector? It's 11 seconds. It it's was. 11 seconds of the gap, nine yeah. minutes to go. Traffic around for both these cars. Alex Lynn comes out of turn five. He's got three, four, five cars between him, critically including the other Porsche. Right, here's the number eight the race leader of Brendan Hartley, and he is chasing the race leader in GTM. That is Nicky Katzberg, and no sign of Alessi Rivera getting much closer. The he's gap... much, he is much closer, he's oh, right there, there yes, he, he is. is. Nine tenths of a second. That's, that's the gap, it is visual. Right, it's come down from four seconds to zero seconds nearly, or one second in the last couple of laps. Corvette chasing a double win in the first two rounds of the FI World Endurance Championship for 2023. Ferrari looking to redress the the balance that saw the car that preceded this as number 83 finish its race very early on and upside down at turn one. Yeah, brand new car for the Richard Mille AF Corsa team and Alessia Rivera versus Nicky Katzberg. That's a good equal battle, isn't it? I'd say Katzberg with more experience in more different cars actually over the last few years. But Alessia Rivera back into GT after winning in LMP2 last year, winning the title. I don't know if you already mentioned, uh, guys, but it was eight tenths in uh, Rivera's yeah. favour last time around. What's it yeah. going to be this time around? He's clearly catching all the time. As uh, Katzberg 41 2 
against a 40.7 that right. time around for Rivera. So, yeah. Seven minutes 45, what are we saying? Maybe four laps, Nicky Katzberg sort of hold off the quicker car of Alessio Rivera. Got to be hard work, this very yes, hard is. work. It's unlike the, the prototypes, the, they're less affected by the turbulent air. And uh, where does that Ferrari look faster? Where's Rivera going to plan his move? And often, when you put that attack in the first time, you've got to make it stick, because otherwise the, the other driver in front starts to learn where you're faster. So no, 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 9 to 10, 7, Graham. Go oh, no, look, look good. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it's unless you're a there. He, it's unless you're there. He's going to throw it over the inside anyway. Barely break into turn 10. Right, where he is going to have a run, though, is potentially into turn 10. Into the slipstream he comes through, turn 9. Up the hill. Is he going to send it on the inside, selling the dummy? No, he's got it covered. Katzberg. The wily old fox there. Katzberg's been racing in here since we came in World Touring Cars, so he's yeah. got plenty of experience at this track. Maybe not in this car, but he's got plenty of experience at this track. You could see the AF Corsa Ferrari team watching with great interest, as rightly they should be. Oh, this was, is good. He's going to go slow here because he knows he needs to get a good exit. And a good exit he's got. So the final corner is probably the only corner on the track where you get a bit of turbulent air at that high speed. Yeah, as you see the gap open up there. This is clever stuff from Katzberg. Yeah, he's a wily old fox, Nicky Katzberg. Don't outbreak yourself into turn one. He knows he's going to have to be easy into there to make sure he get, again gets a good exit and he'll guard the inside into turn three. Michel Gatting in third for the Iron Dames. So we've got Corvette, Ferrari, Porsche currently on the podium in GTE Am. We've got Toyota, Ferrari, Porsche currently on the podium in Hypercar. And we've got Orica, Orica, Orica currently on the podium <laughs> in LMP2 because that's what they've all got. Do you think there's going to be a bit of uh, inter-team messaging going on? Uh, faster Ferrari, Hypercar. If you just uh, mess up that Corvette as you're overtaking your way past. By the way, the gentleman, the, yellow, the blue shirt, you can see there, that's Jacques Lecomte, the uh, previous team principal of Labra Competition, yeah. who, of course, took race wins in GTM with the previous generation of Corvette. <laughs> And his, his team uh, gives a lot of logistical support to the Corvette racing team in Europe. The, the previous, previous, previous? C7. Did they win with C7s yes. as well, did they? C7s. I yep. was thinking maybe C5s and C6s, but C7s. OK, okay. so Julian Canal, five Reese. minutes to go. Rivera is running out of time, isn't he? Well, and also he's going to start to run out of tyre and his engine and brake temperatures are all going to rise. And Nicky Katzberg is not going to let the Toyota go through without, yeah, without being forced offline. He's just going to make him wait. We've got real battles for the win here in GTM and in LMP2 yeah. with the top three cars separated by, what is that, three seconds? Yeah, well, Phil Hansen, Hansen yeah. 1.6 behind Ollie Jarvis. 1.3 now. 1.3, and don't forget the 22 United car, Phil Hansen, points leaders, winners in Sebring. They would love to go two for two. Toyota do or should go two for two because they won in Sebring. And this car that set pole is leading here. But again, all eyes on Nicky Katzberg versus Alessia Rivera. Oh, he's got a bit, he's doing a bit of oversteer mid corner through turn one, but he's going to be okay into three. One small mistake in any of these slow speed corners, and Rivera knows his prey is going to come his way. Just to keep you posted is what's going on in the hypercar. Brendan Hartley, of course, is well away. Antonio Fuoco, 58 seconds ahead of Andre Lotra, and is holding the gap to Alex Lynn to around 11. 12 yeah. seconds. Yeah, uh, so that's a little more stable. There's the LMP2 battle. United versus United. This is blue on blue. Blue, red and white on blue, red and white. But uh, Phil Hansen will be desperate to try and get onto terms with Ollie Jarvis. And Ollie just as desperate, having victory snatched away from them, possible victory snatched away from them. That is them. the 1 2 3. That is the 1 2 3, yeah. all on the same straight there. There's the first place car, second on the apex now, and third coming to the apex there. And the pink Porsche quick. just in front is third in GTE. So it's not part of this battle. But they are on target for another podium here, the Iron Dames, who last time they raced here in Portimao were victorious. In but that Fer was in the European Le Mans series in a Ferrari. It was indeed. End and of it last a, season. It was a different uh, driver lineup Dorian Pan, part yep. of that squad. And yeah, because Rahel Fry did not drive for them in ELMS. Correct. But so uh, getting uh, Saradovi and Dorian Pan claim victory. Here we go. Two minutes 56, so maybe three laps still to go, maybe two laps to go they'll get. 
It depends where the Toyota comes across the line. Toyota's already halfway round another lap, so it'll be this one plus another one for the number eight Toyota. So it's two to go for our GT battle. There's the AO Project One card, Matteo Cairoli. Is that? No, it's not. Uh, not close enough to the Ferrari in front of Willis de Pau. It's a minute and seven seconds back. Had a bit of a tough race. It's a difficult position for uh, Brendan Hartley there. Whenever you're in the lead of a race so easily like that, it's, it's a lovely opportunity to have, but you can easily confuse other drivers that you're coming up to because they're expecting you just to fly past and be aggressive like you have been the entire race. Suddenly, if you back out of it too much, you can find there's a bit of complication and confusion in how you overtake and get past cars. And uh, it's better sometimes just carry on with the rhythm that you had. Uh, in, in knowing you know, where to place your car and which speed to carry. The classic example is Senna at Monaco, isn't it? Absolutely, Got yeah. too far ahead and actually allowed his mind to drift and then shunted. It's, it's easily done, yeah. You, you start, yeah, you have to stay focused at all times and focused at these two here. I wonder how Rivera's going to play this one. Katzberg showed his hand in terms of how aggressive he's going to be and how cunning he's going to be in terms of defending. 90 seconds from potential history here. The, the best results ever in the World Endurance Championship for any female driver is second. Rahel Fry and the uh, Iron Dames did that twice last season. Correct. If Lila Wadu's teammate here can get by, it will be the first time ever. We've had one female driver start a car in LMP2 from pole position. Mm -hmm. That was a first. We've, had, uh, we've got another one here who played a massive part in putting them in contention for this overall win. If they can get their way by that Corvette, it will be the first time a female driver has won a race in WC history. That would be fantastic. And not just because she was tacked onto the team, but she's equally she's, done the heavy she's lifting. Been, she's done brilliantly well. Really has. Now, Glicken down comes the, the Glickenhaus, and, help and here comes the Ferrari, and Nicky Katzberg is being held up by the Glickenhaus, oh. which is slower from apex to exit. Rivera just lost the back end of the car on the exit yeah. there under power to try to get the power in too quickly. That cost him what could have been an opportunity, but Nicky Katzberg again did well there. Chasing 21 the seconds to go. This is... Last lap for the Toyota. Talk about holding your no, nerve. No, it's not. The Toyota will get to the line with time to spare. So it will be starting its last lap in three, on the last two, on the last one. Lap. Yeah, here we go. Last lap. Now, that means that there's this plus one more for the Ferrari to try and get by, because the next time the Toyota comes to the line... This will be interesting, though. Sorry, Masters, you've got the, uh, the LMP2 behind Katzberg yeah. now. He's going to overtake him, probably around this final corner. Well, that's going and to is that going to compromise Corvette? Sending him onto the, onto the marbles just ever so slightly. Oh, Bit of a wiggle there. He did. Yeah, he took the kerb on the inside, didn't he, to try and flatten out the corner. OK, I don't that's care about it. track limits. It'll be one to go. Uh, after, that could have played out worse. Definitely. After this. Could have played out worse. Yeah. What a race. So, the Toyota already up to turn five, six, seven, eight. And here he is, dripping, dipping down the hill into nine. So that lead battle in GTM is on its final lap as well. The Toyota heading towards the chequered flag, the team preparing their flags on the wall. So dominant, such a dominant oh, sort of Here we Rivera's go. He's going to send it, but he's going to have to be brave around the outside. Katzberg's at the apex first. That was well wow. defended once again by wow. Katzberg. And yeah, there was nothing Rivera could do there. Katzberg has gone from endurance mode to touring car mode <laughs> exactly. in the last 20 minutes. <laughs> Great stuff. But what a race for car number eight, Toyota. Yeah. Everything they wanted. They took Faultless. pole position and they claim victory. Ferrari win for the second time this season. No one two as in Sebring. But Sebastian Buemi, Rio Hirakawa, and now Brendan Hartley have done the job for them. And again, we'll catch up with LMP2 in a minute or two because the leaders are behind this battle. They should not catch it. These two cars are on their own. The last lap of the race after six hours, they will be barely, not even, six tenths of a second apart. We wait for these two to come to the line. Ferrari have completed their best ever WC overall 
performance, second place with number 50 car. We wait for the Porsche to come home for what should be a podium position for the six. But Nicky Katzberg, what an epic defence and a win, a second win for the number 33 Corvette Racing yeah. C8R. Excellent stuff and fending off a spirited attack from the 83. I did how close yeah, the two United were yeah. at the end. Oli Jarvis let himself be reeled into the line. He didn't care. He knew he had it. He knew they weren't going to get him. So Oli Jarvis leads a 1 2, and the 23 car has its victory. 33 car has its second win of the season. Ben Keating, Nick Veroni, and the resilient Nicky Katzberg. That's a great, great race for the entire team, including and especially in the pits. Roger Penske hands out the handshakes. The captain is on site again, as he was in Sebring, and Penske Porsche claim their first world championship podium finish. Absolutely right, and a win at Long Beach last night, a podium here at Portimao on the other side of the pond. Quite some weekend for Roger Penske and, and squad. And I don't know when Penske's last world championship podium was, but I would think it I was he when does. he was running. Did he have a podium running Formula One cars? Yes. OK, that will have been it. Had a win, didn't he? I think he had a win. Uh, uh, it, beyond my remit, I'm afraid. But uh, handshakes all round from Pascal Vasselon and the rest of the team. Ferrari takes second, one step further up the podium. They really are enjoying this journey, aren't they, Ferrari? And the number eight, are we going to see wheel spin and donuts, or is he just parked in Park Ferme? Number eight, Toyota. He will be sent round to below the podium. But everybody else, Park Ferme will be on the pit straight, so you can see the AO Porsche, the seven, the seven Toyota, which finished in ninth place, so gets points for ninth. A, a very disappointing outcome for the number seven car. But number eight, number 23, that was gutted and empty-handed in Sebring, and the number 33 car. So the driver of the AO Porsche has not read his uh, pre-race briefing, which tells everybody to stop on the start-finish straight at the line, other than the class winners. Austrian Grand Prix 1976 was a win for Penske team. 76. There you go. And the long, hot summer. Uh, and indeed, that was their to final parents. Was it? Yes. So 76, 86, oh, dear, that's quite a long while ago. 86, 96, 2016, 2026. Yeah, 47 years ago. So nearly as long between Penske's last world championship podium and their most recent one as Ferrari's last world yeah, championship. Absolutely race right. And their most recent one. I should make clear, Goodness by the way, the Iron Dames did come home with Michelle Gatting, complete the podium yes, in they did. GTE AM. Uh, it's also safely home team WRT to complete the podium in LMP2. The gap at the end between the two uh, United cars, 0.684 of a second. Ollie Jarvis trying to come into the pit lane the normal way. Now you have to go up to the long way around Ollie and come back in. You should win things more often. <laughs> oh, was that harsh? But, but again, excellence prevails. And uh, this time, yep. the second Toyota uh, effort, they, by the way, finished in the top ten. Ninth place for mm -hmm. Toyota Kazoo Racing's number seven car after having to replace the rear corner because of a faulty sensor. And the second Porsche also gets points for tenth place because it was a no finish for the for the uh, Van Wall. Absolutely. So D Station didn't finish, Van Wall didn't finish, uh, but the number five Porsche and the number ten Vector Sport car both got back out before the end, and so they both end up as I think they should be classified finishers. And uh, 23 car making its way down to pit lane eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, Park Fermé on the main straight. So the the uh, fans that uh, have stayed with us for the podium ceremony. And uh, uh, you think anybody's gone home something before close. the end of this? Are you kidding me? I'm told somewhere close to 30,000 people are this yep. weekend. And yep. having seen uh, the scenes for the queue for the grandstand, 
uh, at the start of the race and indeed what we had on pit lane for the autograph session i can completely believe it and bearing in mind nobody has been to a world endurance race at this track so they might have been excited by the hyper cars but they didn't know what they were going to get we yeah. did because we've been before but none of the fans have um, there you go uh, by the way Sebastian Buemi, I doff my cap where I'm wearing one. Mm. We can now say, broken bones in that wrist. Yep. Won effectively this race with a broken wrist. One-handed. Unbelievable. Well, look, delight there for the United team. And... <laughs> yeah, Gerda van der Gaard doing the social media. One, one, and done. <laughs> well, I, and, you know, for the moment, I mean, he is a stand-in this weekend because, He's a cool dude. because Alba Quick was trying to win the race for Acura in Long Beach and, in the end, put the car on pole, but the last lap lunge by Ricky Taylor got by the Porsche off shoreline and then ended up in the tyres, so it was Penske Porsche that won. So, Gerda van der Gaard, it's nice to have people like that in your phone book, isn't it? Yeah, you can phone grief, up a yes. guy like Gerda van der Gaard and he can come in and just do a stellar job like that. So, here we are. This is the overall result of the six hours of Portimao. Number eight Toyota Victorious from the number 50 Ferrari and the number six Porsche. Five different brands in the top five with Cadillac coming fourth and Peugeot coming fifth place. Even the 93 car that started two laps back finished ahead of a couple of its ostensibly healthy arrivals. United Autosports 1-2 from WRT Prema Jota in their final race with the 48 LMP2 car and then the second uh, Prema and Jota cars and in GTE Am Corvette Racing from Richard Mille AF Corsa and Iron Dames Corvette, Ferrari and Porsche on the GTE Am podium. Let's get down and hear from our winners with Louise Beckett. Brendan Hartley, you've been quick all weekend. Uh, that was a great run for the number eight. You've got to be pleased with that. Yeah, happy. It's been an awesome weekend from FP1 all the way through to now. A word for... Ah, congrats. Yeah, a, th a thought for Car 7. Um, they were keeping us honest. Actually, they, took, they overtook us at the start. We got back in front and then they, they had a problem. I'm quite sure that it would have been a tight finish again, as it always is between the two cars. So a thought for them, but for the team, um, yeah, big thanks. It's, uh, it's been a really strong showing for the first two races. I'm still convinced the other guys are, are coming and, and I'm sure they're going to get their, their ducks in a row for, for Le Mans. So, yeah, we're, we're, still, we're still fighting. We're still trying to find every tenth of a second out there. And, but today it felt really nice and thanks to everyone. Well done. Well, and as ever, Toyota will continue to push with everything they have because they know their rivals are getting closer. A great location, a fabulous roller coaster racetrack, bright sunshine and fans. What a difference from 2021 for the World Endurance Championships, second visit to Portimao in Portugal. And great battles expected in all three classes, GTE Am, LMP2 and Hypercar. 93 Peugeot with problems on the outlap, needed power steering changing and started from the pit lane as the front row Toyotas were split right from the offset by the Ferraris diving through on the inside to grab second place on the opening lap. But there was trouble behind, contact between one of the Porsches and one of the Peugeots, saw the Peugeot and the Cadillac having to take avoiding action as the 94 car got nerfed off by the number five Porsche. There was more drama in LMP2 and in the GTE AM battles with the front runners all struggling to get cleanly through the first corners. The better of the two Porsches was between the Ferraris in fourth place for a couple of laps until the number 50 car got back in front. 48 Jota battling with the two United cars and with Prama and WRT in LMP2 as the Peugeot started to show its pace in a battle with the Cadillac. And then the definitive uh, change in the power balance at Toyota, the number seven car having to change a left rear corner as a sensor failed. LMP2 was all arms and elbows and for five of the six hours really no clear indication of who was going to win it for penske Bit porsche lane, one of their cars also in trouble that with a power steering issue and that too took a long while to sort out meanwhile the number 23 car that should have been in the lead and should have won perhaps 
at Sebring, was leading the race, but they had no radio and struggled with communication. Huge tyre uh, brake explosion, rather, for Jacques Villeneuve, put the van wall off. Luckily for Villeneuve and the team, damage was very limited indeed. Safety car was out with an hour to go. 12 minutes under safety car allowed for late minute, last minute fuel stops. 51 Ferrari hobbled by braking issues was passed by the LMP2 leader as Alessandro Pueguidi struggled with not very little but only one front brake. Last lap battle, Toyota uh, Ferrari trying to challenge Corvette for victory in GTM. Corvette came out on top. 23 United led a team 1-2 in LMP2. And the number eight Toyota that started the race on pole was the first to the chequered flag to claim its first win of the season and victory in the six hours of Portimao. Great stuff. And uh, there is the winning car, the number eight Toyota, the 2023 version of the so far all conquering hypercar, the GR010, the Groot, as we like to call it. United Autosports with a dominant performance here after disappointment there, but these three, they're going to be very pleased indeed. Nico Veroni, uh, a very, very uh, cheerful young Argentinian driver with Nicky Katzberg. Fabulous, I thought that, uh, Martin, yep. in terms of the defensive drive he showed. Crack, cracking last in from him and from Alessio Rivera in the Ferrari. Absolutely great. Grandstand stuff. And, and, of uh, you, ben Keating. and you heard the noise from the crowd as well here. You know, 30,000 people enjoying the racing here. And I'm sure should we get the chance to come back in the future, that crowd will only grow because these cars are a big draw. Not just the GTs, not just the LMP2s, but the hypercars as well, really bringing the fans out in numbers. Great to see lots of young fan members here as well. Lots of families here. It's been yeah. great to see them. And it is a great family-friendly atmosphere. You know, you can all go on it. You don't have to be in the VIP club to go on the pit walk and meet the drivers. You just wander in when the pit lane is open for the autograph session. Just, just what part in sports car racing history is this trio going to play? It's already got a significant world championship winning part. Brendan Hartley, Seppo Amy, Rio Hirakawa. Broken bones in his wrist. And what an absolute monster stint from uh, Seppo Amy. The number 50 crew from Ferrari AF Corsa, Antonio Fuoco with Miguel Molina. Well, those guys. And Nicholas Nielsen, of course. Okay. And that is the best and result so run. far for yep. Ferrari in and, the overall terms. And the first uh, podium for Penske Porsche. Yeah, not the first, of course, for Andre Lotterer. He's something of a WC legend. But uh, Lawrence Van Ter with an overall podium, Kevin Estra. And now the national anthem of our winning team, Toyota Gazoo Racing. to hear in the Japanese national anthem, top class in the World Endurance Championship, and we're going to keep hearing it unless the chasing pack can close the gap. They all get dealt the same values for these cars. They've just got to unlock the package. They all know that, and there's next to no moaning about it. They all know that if you're going to have uh, win the opening values, you're going to have to be on your game for six hours, eight hours, or 24 hours. And who knows? It could just be the 24 hours. Penske Porsche Motorsport claimed their first World Championship package since the Austrian Grand Prix in 1976. The driver then, who won the race, unrecognisable the next day, 
because John Watson said, if I win a race in the car, I'll shave my beard off. Yeah. He did so, and nobody knew who he was at breakfast. Yeah, and it's been like that ever since Conte's got GT racing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Great. Yeah, Watty's still with us, of course. Very much so. And, uh, but Penske, very much still with us, and what a weekend for them. A win in the Inter Championship yesterday, yeah. a World Championship podium today. And Ferrari now third in Sebring, second here, closer in terms of performance, closer in terms of keeping their performance up and uh, top of the cap as well to Alessandro Pierre Guidi who with one break on the front of the car ended Amazing. up still finishing strongly uh, at the end of the race in sixth position. Should say as well, great race from Cadillac and from Peugeot. Peugeot yeah. faultless, I don't think we had a, a problem with any um, reliability issues at all for Peugeot. Other than the car starting from pit lane because it had problems with the 93. From the start of the race, there was no problem. <laughs> but, uh, there was a power steering that, problem before the start but of the race. But again, but it's but again, step forward. In hypercar, five different manufacturers in the top five positions. Toyota, Ferrari, Porsche, Cadillac, Peugeot. That's what it was intended to produce, and that will only become a more common occurrence as all of the newbies get used to their machines. They've yep. now raced these cars twice. Yep, top five are all different manufacturers, and six with Glickenhaus in the top eight. Yep, fantastic stuff. And more to come in 2024. And again, you know, we're not taking any, we're not throwing shade on Toyota in any way, shape or no. form, because they have been right in at this hypercar deal from the start. But putting that name, Ferrari, on the podium is making a big difference to the visibility of this sport for all of us. Second in the World Championship now yes. is the 50 crew Ahead from Ferrari. Ahead of the number seven car, exactly Because of so. a, a bad day for them today. Fourth for Cadillac, fifth for the lead Porsche team, and sixth place for Alessandro Pierguidi, Antonio Giovinazzi, and James Calado. Right. So it Ferrari. is Toyota, Ferrari, Porsche, Cadillac, Peugeot, Van Wall, and Glickenhaus. Well, that is the way that they line up in Hypercar. We'll get now into our LMP2 group and hear from our winning driver at United Auto Sport, Ollie Jarvis. Ollie Jarvis, I mean, that, that was a tough race for you guys. No radio, you were in the lead, you weren't in the lead. That was, that was tough going. Yeah, it was really tough, purely because of the communication. Um, I mean, the team, I got in the car, Guido had a, a radio issue, and I got in, and I realized straight away we were in, we were in trouble. And then it's, it's trying to work out what's going on in the race and what they're trying to tell you and hit fuel numbers. And I was doing a lot of calculations in my head. I mean, they told me to box. And I took a risk and stayed out because I wanted an extra lap to, uh, to jump the, um, the Prima car. Bit of a risk on my side, but I, I was calculating all the time in the car. And then the, the last 30 minutes were a bit stressful with, with fuel numbers and the gap closing. So uh, just pleased to get it across the line. You all deserve it. Well done. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, especially because the that's heartbreak of Sebring. Oh yeah, know. but that, sometimes that's what you need is yep. someone with that level of experience and intelligence. It's a, it's a one-two for United Autosports, the 23 ahead of the 22, and then it's WRT uh, in third place, the 41 car. But a great result there for United Autosports. They will go home happy after your right crushing disappointment at yep. Sebring. Pretty big part of that third place result from Louis Delatraz as well as we hear the winning anthem for United Auto Sports. Two winning cars, first and second LMP2, both bringing in ringers here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be so with a packed weekend of uh, action in the sports car world of racing. Uh, yes, we've got a couple of no-shows here with Tom Bogfist 
uh, not able to race here this weekend. And uh, Felipe Albuquerque is my man from uh, Total Energy. So we have in our FP3 yeah. show. And just a reminder, point. actually, that all the cars in this field are running on sustainable fuel that was not created from dead dinosaurs. It's okay. created from the waste byproducts of the wine industry. So we'll be we're making our contribution this evening towards the Rattler Chilt Rosé. That'll go down very nicely indeed. Thank you. Uh, no, great stuff. So the uh, Total Energy's Excellium Racing Fuel has the same octane rating and produces exactly the same power and efficiency as the normal pump gasoline or racing gasoline that these cars would otherwise be using that comes from entirely renewable resources. So, great result for United Auto Sports after a couple of slightly lean years from the, the time just before COVID when 22 won everything there was to win, including the Grand National and the London Marathon. It's, it's, it's been a weird kind of time, hasn't it, yeah. MP2, with the super teams gathering in the prelude to the hypercar era wrt prima united you know and, and others around that have just been just gathering their, their kind of troops ahead of what's to come but united still battling away to come up with what their plan is going to be for the future yeah louis delatras really doing some sterling stuff for the third place car and then the united team packed with talent in both cars josh pearson the youngest and newest in the 23 lineup but does not give away much in terms of speed to his veteran uh, teammates. United's 22 car continues to lead the championship. They finish second, Prema in fourth place, so that gap just creeps open a little further. WRT in third, but the 23 car into fourth place with a bullet as they claim victory here. So into Europol, fifth place in the season standings so far, just one behind the 23. This could be a big year for the Polish team. Well, let's catch up with our GTE winner and the ever-resilient Nikki Katzberg. Nikki Katzberg, I cannot believe what we were just watching towards the end of that race. That was superb defending driving from you. Yeah, well, it... It, it counts on two drivers, you know, he did a mega job um, racing clean with me, uh, Mr. Rovira, so he was so fast. It was so difficult to keep him behind, but he's a clean racer and uh, that's something you don't see every day. So uh, really happy with this fight and amazing, amazingly happy with this victory. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, putting the sport back into sports cars, mm -hmm. and quite right, you should reflect how good a battle that was right to the end. There. Tells it like it is, and he's absolutely right. You know, you have to have that trust, that faith, and that honesty between this, each of the parties. This is the, the, the response that we're getting from the girls. <laughs> the girls. So we're also getting whoop, 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 yeah. whoop from, from the Corvette <laughs> mechanics, but no, absolutely. But uh, that is... Uh, matches the best ever result for a female driver not for the iron dames but for the young lady on the left hand side the podium in second yeah but a second win for the number 33 crew they will dominate the point standings and a third different national anthem for this race something else Martin I very much doubt we've ever seen four female drivers at any world championship podium I was going to say exactly the same thing nine drivers four of them female uh, and the sooner that we start to see that as a regular and unremarkable occurrence in all of our classes I think the happier everybody will be so yeah. a great result for the Iron Dames great result too for Lulu Wadu she really put in some huge efforts in that car and claim second place and then he could have been so so close with Alessio Rivera just playing it clean and straight down the line with Nicky Katzberg he gave it everything but in the end Katzberg just did not crack and managed to hold on for a second straight win for the 33 Corvette team so 
Ben Keating there on the right, the man sort of behind this programme, their bronze driver. His second ever race with a Corvette, and he's had two wins so far. Oh, he did that to work for that one. Absolutely yep, yep, cracking yep. stuff. Three or four cars in the mix all the way through that. But for a couple of stumbles, there's got to be more still. And GTE and this final year of these fantastic GTE cars are really doling out some real entertainment. Yeah. Out of the shadow now of the pro class, and you know what? It, the, the standard of competition has just been as good. Well, what it's allowed us to do is spend more time focusing on GTE AM. The action has always been there, but when we had four classes to cover with one set of eyes or cameras, instead of three, we spent we were able to spend less time doing it. And one of the other things is splitting qualifying into individual classes means that when the bronze drivers who are the glue for, for all of those GTM lineups are in qualifying, they're exclusively in the spotlight. We see them for how good they are, whereas half the time previously we were trying to look at GTE Pro. So we look there at the points. It is a dominant points position because of the two wins, one of which was uh, for an eight-hour race and more points on offer. So 64 for the number 33 Corvette Racing Team plays 33 for the Dempsey Proton Racing, mm. 77 ahead of the AF Corsa pairing of 21 and 54, then Kessel 24, the Iron Dames on 22. That can change very rapidly indeed. Well, with, in two weeks. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> two <laughs> weeks, and then they've got more. 24 hours to come, of course, with double points on offer. Yeah. Well, it's been a great opportunity to return to Portimao. Come here a number of times in the past, and it's never a disappointment. It's a fantastic racetrack, and with these awesome cars in our three categories, it has produced classic racing all the way through. While Toyota's overall victory might not have seemed much in doubt for very long, every other position in our 35 finishers had to be fought for tooth and nail. Just two cars fell to make it through. The Van Wall with a brake explosion, Jack Villeneuve getting away uninjured, and D-Station with an engine overheating issue very early in the race. But everybody else overcame their issues, and this is how they finished. Toyota, Ferrari, Porsche, Cadillac, Peugeot. Five different brands in the top five in hypercar. United Autosports going 1-2 ahead of the best of the rest. Team WRT in LMP2. And in the GTE class, again, three different brands in the top three. Only disappointment here is that, as in the first race of the season, Aston Martin just didn't really seem to be at the party. They'll be disappointed with that just as much as their fans will. Remember, if you've enjoyed this race, you can watch it all again, or indeed, you can watch the highlights. Uh, keep an eye on the WC uh, YouTube channel for both of those shows in the days that follow this, as well as the full access show on April the 25th, which gives you some of the be behind the scenes action as well. And equally important, two weeks from now, we will be racing at Spa-Francorchamps. We will have live action from Free Practice 3 and from qualifying as well as the race. You can get there. It is still perfectly possible to book yourself a weekend's ticket, to book yourself some travel and a Airbnb or a, a small hotel room nearby and come to one of the world's most legendary circuits to see battle rejoined between these Goliaths of sports car racing. We'll be there, they'll be there, you too could be there. If you can't get to Spa-Francorchamps, you can join us on Friday for free practice and qualifying and Saturday for the race. Don't forget, it will be a day earlier. Until then, from Portimao, thank you for joining us. On behalf of the entire WC TV crew here, all the officials and the marshals and security staff who have welcomed in nearly 30,000 excitable fans to the teams and the drivers for their efforts. And also on behalf of Louise Beckett, Anthony Davidson, Graham Goodwin, and the rest of us, I'm Martin Haven saying thank you for joining us. We will see you for free practice on Friday in Spa two weeks from now.